It's 9 a.m. and we're gonna call this meeting to order. <coughs> Carrie, will you please take roll? Chair Brooks. Here. Vice Chair Arascata. Here. Regent Boylan. Aye. Regent Brager. Here. Regent Brown. Regent Carvalho. Here. Regent Cruz Crawford. Here. Regent Del Carlo. Here. Regent Downs. Here. Regent Goodman. Here. Regent McMichael. Here. Regent Perkins. Here. Regent Tarkanian. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Regent Carvalho, will you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we want to acknowledge uh, Deputy Attorney General Joe Becker for being here today and helping us with Open Meeting Law Council. And also, if you take a look at the screen, you'll see that it, it does look a little bit different today. There was some, some technology problems this morning with the way we normally set things up. And so um, we have other members uh, and presidents and regents in another room who are coming in through a different feed. Um, we will now move into agenda item number one with public comment. Is there any public comment in Elko? There is no public comment in Elko. Thank you. Is there any public comment in Reno? Stand by. I've got some. Yes, we have public comment in Reno. Okay, go ahead, please. Good morning. My name is Angela Palmer, P A L M E R, and I will be speaking on agenda item 10 roles of Chief of Staff and Special Counsel Board of Regents. As a 24-year board office employee, I've seen this position evolve from secretary of the board when I was hired to the current chief of staff and special counsel. This position in its current state is responsible for the oversight management and day-to-day -day operations of the board office, supervision of the board staff, codification of, the revision, codification of revisions to the Board of Regents Handbook and Procedures and Guidelines Manual assistance in the preparation of the agendas and minutes, as well as their approval, attendance at all meetings, providing legal counsel to the board, advising regents on legal matters related to their service, open meeting law complaints, coordination of legal issues with the chief general counsel, and all matters that fall in between. With an ever-growing microscope on the board and the attention to detail needed to help manage that, all of this can become a lot to handle and takes an extraordinary person which in all truth is hard to find. I and others believe the position should be split into two, a special counsel to the board that can focus on all the legal aspects of the job and achieve a staff that can manage the day-to-day -day operations and staff. This will better serve each of you individually, the Board of Regents as a whole, and the board office. If you choose to split the position, and I hope you do, you already have a chief of staff that has served you well since January, 2021. Harry Nikolajewski is a long-serving, passionate, hardworking, articulate, optimistic, honest, empathetic, supportive, and inspiring employee that has served this board honorably over the past 21 years. The board office staff supports her 100% and she, she supports us just the same. She deserves this. Please consider splitting this position into two. Thank Carrie Nikolajewski as Chief of Staff and move forward to find a special counsel to the Board of Regents. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment? Yes, there is. Good morning, Kent Irvin, ERBIN, State President of the Nevada Faculty Alliance. Regarding agenda item three, I am pleased to report that AB 224, the bill authorizing collective bargaining for entry professional employees in state law, was approved by the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs with a strong bipartisan 11 to 2 vote and is now headed today to the Ways and Means Committee. 
And Chief's fiscal note, unfortunately, is not at all reasonable as submitted, but we work, look forward to further conversations with the sponsor, the Ways and Means Committee, and NSHE to resolve that as the bill moves forward to passage. The PEP budget closed this week with restoration of basic life insurance to pre-pandemic levels and an additional $600 to $800 in a one-time supplemental contribution to health savings accounts. Unfortunately, the long-term disability insurance was not restored by the legislature. On March 30th, the legislative leadership presented a strong compensation package with enhancements to the governor's recommended budget, including an additional 2% COLA starting April 1st of this year and longevity payments for both classified and professional staff. In addition, the state would pick up a higher percentage of the retirement contributions for employees on the PERS retirement pension system. Combined with the 10% plus 4% COLAs in the governor's budget, that represents a historic increase and a move toward competitive compensation for state employee recruitment and retention, including faculty. Unfortunately, the retirement piece was not funded for non-PERS employees, about 80% of faculty. We respectively ask ENSHE, the chancellor, and the presidents to work with the legislative leadership and the governor to fully fund the compensation package for ENSHE classified and professional employees in state allocated budgets. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment? Uh, stand by once again. Okay. No more public comment in Reno. Thank you. Um, so we'll move into Las Vegas and take public comment in Las Vegas. Try it again. Patrick Villa, V-I-L-L-A. I'm a professor of mathematics at CSN. I'm the incoming Senate chair next year. Um, I wanted to speak about the agenda item about the multi-campus at CSN. Um, I have a unique ability where I have, was on the original task force group, working group, to explore the idea of this about 10, 12 years ago. And I went and read through our report the other day, and I'm going to want to ask all of you, Chancellor, everybody, to read it again to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do. Specifically, the funding about the exec level people. We're supposed to have a site coordinator on each campus. We moved that to a vice president to try to attract a better candidate, which makes sense. Currently, we are at six executive members and their staff. We're at 1.1 million and I'm on another task force who is trying to make recommendations for eight and a half million dollars in cuts at CSN to make our budget work. So I think we need to re-examine that part right there. We can still do multi-campus. There's still a way, I believe, where we can get all the services. We can keep the names. We can keep the idea of it without having to spend all this extra money. And keep in mind, we were at 40, 50,000 students when this happened. Capacity funding, temporary, which expires soon, to try to build it and get going, we're now down to 30 plus. You know, it's, it's, it's like having a family with a bus when you're down to three people in the family. We, we need to cut something. We need to make some changes. So I'm asking to do that there. So that's my main idea. Thank you very much. Good morning. Ted Chodok, C-H-O-D-O-C-K. Uh, president of the CSN chapter of Nevada Faculty Alliance, Chair Brooks, distinguished regents, presidents. Um, at CSN and community colleges across the country, enrollments are stabilizing, but what happened during the pandemic is still being felt. Nationally, community college enrollment is down 15% since 2019. Earlier this year, Doug Shapiro, the executive director of the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center stated, pandemic losses were steep, and depressed enrollment numbers continue to plague colleges across the nation, especially at community colleges. We're being told that CSN faces a, a $9 million budget shortfall next fiscal year. We're being told that a 10% cut is being considered. Students whose families were disproportionately impacted economically during the pandemic will feel these cuts, not administrators who just got a raise. It will cut student services. It will be the opposite of improving equity. The funding formula is hurting Nevada's community colleges. It needs to be temporarily suspended. It needs to be updated so that higher education in Nevada is more welcoming and inclusive. 
This is not the time to impose draconian cuts. At a moment when the state of Nevada is flush with tax revenue, cuts based on legacy pandemic enrollment losses make no sense. Please take a stand for equity and for the most vulnerable of Nevada's higher education students. CSN and CSN's students need support during this period of recovery, not to be punished for the adverse effects of a historical trend impacting community colleges across the country. Thank you. Doug Unger, D-O-U-G, U-N-G-E-R, Nevada Faculty Alliance. Thank you, Chair Brooks, members of the board, and NG leadership for your consideration. Agenda number, item number three today, legislative report, lists many bills NG supports, almost all of which the Nevada Faculty Alliance also supports. A few we've also lobbied for. Please know we've also lobbied for crucial and even urgent budget allocations for our colleges and universities and will continue to do so. We hope to continue to collaborate and to achieve our common goal to help students succeed. Concerning AB 224, collective bargaining for faculty and professional employees, we appreciate NCHI's neutrality and leadership's cooperation in amending the bill. However, we must call into question NCHI's proposed fiscal note, which, pardon me for putting it this way, reads like a work of speculative fiction. NCHI asks for a staff and budget more than twice the size of the Labor Relation Unit that currently handles collective bargaining for the entire state. And she speculates that under AB 224, literally hundreds of grievances will go to arbitration when the bill clearly encourages current faculty Senate processes so that only the most unresolved cases would go to arbitration, at most three to five per institution per year. And she further fantasizes costs for PEB and for classified staff, which are explicitly and by statute in excluded from the bill which everybody at the legislature easily notes. There's a lot more speculation, but I won't go on. In sum, collective bargaining is going to happen, and I sincerely believe, especially with the bill's provisions for separate salary requests that can better accommodate impacts for non-state funded faculty, that passage of AB 224 will greatly benefit our campuses and students. Let's come together to cooperate on realistic, sensible revisions of fiscal notes for AB 224. Thank you. Hello, greetings regents and chancellor. I am Tracy Sherman, the CSN Faculty Senate Chair. Many of my faculty members will come and go today during this meeting and still others were planning to be here until a recent series of events scared them away. On April 7th, my faculty senate welcomed a couple of you as honored guests. After you left, an elected senator requested the senate go into a rare closed executive session. In my 25 years at CSN, this is only the second closed session that I recall. The senator in question relayed very troubling actions by one of CSN's vice presidents. It is nothing short of a weaponization of board code against someone who has stepped up to serve a voluntary leadership role. Following the meeting, each senator received three letters from the general counsel's office instructing us to maintain notes from that private session. Later, it was demanded by the counsel's office that I turn over attendance records and each individual who signed in also received those three letters. This has had a frightening and chilling effect on many employees. People who would normally have been here today to share their thoughts with you are afraid to attend. In the past week, I can report that both the Faculty Senate and the Nevada Faculty Alliance executive leadership teams have lost members due to fear of reprisal and retaliation. While you will receive a presentation today about CSN's multi-campus transition, the faculty I represent would urge you to carefully evaluate what the multi-campus configuration has accomplished for CSN. It has added layers of complexity to an already complicated institution. It has created space for administrators to wreak havoc unimpeded by oversight. Morale used to be a problem we spoke about, but today my faculty members are afraid to attend a meeting. Thank you.
good morning. I'm uh, Brigadier General Troy Armstrong, the Assistant Adjutant General and Commander of the Nevada Army National Guard. Uh, Armstrong is A-R-M-S-T-R-O-N-G. And uh, first and foremost, uh, to our service members and veterans on the Board of Regents, thank you so much for your service. Um, and uh, really to all our veterans and service, service members out there, thank you. So I have the distinct pleasure of leading uh, about 3,400 of the uh, 4,300 National Guardsmen and women in Nevada. And uh, my Adjutant General, Major General Andre Berry, asked me to come here and just speak briefly about some of the opportunities uh, that we've created over the last couple of years uh, in our engagement with the community, uh, aside from all the things we do as National Guards, men and women. So uh, most important is our community engagement efforts that we have been doing around education. Uh, we have created a couple of programs uh, funded by DOD called Starbase, which are in Henderson and Reno, that support STEM education for elementary school children. We have the Battleborn Youth Challenge up in Carlin, Nevada, that currently has 50 uh, at-risk high school students that have dropped out or are credit deficient that are now get, uh, moving towards uh, being able to graduate from high school. And most recently, over the last year, we have engaged uh, with uh, the College of Southern Nevada, the West Campus, and Dr. Sonia Pierce and her staff in helping us to establish a footprint on the campus. Next week, we're actually gonna open an office where we'll have full-time support staff out there that can help um, provide uh, information to your students and veterans about the opportunities that are available in the Nevada National Guard around education incentives, as well as uh, opportunities for employment. We're super excited about this partnership. We're also working with them to help uh, uh, establish a link with the Department of Veterans of, of, uh, for the state to renovate their veteran center. And uh, we also are engaged with three different countries on the uh, partnership program where we will be able to help bring some international students over. So we're super excited about the opportunities. We wanna thank Dr. Pierce and all the staff at the Community College of Southern Nevada and say thank you all for your service. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Oh. Thank you, uh, that helps a little bit. Uh, real quick, I wouldn't be here today if in your reference materials that make an oblique reference to 2009, if the minutes were included. Guess what you'd learn about the minutes? After serving for five years with Jim Rogers, with Dan Claych, with Bart Patterson, as chairman of the board in September of 2009, I created the position of Chief of Staff Special Counsel. The board then voted 11-1 in favor. The one member, Regent Cobb, that voted against it was on principle, had nothing to do with the position. Regent Alden was absent. We created the position because there were times when there were conflicts between general counsel that were not always in the same interests of the board. The interests of the board and the interests of the system, most of the time, most of the time are the same, but they're not always the same. The position was not designed to be an adversarial position. It was designed to be a servant position to the board and to complement the efforts of general counsel. There was a suggestion earlier today that perhaps the positions be separated. I'm agnostic on that. There is lots to do for the chief of staff. There was a time when we had special counsel and we had assistant special counsel. That's what this board needs. They need a special counsel that can do nothing but serve the board with legal advice, helping them carry out uh, the, your incredible responsibilities. And then you need an assistant that can work on open meeting law, that can work on agenda review, so that you have someone that can make you wildly succeed. That is why we created the position. In closing, in the last two years, 610,000 for Melody Rose, 110,000 for Mr. Kilroy. I'm giving you some latitude. Thank you. But I'm going to wrap it up, and I appreciate it, Chairman. Up, I appreciate it. 259,000, which almost none of you know about, for the Dean Gould investigation. That's a million dollars that had you had a competent 
special counsel the past two years. One million. And you want to consider part-time? Thank you, you for your time today. Thank you for your time today. We, you we're, want, we've extended. You I've given you, you some latitude. You, you expect we're, a we're, part-time we're lawyer with, uh, to return your phone calls here. in a timely fashion? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Good morning, Regents. I'm Winter Lipson, L-I-P-S-O-N. I'm here as your staff member and as a 16-year and she employee to share my insight on the Chief of Staff and Special Counsel Board position, Agenda Item 10. Board staff members maintain a low profile. We work hard behind the scenes to conduct the business of the board. This very board has support staff with close to 50 years of combined experience. We, your staff, better than many people, know the role of the regents, understand the tremendous responsibilities you all have, and through good and challenging times, we are always in your corner because the success of the board is our main priority. I share this because as one of the members of your experienced team, I wholeheartedly know and believe the chief of staff and special counsel roles should be split into two positions, chief of staff being one and counsel to the board being the other. The combined position is a model that no longer works for this office. Instead of trying to find an individual to fit this very specific and unique position, the position should be split and the regent should appoint the person who has been doing the work of chief of staff for over two years, Carrie Nikolajewski. Give Carrie a fair shot at this. Over the last two years, Carrie has led our office during an extremely difficult period. She did so successfully and continues to do an incredible job. Carrie has been here for 21 years, has worked her way up within this organization over the past two decades. She has proven herself. She knows the job. She works hard. She cares. And most importantly, she is well-respected and has great long-standing relationships with system and institutional members and, of course, her extremely dedicated staff. This is Carrie's career. She has dedicated her professional life to the NG and this board. The chancellor's office and board office support the splitting of the chief of staff and special counsel roles into two positions. I truly hope that is the direction taken today. Thank you. Thank you. Just to ensure that we've given everybody an opportunity for public comment, we're gonna go back and make sure that there's, I'm gonna ask if there is any public comment in Elko for anyone who has not spoken yet. Is there any public comment in Elko? I don't hear anything, and so we're going to move to Reno. Is there additional public comment in Reno? Yes, there is. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and I apologize for being late today. There was road construction where I didn't expect it. And so good morning to everybody. My name is Jim New, N-E-W. I'm a community college professor and a District 10 constituent of Region Ariscata. Collective bargaining conducted in good faith provides benefits for both labor and management. Now, I acknowledge that NC has adopted a new position on AB 224, but the NC fiscal note can hardly be called neutral. It makes unfounded assumptions about an instantaneous burst of more than a dozen new bargaining units. And now, while NFA would be elated if that came true, we know it's not going to. New bargaining units will emerge over a period of years, not weeks or months. Worse still is the assertion that collective bargaining will lead to a virtual explosion of hundreds of grievances every year that apparently NSHE will be incapable of or unwilling to resolve internally, requiring arbitration. I recently requested public information on all the grievances filed at TMCC over the last five years. The college responded that if it is even able to produce the information, it will take up to 30 days. Now that makes me wonder how NC came up with their estimation of grievances to be expected under this legislation if they can't even tell me how many grievances were filed at one mid-sized college over a brief five-year period. I also wonder if the college fears that this information may confirm rumors that more grievances are filed by executives and management in some years than by the members of the faculty. Uh, and she uses these frenzied allegations to claim AB 224 will require budgets and staffing that exceed the labor management unit of the state of Nevada's Department of Human Resources. That's simply not true. Preposterous claims like these reflect poorly upon this body in front of an already skeptical legislature 
that is already showing broad-based support for this bill. I urge you to do yourself a favor and retract this fiscal note. Thank you, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Is there any further public comment in Reno? No, there is not. Thank you. So we'll move into uh, agenda item number two, approval of minutes. Oh, no. um, I need you to, if you would, Chair uh, Brooks, pull out three, and I have a correction for Fe February 3rd, and I want to some, say something on March 3rd. So on, should I do it now on February 3rd? Okay, thank you, Carrie. On February 3rd, it shows me on page three, leaving the meeting, and then on page four, we recessed at 11.09, we reconvened at 11.20, and all were present except one other region, it wasn't me. And I did, I was on the phone line, so maybe my line had gotten dropped, but I was at present for the whole meeting. It just doesn't show me coming back on February 3rd, so that needs to be corrected. If I, if I had been, uh, I don't remember, it's too far back, but I was at the whole meeting, so maybe you can check with SCS on that, okay? Thank you very much. And then on March 3rd, um, I just want to uh, state on the record that, that I followed procedure and asked for an agenda item and not a special meeting. And I never um, was contacted about my availability to be at the March 3rd special meeting. And it's ironic because in the minutes of February 3rd in new business, I requested staff to identify a means of, of polling regions to know when they're available for special meetings. And um, so I wasn't at the March 3rd special meeting. It should have been an agenda item at our board meeting. I did not request to have a special meeting. Three of us came together and asked for a, an agenda item. We didn't ask for a special meeting. And um, I just think in going forward, if one member of our board is contacted about availability, we all need to be contacted, and I was not. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Just, uh, just one moment, Regent Boylan. Sure. Um, essentially, what we're doing is approving minutes. Um, and if there is a discussion in the minutes regarding the minute not reflecting what occurred in a meeting, then that's exactly what we should bring up if there's, um, if there's something that needs to be clarified for the record. Um, the question that you're about to pose, is it directly related to something that should be inside the minutes that is not reflective of a record, or is it for something else? Uh, that, that's an interesting question you asked me, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, if I can just ask uh, Council um, uh, Jimmy there, is that uh, a way to go about addressing this by asking the members if they, you know, are going to talk about what's in the meeting itself, was in the meeting, because I just wanted to make a statement that I support what Regent Del Carlo said, because I was not contacted either. So by the chair asking, is that something I should do, answer right away, or? Who? This is Deputy Attorney there General. There he is, okay. <laughs> Sorry to jump in. Sorry. This is Deputy Attorney General Joel Becker for the record. Um, I think in this agenda item, as it's specifically about the minutes, we can address the matter of your appearance, um, your reappearance at the meeting, as it were. But in terms of actual policy and that going forward, that has to be put down for a new agenda item at the next meeting to be discussed and implemented. Um, so for this agenda item, let's stick to just discussion of the minutes that need to be addressed. Mr. Becker, if I may. So does that mean when you're saying policy that certain regions, let's say three of us, asked for this to be an agenda item, not a special meeting? And so you're saying that policy we cannot discuss now when mm -hmm. it's, it's the time to talk about that? Because after this, it's not coming back again, I know. So Okay, I appreciate the question. And yes. just to specify again, Deputy Attorney General Becker, um, for the record. This specific agenda item right now that we're discussing pertains particularly to the approval or correction of the minutes from past meetings, not to any sort of policy that underlies what was discussed at the meeting. So this is the right time and place to talk about the change that Regent uh, Del Carlo requested about having herself 
um, noted as be returning to the meeting. And then under new business later on in the meeting, that's when I would suggest to the chair that you bring up a, an agenda item at the next meeting to address the discussion of the policy about uh, scheduling meetings. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Becker. Appreciate that. Regent Breger. I would like to make a motion for the minutes to be accepted with the change for February 3rd to address that. Uh, Regent DiCarlo was present at all that time, and I'd like that for each from February, uh, January 12th, 13th, January 18th, February 3rd, and March 3rd, if there's no other concerns or questions. Second. Regent Perkins, second. Okay, so the motion on the floor is to approve the meeting minutes with including Regent uh, Del Carlo's addition to February 3rd. Um, the motion was brought by Regent Breger. It was seconded by Regent Perkins. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes, and those who oppose say no. Aye. Aye. Or aye. Aye. Okay, that passes. We will now move into agenda item number three, where we'll receive a legislative report and update from our acting chancellor. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, for the record, Dale Urquiaga, acting chancellor. Uh, I'm going to give you just a few brief remarks, and then I'll ask um, CFO Klinger to explain uh, sort of where we are with the budget request. Um, and then uh, I've been joined here at the table by um, Alejandro Rodriguez, and um, I will be happy to defer all your questions to Alejandro. Um, so I just want to start with some prefatory remarks um, uh, about the session in general. The good news is we're more than halfway done. And I can say we have had successes along the way, uh, no outright failures, and some still, you all know me well, lots of worries that I carry with me uh, to get us to signy die on June 5th, the last day of the legislature. But I think things are going along pretty well. Andrew will walk you through the budgetary process. Um, I, I would say the one bill that I'll speak to, you received a memo this week about retention incentives. Um, and that bill was processed um, originally at the request of Governor Lombardo. It moved through both houses of the legislature and there was some back and forth about whether INCHI professional staff would be included. They ultimately were included thanks to an amendment in the Senate. And the legislature provided a block grant um, to INCHI, uh, which as you know from my um, notice to the uh, you and the employees this week allowed us to make those incentive payments only up to $120,000 of salary rather than up to what is roughly about $161,000 salary mark that constitutes 95% of the governor's salary, which is a statutory cap that all other state employees have. So the good news is classified employees were originally covered in the bill. They all will receive their um, bonus uh, should they be at, should they were they employed on March 31st and will they still be employed on June 16th and then professional staff up to that level so um, that is the one bill that we have had the most um, back and forth on and that has already been processed as I say everything else is sort of moving um, the the two bills that deal with this body uh, SJR 7 which is about the Constitution SJR 7 from the 21 session by the way there's a different SCR7 in this session. Um, and then AB118, which deals with the size and terms of the board. Both of those bills have passed out of committee. One at least has passed its respective house. So now we'll swap houses um, and deal with those. And they are passing with um, rather wide majorities, I, I will just say. Um, the other bill that you have heard from me a bit on is the measure that would have, um, within one year, deconsolidated the Nevada system of higher education into an entity governed by the Board of Regents that comprised UNR, UNLV, and DRI, and five other entities comprising the four community colleges and the state college. Um, that bill, all 500 pages of it, I think, there it is, Alejandro can wave it around, um, was um, dramatically amended in the Senate uh, and is now a study you'll hear me talk more about the governor's request for a study and how this bill might marry up with that when I talk to you about some of the planning issues. But the good news is um, that bill is a study and will not immediately deconsolidate the system in 12 months. 
uh, gives this body um, time to work with what the bill now contemplates to be a commission, uh, an independent entity um, outside the legislature uh, during the interim period. So I think that's an important first step. And then before I turn to um, CFO Klinger, I just wanna tell this board how um, well served you are by Andrew and Alejandro um, and the government affairs teams from each of the institutions. They all meet regularly. Um, we don't always agree, but we hash through things and we have managed to um, testify jointly on a number of bills with our institutions. And we have also um, been in situations where I have taken no position on behalf of the system. Um, the institutions are still providing expert testimony uh, as is appropriate, I think, without um, advocacy. So I, I just want you to know how hard, Under, Alejandro was there every day. Um, this week is a week when he got to come home last night. Um, although I think his plane was canceled and I got home very, very late, so I'm thankful that he's here and awake. Um, and uh, he does an amazing job in those halls. And um, uh, Mr. Klinger, you all know, uh, I refer to his mathiness uh, has saved me any number of times um, in committee, including on the retention incentive measure. So you are well served by both of them, and I wish to publicly thank them for their work. And with that, I'll turn to CFO Klinger um, in Reno for a budget update. Thank you, Chancellor, uh, Chairman, uh, Board of Regents. For the record, uh, Andrew Klinger, Chief Financial Officer. Um, and I promise no mathiness today. Um, just a brief update on um, sort of where we are with the budget process. So we've had basically two what we call budget hearings before the legislature. One was on February 16th, and that was in regards to the capital improvement projects um, which we have uh, two of those primarily, the $50 million for uh, deferred maintenance uh, and then a chiller at, at DRI. So we've had one budget hearing that went over all the CIPs, including ours. Um, in addition to that, we had a joint, what they call a joint subcommittee hearing on February 21st. Um, that's where the chancellor and I and the presidents presented um, the, the various budgets to the money committee members and answered questions at the committee. Typically at this point in a legislative session, we would have had a second uh, joint subcommittee hearing to cover additional questions. Um, this session I think is a little bit unique in that that didn't happen this time. So we had one opportunity to talk publicly about our budget to the legislature and we will next go to what they call uh, closing. So some of the important dates that are, uh, that are coming up, uh, May 1st, which is the, the economic forum, that's where the, the economic forum will reforecast the state's revenues for both the current fiscal year, as well as the next two fiscal years. Uh, and that will largely determine whether or not the legislature has more or less funding than the governor did for the budget. Um, if they have more funding, they will typically add additional projects. Uh, capital improvement projects are uh, one of the potential opportunities there, depending on how that economic forum uh, projection uh, comes out. I talked about uh, the budget closing. So upcoming, um, actually Saturday is the GoEd budget closing, uh, which is important to us because they will close the WIN fund uh, and all of our institutions uh, have funding that's been allocated to the WIN fund that they will be eligible for. Um, so I will be uh, in Carson City on Saturday watching that closing, hopefully ensuring that uh, that wind fund is uh, funded at the level as recommended um, by the governor, uh, as well as the, the knowledge fund uh, as well. Uh, the next closing date is uh, May 4th, uh, and that is a tentative date. It's not uh, yet confirmed, but a tentative date on when the legislature will close the, the capital improvement budget. Um, and they, they pick these dates after May 1st for a reason, because they'll have a full understanding of the fiscal picture at that point with the uh, reforecasting of the revenues. So budget closing tentatively on May 4th. 
And then our budget closing, so the system of higher education's budget closing uh, is tentatively scheduled currently for uh, May 5th. Uh, we've had many conversations back and forth and answered lots of questions uh, from their staff. Uh, and so we will uh, attend that meeting on May 5th, sort of in anticipation of uh, what they may do to to our budget, and a lot of that will be, depend, I think, on what happens at the the May first uh, economic forum. Um, a lot of the discussion this session, and the chancellor had uh, touched on it a little bit with AB two sixty eight, which was the uh, retention incentive payments um, to employees. There's also been lots of discussion, and you heard it in. Uh, public comment about uh, cost of living adjustments for all employees, including ENCHI classified and professional. Uh, so a 2% uh, that would go into effect actually April 1st of this year through the end of uh, June, uh, and then another 10% or 8%, depending on if you were in a collective bargaining unit or not. Uh, and then an additional 4% um, in the second year one of the uh, concerns that, that we have that I want to make the board aware of is the level at which they fund those cost of living adjustments. Um, so historically, prior to four years ago, uh, the legislature funded ENCHI like some other state agencies at 80%. Um, the idea there being that you're going to have vacancies and there's going to be savings. Approximately four years ago, they changed that process for how they allocate funding to us. And they now allocate funding to the Nevada System of Higher Education and all our institutions based on each institution's proportionate share of state funding. And so when you look across the system and you look at uh, how state funds are allocated to the state budgets and uh, student fee revenue, which is the primarily the other source of revenue. It's roughly two thirds state, one third student fees. And so the legislature uh, has in the last two biennia has only allocated roughly 65% of the cost of a cost of living adjustment for our employees. Um, now, I will say when that cost of living adjustment was 1%, while still concerning, the numbers were much smaller and the impact to our institutions were much smaller. When you add in a 2, a 10, a 4, and potentially other adjustments such as increases in PERS contribution rates, um, that becomes a significant amount of money that could have a detrimental impact on our state operating budgets. Uh, so the chancellor and I are having discussions and, and Alejandro are having discussions with legislature legislators in the hope to <clears throat> get that restored back to 80%. Um, it's a, it will be, I think, an, an uphill battle, so to speak, um, because the way they view it, we have the, uh, the one third of student fees. The challenge with that, though, is when we present our budgets to the governor with that roughly one third, two third, that one third of student fees has already been programmed. It's been allocated to positions and operating costs. So if now suddenly there is an additional cost that has an impact on our budgets, we have three choices the way I see it. We either have to cut other costs to accommodate that 35% that we have to pay for COLA. We have to hold positions vacant, which is also another way to cut costs, or we would have to raise student fees to cover that balance of the 35%. So this is one of the challenges that the, the chancellor and I face as we go into the next few weeks is to try and get that funding restored to at least 80%. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully we will uh, hopefully we'll be successful in that, because if we're if not, um, then, like I said, we will be facing um, challenges as we move forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, about the, the budget and the budget process and, and next steps. Thank you very much. We do have a, a couple of questions. Um, Regent Downs. 
the meeting. Thank you, uh, Regent Downs, for the record. So I don't know if I'm allowed to ask, talk about this in this setting, then um, I wanted to address the question where related to the uh, collective bargaining bill and the neutral stance that NG took with a $2.4 million price tag associated with it. I really am curious how that was derived. But it, if someone, general counsel, wants to tell me I'm not supposed to talk about that here, I'm happy to wait for some other time to talk about that as well. But I would like to get some kind of answer at some point as to how they came up with that answer, that that amount. Given my experiences in collective bargaining, and I'm happy to share how um, how that goes. Regent Downs, I would I would offer that's that's part of the agenda. So um, I believe that that question can be answered, um, and there can be discussion on that. Mr. Chair, Dale Urquiaga, for the record, yes, the bill is in uh, referenced in your backup materials as a bill on which we have taken a position. So yes, we have taken a neutral position. We did so because INSHI has historically already has collective bargaining, and so we would not be opposed to collective bargaining. We're neutral on this bill because the bill does a number of things which we have pointed out to this bill sponsor um, that conflict with the way this administration feels uh, collective bargaining should be administered. So that's why we've remained neutral and tried to work with the bill sponsor. I will say that the amendments we submitted were not accepted. Uh, instead, the amendments submitted by the alliance were accepted and not ours. So as to the fiscal note, that fiscal note is based on creating a labor relations unit, which we don't have. And so to some of the earlier testimony that compares this fiscal note, which is for seven people, to the state's labor relations unit, which is six people, not including attorneys. And they have, oh, shall I say, the attorney general's office. And I do not. I have three lawyers here. And then we have lawyers at council. So it is disingenuous to compare that fiscal note directly to only the labor relations unit and not all the attorneys who work for the AG who have to do this work. So um, with that said, that it is... Um, I think erroneous criticism, I stand by my staff's analysis of what this will take. My staff researches every fiscal note, does analysis. Apparently when we do that, it's speculation. But when the union says, oh, we think there'll only be three grievances, that's fact. That's also speculation, ladies and gentlemen. So I stand by this fiscal note. I will also say we have already offered an amended fiscal note to the bill sponsor, and we'll be meeting on that next week. So we are doing our very best, sir, and I really do not appreciate the comments about my staff's capabilities uh, as this bill is discussed. We're trying to protect the entire system, not just uh, one bill or one issue or one employee group. I hope that's helpful. Well, I, I guess Chair. I appreciate that. I don't know. I appreciate the tone. I'm a little, I'm, I'm genuinely seeking clarification and I, being involved in collective bargaining for over 10 years, have not seen dramatic issues arise. I see an improvement in employee morale and relations with the administration. So I guess I'm not understanding why there's so much, I feel like hostility here, but thank you. Regent Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just have two comments. Oh, I can't even get a mic to work well, and I went to school. Anyway, so I see what uh, Regent Downs is saying, and I think to speak out and try to put down the regents every time something comes up or we ask a question, I think is ridiculous. It's really ridiculous because we are here elected by the people to do a certain job, and we have to ask questions. We have to make you feel uncomfortable if we think that you are not doing something right. Uh, to follow that up, I was actually first going to say I commend uh, uh, Dale, uh, Dale uh, Mr. Kiaga, our Chancellor, uh, Regent um, uh, Arascada, and Regent Levitt. He isn't here right now, he just left. They were the three who spoke up about the legislature breaking up uh, this body. What surprises me is, and I know some of you are going to say, oh, shite, he's going to say something wrong again. I'm surprised that the legislature, an elected body, they want to take away the power of the people to elect members of the board. 
That's, that's really ridiculous. I, you know, I know most of you are scared of the legislature. I really don't give a damn, my dear. They've been elected just like us. So to commend these people uh, who spoke up for us, especially Mr. Urquiaga, because he was rather sassy that day. He hasn't said it today, but I saw him on TV and I liked it. It was good. He stood up for what we believe in. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Are there any other questions? I, I have one, and the concern is COLA. Essentially, the governor has restored uh, significant budgetary items and issues. And my, my question is, who is having conversation with legislative bodies to let them know the potential destruction that they're causing to the budget if we can't figure out how, how it, because really over the course of a couple of years, we're talking about 17%. And so if that percentage can't be funded by legislative body and the expectation is that the institutions are going to pull money together to fund that, and please keep in mind this, has, this is no criticism on whether or not there should be COLA funding, because frankly there should be, but how it's being funded and how this is being taken care of is a concern. Are the presidents speaking out as much as the system office is? And are we utilizing relationships that we have to best serve the needs of the institutions as a whole when we talk about this, this very serious budgetary issue? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Dale Arquiaga. And let me begin apologizing to Regent Downs for my tone is not for you. My tone is for the previous speakers. I hear a lot more of it than you do, and I get emails, and I'm very tired of my staff being belittled. So that is what you hear, sir. It's not about you. Um, I am trying to be protective of my staff, and I am very tired of the way they are treated, not by you. Um, Thank you. Mr. Chair, to you. Um, so right now, the CFO and I are speaking with legislative leaders, and I know as presidents go by to meet with the chairs, they are reiterating these concerns. I know DRI is doing that, if not this week, uh, next once we get some guidance from the chairs, um, we'll, uh, we will all circle back through them. What we learned during a couple of these hearings is that the um, over communication at members of committee <laughs> isn't always received well by the leadership. Um, the leadership called some folks in to say, you know, please knock it off. And so we're trying to do this as um, with numbers and spreadsheets. Uh, and yes, the presidents um, are and will be part of that ongoing conversation. It, it is a challenge for us. It's a good challenge because folks will be paid well, um, but the downstream effect um, is um, potentially not at all what the governor or the legislature intend. And so we're trying to show them that with spreadsheets, but we are all um, in alignment with this. The presidents discussed it last week in council. Thank you. I appreciate that. The, the, the additional concern is presidents coming back at a future meeting and asking for us to raise student fees. And I would like to not have that conversation. And so I think it's extremely important that this gets taken care of um, collaboratively and as quickly as it can. Uh, Regent Carvalho, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I will echo what you said regarding student fees. I'm, I'm concerned about um, the, uh, that conversation down the line. I, I certainly don't want to see um, additional increases to the increases that we already have to our fees. Um, I, I, this is m much smaller, and uh, I have questions on two bills that we have a neutral position on, and I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to go to get some clarification on why they're neutral. Um, AB 247, um, and AB 401. I'm, I'm happy to read the title if that helps it as well. <clears throat> AB 247 um, is regarding um, 11th and 12th grade students, and AB um, 401 uh, is regarding um, ratio of faculty members to students in courses, providing clinical training. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Dale Arquiaga, as you can tell, Alejandro is a subject matter expert, but since I am the one who has to take these positions, I'll explain them. Um, so on the first bill, um, we are neutral because the bill does a lot of other things besides those things that directly impact us. The implication for college and career readiness is great. The creation of committees to write new tests is well outside what we would do, and we use the ACT tests, which some of that 
new mechanism would replace. And so we tried to take a neutral position and provide information because we support the uh, concepts behind the bill for college and career readiness, but parts of the bill disrupt our data set and are really outside our wheelhouse, um, more in my old wheelhouse. And I, just for the record, the, I try to be careful um, just because I was state superintendent. I'm not anymore. I'm over here in this lane. And so I try to be careful um, in that regard. But it, it, much of the bill is, is very good. Um, AB 401 is um, a similar situation. It's a controversial bill for our educators. They worry very much about the ratios um, and came to testify. And really, we considered long and hard whether or not we would have to be opposed to the bill. We ultimately decided to take a neutral position um, and provide information because the bill does not change our ratios. The bill targets the Board of Nursing and requires it to do something, but our institutions can preserve their ratio. So the bill sets a ratio of faculty to nursing staff or nursing students at uh, either 10 to 1 or 12 to 1, um, significantly higher than where we are and where the professionals tell me we should be. Um, but we can still have a lower ratio um, for our purposes of accreditation and purposes of our own management. And it is about the board and its um, relations with hospitals um, and nursing recruitment. And so we tried to sort of stay out of that lane and their fight and still provide testimony about the importance of nursing education, um, but not disrupt um, a bill um, that may not impact us if, even if it passes. Thank you, I appreciate that clarification. Regent Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I did just want to acknowledge and thank um, Chancellor Urquiaga, CFO Klinger, and Director Rodriguez for all the hard work and dedication that they're putting up there um, at the legislature. I've had the opportunity to show up a few days and they're all over the building, they're having meetings, and every time I have a meeting and, and talk to people, they always have nothing but good things to say. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you for, you know, the, you're taking, you're, you're keeping track of lots of things all at once, and, and I think you're doing uh, what you think is best for us. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks. I just wanted to know about AB 431. I know we oppose it. What's the context on this thing? Is this like UNLV space versus UNR space? Is that what this is all about? For the record, um, Dale Urquiaga, yes. So this bill um, it is, I think, uh, an outgrowth of some conversations about um, funds that came during ARPA days to build um, large health-related institutions in the North and in the South, and none of those ARPA monies went to the community colleges. So there has been this conversation about parity and equity and how capital improvement projects are done. What the bill actually did, though, because of the way it was drafted, it focused solely on um, essentially UNR, UNLV, and DRI, which doesn't have a student footprint in its building plans, and it left out community colleges entirely. And so it would have created kind of a formula of until the, the institutions are at parity, equal number of square footage, and they are not today. UNR, being an older institution, has more square footage. Um, and so in an attempt to write that, it kind of caused all these unrelated problems because you have a process for capital improvement selections, and you do that based on feedback from your presidents and their um, individual needs. And so this would have disrupted that and yet left you without a lane for community colleges. And so we found the bill just sort of unworkable and, and really an, um, uh, probably over dramatic way to solve a parity issue that would cause other problems. And so we think in consultations with the presidents that there are other ways to go about that in terms of their requests. And so um, the bill was not heard. Uh, and so I don't think we'll have to deal with it. Uh, it should be. It, it should be dead. Uh, according to the rules, it should be dead. Nothing is ever dead at the legislature until Sine die. Um, but it was never heard. So, Regent Goodman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a question for the Chancellor. When uh, in my business, when we've uh, experienced budget cuts, we've all 
written letters to all of the legislators, and I just wanted to see if you felt that that would be appropriate for us to do as regents to, I have no problem writing a letter to all the legislators. That's a huge disparity between 65 and 80%. And not only that, I don't want to raise student fees. I reviewed all of the student fees, and there's already a significant amount. So um, if that's helpful and we can suggest that to this board, I would be more than happy to move forward with that and send a letter. And hopefully my colleagues would as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, Dale Kiaga, for the record. Um, so I will say, how about not yet? Uh, let me see how these meetings go um, before we um, take that step. I do think it is important, and I appreciate um, an email or letter communication rather than texting them in committee or appearing in committee um, when they're trying to close a budget. So um, I think uh, I want to see how it goes with leadership. I want to see what their level of understanding is about what that means is remember we're all used to either no colas or tiny colas and so when you have a one percent cola it's budget dust to make up the other part but when you have a 10 plus six percent cola it's millions across our system and so i just want to see i know where their staff is i kind of want to see where the leadership is um and then i will ask both you and the presidents and everyone perhaps um to sort of weigh in before closing because they can address it it will cost money, um, but if the forum comes back positive, they could do that. So we'll, we'll send out an alert. Give me just a few days to see where leadership stands and trying to be respectful of their process. Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, I did want to um, thank our wonderful team for supporting two bills that I've been working on this legislative session. Um, I co-presented AB 323, which was grown out of my research for identifying barriers to teachers in the classroom. And so removing some of those barriers, which include paid student teaching and strategically thinking about um, how we can um, better support our teachers at the um, uh, superintendent level, the state superintendent level. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and then AB 428 is a bill where um, we will have um, teaching and learning programs in every school, in high school in CCSD, and hopefully expand because I know the rural in the rurals that I represent desperately need teachers. And when students um, enter their high school and they uh, decide to be a part of this process. In 10th grade, they will meet with a support system so that we can identify any barriers that they have um, to licensure or becoming a teacher and give them the support that they need at their level, whether it's transportation, family support, navigating um, go, the FAFSA, whatever they need. And then in addition to that, once they graduate high school, they would be able to um, get, an, and I don't want to say the words wrong, um, but be able to attend an NSHE university um, to get a teaching license. So really working, I wanted to share the work that I'm doing because it's a lot of work at the ground level that is really going to impact um, our community because if our kids don't have teachers in the classroom, K-12, um, there's no job for any of us here. Um, so thank you. Mr. Chair, if, if I may. Yes. For the record, Dale Kerry, I, I just want to thank um, Regent Cruz Crawford for that work. And, and I apologize, I should have talked about the teacher pipeline bills. There's also a nursing pipeline bill, essentially, that's moving from the Senate um, that's funding. The, both of these models, but particularly the work that Regent Cruz Crawford um, has talked about and has been so instrumental in, um, I believe are scalable in other professions. And so while they deal with teaching a crisis in our state and nursing a crisis in our state, what they are designing, and there are three pipeline bills, one from the governor that includes a tremendous new um, revenue stream. Um, I think all those bills can be integrated uh, and sort of laddered, scaffolded to, to do this work. And I'm excited for our workforce training um, conversations that I'll talk about in this, the next agenda item. I think this work is scalable. What Regent Cruz Crawford created in the paraprofessionals program um, bef long before she was a regent um, is not only successful and data-driven, I think it's replicable in other kinds of lines of work. So it's those are both the nursing and the teaching work are very exciting and, and you are well represented by um, Regent Cruz Crawford. Thank you. Regent Cruz Crawford. 
Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, yeah, um, AB 428 is something that we want to look at to create these programs for nursing and high needs areas in the future. We're starting with teaching because that's our expertise, right? High school teachers know how to teach. <laughs> I'm starting to sound like Dale now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and so um, we want to put this in the nursing field. We want to look at those high in, um, critical need higher areas. So um, we're excited to see how the work expands. Thank you. Are there any other questions from any other regents? Okay, thank you for the updates and um, CFO Klinger for the reporting. What we'll do is prior to getting into the next agenda item for the uh, conversation about strategy, let's take a 10 minute administrative break and we'll come back in and uh, listen to what the chancellor has to, has to offer. Thank you. Okay, so moving right along with our agenda, we'll now go to agenda item number four. Um, and the acting chancellor will present to us uh, strategic plan implementation considerations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Dale Urquiaga and uh, Regent Boylan is coming to a seat. I will endeavor to be more sassy and less angry. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to catch my breath, Mr. Chair. So the regents who were here when I was appointed uh, and then the regents who were just elected experienced the very end of our strategic planning process. We sort of buttoned up what I would call, um, as a planning nerd, a framework with six goals, a vision um, statement, but not the way vision is used later in the document that um, we sent out to you for review. So now you are faced with a number of sort of major policy questions that you have all talked about, enrollment, staffing, uh, and mission differentiation uh, have come up a lot in the 10 months that I have been with you. And so I thought what we would do today is sort of look at some issues um, in a, a thoughtful way. I'm not asking you to make decisions today. I'm asking you to sort of um, be reflective and... Um, Think about what you need to know. What what is your what what are you curious about in order to perhaps in the future either deal with policy? Although some of these things I don't think you can policy to death. Um, it may be about money, and I'll talk about why that matters in a moment. Or it may be about your um, direction to the presidents. Or certainly it is about the hiring of your new chancellor. So uh, the regents who were here when I was appointed may recall that I told a little story that day about painting fences when I was a child. Um, I'll give you the short version. I grew up on a farm and there were four children in my family and we had corrals with wooden fences and the way my father built them, they had four boards. And when we painted the corrals, each child got a board. Um, not a board like you, a board of lumber. And my mother supervised painting. And I described for you how that helped me define in my life sort of knowing my lane and what I liked about teamwork and wearing a hat because splatter happens. And so I thought about that little story a lot in this job. And I, I give it to you today because if you think about four kids painting fences, the thing about painting a fence is you're super close to the fence. And so you don't really see the corral, let alone, in our case, the cows who were inside that corral. All you see is right here. And so I bring that story back for you today to get you to step away from the fence and look at the corral, um, if you'll pardon the farm analogy, um, and think about that in totality rather than that one um, piece that you have or that you care most passionately about. And um, why am I asking you to do that? Well, there are sort of three reasons. Um, one, as I have mentioned, you are engaged in a chancellor search. And I think how you create a point of view around the whole um, enchilada, the whole corral, is important as you search for a person whose job is to help you carry that out. Um, so that's one. I think your search, it's good to think about these things as you begin interviewing folks. Um, the second is the deconsolidation bill that I mentioned. If there is, in fact, support in the legislative body or in the community to govern higher education and organize higher education dramatically differently, six entities instead of one, 
Why? And what is the alternative to that? Simply holding our breath till we are blue and saying we don't want to do that is probably not an answer. And that bill was turned into a study. And so you will have lots of opportunity to present information and then information will be presented for you. And so I think it's important as you think about that effort, and remember that effort is my third reason, it's married up very tightly to the funding formula study. You heard from earlier speakers, um, Governor Lombardo has requested this, we fully support it. Our community colleges are treated exactly the same as the R1 universities in the current funding formula. It was known when the formula was created that it was required to be cost neutral, meaning no new money, and, in, and it would probably over time advantage um, the universities. Most people would tell you that is in fact played out. And so this idea is in the interim, as you talk about funding and you talk about structure and you talk about things like enrollment, what impact does that have on the current funding formula or what funding formula might be designed? So that is why um, I've, uh, working with the staff, have decided we would bring you kind of a um, primer on some of the issues that have kept me awake for the last 10 months and that I think will be um, pretty determinative for you and the system and its institutions in this interim period before the 25 legislature. So I'm going to um, pretend that I am an educator today. I'm going to assume you've done your homework and you've read everything and I'm not going to go page by page and I'm not going to use a PowerPoint projector. You have to look at me in instead of slides. Um, and I'm asking you today to keep track of, make notes, shout out, ask questions. What are the inferences you make in having read all of that? What are, you, what are your takeaways? I'll tell you what mine are. Um, I have opinions about everything, as you know now. And what more do you need to know as we go forward? So those are the things I'd like you to think about. What, what do you learn from these materials, lengthy as they are, and what is still a question for you that you're holding? And the last thing I'll say before I dive into the the three topics of enrollment, sort of staffing quickly, and then mission differentiation. Nothing that I'm going to say today is designed to be a criticism of any institution. Enrollment numbers are what they are. Um, that is not within the sole control of a president, um, and you should not think about it in that way. Um, mission statements are what they are. Planners like me get fussy about wording, and so if you wrote one that I'm non keen on today, I apologize. But I just want you to say, I just want you to understand, I'm not being critical for once. Um, I often am, um, but not here. I'm just trying to get us up out of the weeds um, and thinking about some critical issues. So I'll start with enrollment. We gave you lots and lots of data, um, some of it very current and some of it trend-related from uh, WICHE, the Western Interstate Compact for Higher Education. In full disclosure, I am a commissioner of WICHE by virtue of being your chancellor. I don't present the data, it's not my data, but you should know that I work very closely with Wichi. They're very supportive. Their data is good. It's about um, the West. It's hard to compare us to Massachusetts or New York. It's a little easier to compare us to some of the Western states. Maybe not the one to our immediate West, um, but the others. So when I look at all that data and I sit here for 10 months, here's what I get. Enrollment's flat. That's after a big decline. Big decline because of the pandemic. I get that but it was really high, steady decline, growth back up, and now flat. And it's growing, but it's growing in dribs and drabs. And as you heard from a previous speaker, that's happening across the country. Community colleges in particular um, are struggling um, with enrollment numbers. Well, that, as you know, has an impact on our funding. But if you look at some of this other data, high school graduation rates will also impact us. High school classes got smaller. In the Great Recession, apparently, people had plenty of time on their hands, but they did not have more kids. Um, same thing will happen, we think, with the pandemic. Um, so there'll be what we used to call a, um, pardon the expression, a pig moving through an anaconda. There's sort of a reverse pig now. The anaconda is going to look really skinny and hungry for a while because graduation classes are smaller. Those students matriculate to us. <laughs> and in this case, the numbers are just getting smaller. If you look at the data about continuance, First of all, Nevadans don't have high degree attainment. We all know that. And high school students in Nevada do not progress to post-secondary education. The first time we sliced this data, we had one data set of where they went, and then we got better data. And now we know that um, about uh, 27, 29% of them don't go anywhere. We don't know where they go. Some get a job. That's terrific. Some proceed. But like, I think it's about less than half continue to post-secondary. What does that say about us? 
What does that say about the value proposition that we're offering? We higher ed writ large. If you also look in the data, you can see workforce will be a challenge. Uh, workforce training programs, we are degree heavy. Um, if, you've, if you look at our um, just recently updated dashboard, which I know Regent Arascada, I think he sleeps with that thing because he's always quoting data points from the dashboard. If you spend some time on that updated dashboard, you'll see our numbers of certificates is actually down in this weird workforce training time. But our graduation rates are growing. Your institutions have done a terrific job. Um, and then lastly, you'll see in the data, we are not the only state that is um, pursuing dual credit as an enrollment. You can see a growth in students under 18. Those are high school students, folks, who are coming to our institutions, but also institutions throughout the West. So that's kind of my quick, here's what I got out of the enrollment. So then my research questions of so what, Regent Del Carlo? Sure, you can stop me at any time. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, uh, Chair. Because I, I just want to clarify on page three, what, under the non-degree seeking students, are they, is that undeclared majors? What's a non-degree seeking student? I'll get the answer half right if I give it. So I'm gonna actually ask Executive Vice Chancellor Abba, okay, who I see taking a drink to tell you what's all in non-degree. Okay, and then my other question was, the percentage there, the, is, is, are these figures all with dual enrollment added to it too? Because I noticed on page three, 46% change, oh, no, that was the graduate students. But I just wanted to know if it includes dual enrollment students, right? Thank For you. For the record, Crystal Abba. For the record, Crystal Abba, Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief of Staff. So yes, to your second question, these numbers do include dual enrollment. And actually, the majority of the non-degree seeking um, category that you referred in your first question, those are dual enrollment students. Thank you for the clarification. I thought that's what it was, but I want to make sure we all understood the same thing. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, my so what questions, because this is just data, so what? The questions that I was asked repeatedly at the legislature is one of my first questions. Are our recruitment strategies working? Um, I was asked questions um, by particularly legislators of color who look at um, African-American data. It's flat. It was 8%. It's still 8%. Um, so are we doing anything differently there, or is that simply the size of the population? So I, I have questions about recruitment. Um, is that part of the enrollment, and what could be done? How could you support the institutions? They do tremendous work. But one of the questions I have when I look at the demography is are we recruiting or are we simply sort of standing here and we are a product of our demography? Like that's just what Nevada looks like today. There's a higher number of people who declare two races and there's a higher um, Hispanic or Latino population in the state. So are we recruiting that as access or is it sort of shown up? Those are things I wonder about. And if you have an access mission, you might wanna get underneath some of that data and understand it. Um, the other is the question I alluded to. What's the value proposition of higher education? There's a move in this country to say, not everybody needs to go to college. Not everybody needs a degree. Okay, but there are other kinds of higher or post-secondary education. And so let's not say not everybody needs to go to college and then they don't come and get a certificate. We already have low attainment levels and low continuance levels. So what's the value proposition? Is it about our timing? Is it about our cost? Is it about a number of things? I think you should be asking yourselves those questions, as I know your presidents do. And then, what is the fiscal impact? We're a system that is funded by the state based on um, FTEs and weighted student credit hours. And so when in June, we will bring to you some modeling of differing enrollment levels and what that means in the current funding formula. Um, it was our, we have some special project funding this year that we were able to use to hire um, applied analysis to model enrollment so we can bring to you and the presidents, here's what happens if it continues flat or if it continues down, but our costs continue to go up. There may be, I don't know, I haven't seen the numbers yet, there may be a fiscal cliff in your future that doesn't look good. There may be a fiscal cliff for only certain institutions who will reach a point of non-viability. So that was, that's my last question when I think about enrollment is what's the fiscal impact? The next bucket of data, tiny, compares um, student diversity to staffing diversity. And you can see we've made progress in recruiting a more diverse staff, but our staff still does not look like our student population. 
probably will never look exactly like our student population, or at least not for a long time, because it is taking in America a longer time, um, frankly, for people of color to move through to get a PhD and then come to a university. They were um, a marginalized population, and they didn't get as many degrees as uh, people who look like me did in the 20th century. And so we can see that. Our staff is um, changing. Our students are changing more rapidly in terms of their diversity and demographics. Um, and then I look at where we are with staffing. You don't have the numbers here, but the president's recently reviewed things like um, vacancy rates. Um, ours is about 12 to 15 percent uh, across the system. But also uh, when we presented at Senate Finance, we rely particularly in the two-year institutions heavily on part-time faculty, heavily. They're cheaper, uh, they're more nimble. There are money implications under that as well. And so as you think about, and as your presidents think about a compensation philosophy, um, the, uh, the, the update you heard from NFA about those benefits which were restored by the legislature, those which were not, long-term disability is being discussed by your business officers and presidents. Um, what are the implications for you to, hold, to recruit and then hold a staff? One of the conversations I had this week um, with one of the provosts, actually with both of the university provosts in separate settings, is about graduate students and our ability to hold them when we are competing with R1 universities all over the world, frankly. Uh, and so that's why the graduate student stipend was before you, but there are other issues about that. So I give you just the demography here, but I ask you to think about what's underneath that. Um, I have asked your idea council, not the committee, but the council, which reports to the chancellor, to look at some of the data and tell me where the holes are, what else did they need to know so they can advise you and the committee on what to do. So I give you the just the teaser about equity and staffing, and I remind you that your presidents are talking about the recruitment issue. I'm going to interrupt you just for a pause right there. Yeah, for a for a question from Regent Perkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was looking at the employee headcount by ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, does that include like the VP? Can the VPs be broken out like the upper? Does this include that? I guess. Yes. Yeah, so. It, okay, you're reading my mind. It's okay, a great question. Ahead. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I had the same question from a legislator, and we disaggregated it and sent it, I believe, to either Senate Finance or assembly ways and means, we disaggregate it to the best of our record keeping. So I'll find that slide for them, that we gave to them, and I will um, show you. Because that is, that's a key question. If everybody in the administration is still white, uh, or all LOAs are people of color, then what have we done really, if uh, that we claim um, that we have um, diversified our employment base? Perhaps we've not, right? So you're, you're right to get underneath the data a little more. And I, I'm pretty sure we pulled that. Uh, for the legislature. So thank, thank you for that answer. That was exactly my question. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to pause here and see. So I just want you to sort of sit with that all for a little minute. You've got enrollment, <laughs> and you have a funding formula that's based on that, but you have an opportunity to talk about a funding formula change over this next year, I should think, if that bill passes. So what might you be curious about? What might you ask your CFO or your presidents and your business officers to begin to prepare for, for that funding conversation? Um, because as your costs go up and your enrollment does this, Andrew knows the mathiness better than I, but even I know that's probably a bad model. Uh, that means you raise fees because you don't have a lot of places to go for other revenue and you've all said you don't wish to do that. So um, I, I ask you to think about staffing and think about enrollment as linked, but also to think about the funding implications. So I'll pause again just to see if there are Regent questions. Regent Del Carlo, do you have a question? No. Oh, Mr. Regent Jeff. Carvalho, do you have a question? Um, he, thank you, um, Mr. Chancellor, for, for um, starting us down this road. Uh, one thing that I am wondering about is we hear about the, the enrollment cliff um, is as this this eminent future that we all will have. But on the other hand, I hear all the time that um, Nevada's population is continuing to grow and grow and grow, and it, it's going to it's going to continue down that road. And and um, so I think that maybe part of the answer to this is about our value proposition in higher education is probably part of why we, we're concerned about that. Um, so I, I I think it's important for us to to continue to. Um, investigate 
what our value proposition is and how we um, position ourselves um, as a driver of, of uh, economic prosperity for our residents in Nevada, especially if our population is going to rise. I just simply, I, I don't necessarily see how, how we have an enrollment cliff. So I, I'd like to understand that kind of dichotomy a little bit more as well. Um, thank you for the record, Dale or Kiaga. I think that's a great question as a gateway to a couple of things, um, Regent Carvalho. One is, um, yes, Nevada's population is growing. You look at most of that data and it'll continue to do so. At the same time, if you look at the data from the Clark County School District, their enrollment census is declining. They just released numbers this week that they're at, don't quote me, 304,000 this year, 301,000 in the coming year, 290 something in five years. So the high school populations might shrink. We see that demography. But at the same time, Nevadans are working here. And so I see in that an opportunity, when you get to the mission conversation, what are we doing in the workforce training space? Um, if folks don't wish to come to us for an associate's, a bachelor's, a master's, or a doctoral degree, what are we offering in a coherent way in the workforce space? And so one of, when we talk about mission, one of my wonderings is, what could we do differently there to get to capture that population, which isn't our traditional 18 to 25 age band um, or all these high school students, which we're good at capturing. It's We still have a third in some of our institutions more in that age band, but maybe that's an age band that we ought to think about. Well, they have different degree needs. They also have different time needs. They have kids, they're caring for parents, they're like me and they're about to be retired. So we're not set up for that, right? So that's, I think your question gets to that nexus of how do we offer things, modality, buildings, and to whom and toward what end. And I appreciate that response because that's where, where I was going to go with some of this is, is the, the student that we see today or sometimes that we, we position ourselves for is not the student that often comes to our doors even today, and it, and I think in the future we will see a lot more of that, and we need to be um, we need to be prepared for that. And I and I think that our institutions are are seeing that and and moving towards that. But we as a board as well need to understand um, policy decisions and where we need to go um, in order to support those students. I think it's very important for us to understand that this this is happening today, and and just will continue to do so. For sure. Thank you. Regent Borland. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, to, uh, of course, uh, uh, Dale Urquiago. Every sassy. time. Sassy Urquiago. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Well, um, every time you mention the farm, it makes me think of Alex Hudley's The Farm. You oh. know, and I'm like, that's that should be reading for all of us. I love it. <laughs> but you mentioned hiring someone to look into the demography, mm. the demographics or whatever. Why couldn't we get someone at just UNLV? We have master's students, PhD students, lecturers, yeah. instructors, you know, yeah. professors who I'm sure would be the best at it. We already have them. It would help them in their future. You know, they could write a paper, it could go to a magazine. Why are we always, uh, we are an one university. Why do we always want to spend taxpayers' money and says, oh, let's hire somebody from the outside? It doesn't make any sense to me. So if we are going to tighten our belts and we are going to get all these budget cuts and such, we've got in-house people. I, I know, I, I'm looking at Dr. Whitfield and he's saying, hey, I can do it. No, he isn't, I'm kidding. But he'll find somebody for sure. So why do we always do this go out? I think you understand what I'm saying. Do. Especially you're an educated, learned man, and you know about the farm and everything. So and you know where I'm headed with that. So why don't we find somebody in our own educational institutions? Is that too difficult? Is there a reason? Um, for the record, Dale Kiaga. So uh, no, not at all. And I did this intentionally in this instance for a reason that I'll get to in a moment. Um, I will also say I agree with you. We hold a number of research institutions, both policy and um, economic and um, uh, mathiness, uh, throughout our institutions. We are actually working with um, the College of Urban Affairs across the street on some evaluation uh, work 
just yesterday we had a, a conversation last week with them. The reason I went outside for this particular analysis is because of the funding formula study that's coming. The firm that I chose has participated in every funding formula study or adequacy study review in K-12 in the last 15 years, certainly my career um, in K-12. And our researchers saying, oh, look, here's a fiscal cliff caused by the current funding formula is a little uh, suspect, even if they're right. So I deliberately, because yes, I, while I am not a learned man, I am a farm kid, I have been in politics a very long time. And so I know that people question data sets uh, when they don't want to raise taxes or change funding formulas. So I chose the firm that has an impeccable reputation and has participated in every tax conversation and funding formula study in my recent 12-year career in government. That's why I chose them, sir. No uh, disrespect to our institutions. Um, that's well, why. Thanks, Chancellor. I appreciate that. It really makes sense to me now. Thank you. Regent Breger. Thank you, Susan Breger, for the record. I think something we have to look at is we always hear CCSD. Well, CCSD is losing students, but they're still here. And the problem is, is that they are not being, their needs are not being met. So parents or grandparents are looking to other ways to educate them. Yep. And so if we looked at those numbers of the, mm -hmm. the private campuses and the in-home schools, we need to find a way to address that and get out to them. And I don't think we do um, everything that we can with our CCSD students to see where they want to go, what they want to do. And I think there are some more things that we can do. As far as the demographics in our state growing, it's not necessarily the traditional family of mom and dad and two or three children. It is adults that are not having children, or it is adults that have already grown their children and they're coming here to retire. And that's just from my real estate background and what I do pretty much daily. So it's, it's a matter of learning. And then I think we need to be very understanding and figure out how we do this, even if it is our part-time students, that all people can be educated. And maybe at 18, 19, and 20, and 25, you didn't have the funds, but at 25 to 30, you do. And I think that's where our, uh, um, all campuses, but in particular, a community college or a college system, community college system can get those uh, sort of adults from 25 to 40 that want to continue on a career or cha have a career change and getting something out to those demographics and there's ways to do that yeah, would be very beneficial for our system. Great. Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record. Um, since this is an information piece on strategic planning and enrollment staffing and pipeline is like my jam, I did want to share with the board and our constituents um, some, some stories. Um, when I became uh, the leader in my building eight years ago, I had 900 students. After the pandemic right now, I have 550 students. I have been to almost every single one of my students' houses. Um, Pre-pandemic, it's part of our, um, our teacher's requirement on staff development day to make those positive connections before school starts. And um, I've knocked on doors and jumped over bushes and looked through windows. And um, there's, there's multiple reasons why um, students are leaving. Um, some of them shared housing. Um, doing um, homeschool, but in my community, homeschool looks a lot different than homeschool looks like in Summerlin. They're taking care of brothers and sisters and helping um, their parents work. And so, um, but the scariest part is those kids that we can't really find. And how this is interesting to me is because I've really been working on, you know, um, how do we increase our enrollment in college and how do we get our kids to have a college or career plan. Um, yesterday, I had a student from Rancho High School, Jesus, um, follow me for a day because community and schools asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a teacher. So they do a whole day where they get to do, get to follow that person in their career. And then I said, you know, there's, there's this young Latino male, let me get my young Latino male teachers that I thankfully have because there's not those on every campus and sit with him at lunch. And they came up with an entire college plan with him, talked about grants 
And today he's spending the day at um, CSN in Nevada State College. And I guarantee I'm gonna check in with him in a few years, he will be a teacher. And so I'm sharing this because I, every time I talk to a young person or even um, a senior person that has been a paraprofessional, I have a teacher right now, a paraprofessional that is 60 years old that just passed the praxis and she is going to be a teacher. It's never that um, they don't want to do it. They haven't been asked, how can we help you? And I've never had someone say, I don't want to do it. They're like, wait, that's a possibility. We need, our, our community needs hand-holding. Done are the days of respect is earned. Respect is a human right. And so I have an idea, but I'm only one person. I think mentorship needs to be job embedded in all of our careers. I think that as a principal or teachers on a seven hour and 11 minute contract, they already pushed the bone right now. But why not one staff development day, everyone that signed up, they're one on one holding them. They're going through the college process. They're showing them what their day looks like. We need job embedded mentorship in all of our careers to help um, save this. So I don't know if this is the right thing to say right here, but I wanted to, I wanted to share um, some of this antecedent data because it's very important. Every single person I've ever worked with enrolled and graduated college that wanted to do it. So we need to reach into the community and it's not a it's higher education thing. It's a K through 12 issue. And so our schools need us to be able to get in there for it to be successful. So anyways, that's it. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks, and mine's almost a follow on to what uh, Regent uh, Cruz Crawford was saying, because I was looking at slide five, and it's to have the percentage of adults with associate degrees or higher in Nevada. We are at the bottom, no surprise, at 32%, and our closest one is five points higher. So that I would love to see in this whole strategic plan things to think about. Why is it the culture in Nevada so... Um, does not value higher education. And, and that is a K through 12. That's when you, we start at K through 12 and that mentorship and home and all that. I mean, because we certainly need these people to go on into skills and workforce and all of it. I mean, it, it's, this is a huge problem. I mean, but I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, for the record, Dale Urquiaga, thank you, Regent Del Carlo. It, even when one adds certificates to that number, we're still last. We pull up to like, I don't know, it's 45% or something under the Lumina Foundation work. So even when we offer the work training, we're not uh, at scale yet. And so um, I do think getting underneath that some of the why um, uh, would, be, would be good as well as some more numbers in that space, which we can get for you. So thank you. Regent Perkins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wow, everybody's covered all the great subjects. But um, um, I agree with my co um, almost everything that my colleagues have brought forward. Um, the well-lit path, um, I, I remember one of uh, a colleague, or not a colleague, a constituent came to me and said, hey, I can get a better job, or uh, in my same workplace, I can get a, high, a raise to go to a different position if I only have a little bit of background in social media. Well, I said, oh, social media? The community college offers social media class, and it's a very short class. You can get in and out of it. So they went through all the process, and then at the end, um, there was a bill. And I'm like, well, if you really, the scholarships don't apply to that because it's a certificate. And if we need, we need to put our our money where our mouth, or put our our money where our mouth is. If we want people to come to us and to get these certificates, we need to put those certificates in the same category as um, a degree seeking student. Um, we did a great job with stackable um, credentials, which I think we'll see uh, further us over the next couple of years or so. It's just gonna take time to pick up the steam. Um, but the stackable credits is one thing that we do really well and we have done well and we can always improve on that. Um, to take advantage of new modalities, I don't think we've done that enough. Um, there's programs where you could start and stop your classes. Like, you know, if you can't go do from eight to 10 on Tuesday and Thursday, you could, Maybe, maybe you need like the time you said uh, when 
you know, you have kids, you have jobs, you have responsibilities that you have to get done. If there's start and stop classes, which are offered by other institutions, we can get in on that. Um, and we can improve our, we can increase the number of students that come to us that don't have, we have, we have shifts that change every week. I mean, MGM is our biggest employer, or second biggest employer in the state. That those are not steady shifts where you can say, oh, we, you know, Tuesday and Thursday, I can do this. Those are not, that's not, that's not our environment and that's not us. Um, start and stop. Stackable scholarships, yes. And scholarships, um, our, our scholarships within the state, like uh, Nevada Promise and um, those type of scholarships, they're targeted for 18 to 21. And if we really want this, the students that we serve, 25 and above, those scholarships need to be adjusted or targeted or changed so that people that are not fresh out of high school, that are returning to improve themselves and retool and reskill, re have access to those funds also. Thank you. Regent Goodman. Um, Regent Goodman, for the record, um, I love Regent Cruz Crawford's passion. And um, my sentiment actually is, is kind of to back up what she was talking about. I've had conversations with President Zaragoza and Chief of Staff Weekly and President Pollard, and, and actually President Zaragoza and, and Chief of Staff Weekly, and I kind of dug down on this, um, gosh, last week or the week before, but I think what we really need to talk about too are those students that just automatically opt out. The students who say, I can't go to college because my parents didn't go to college, or my, uh, yeah, I can't afford college, or I'm, I'm not worth it. I, I, I just think that if there's a way, and you know, this isn't brain surgery. I feel like the, the mentorship uh, program is something that we could do, and it, it's something that we could actually tackle and get done and not have to wait for a study and not have to wait for a year. It's something that could actually happen. I think, too, that we should have a student ambassador program so you have students that are going into the community centers in East Las Vegas and in West Las Vegas and, and um, students that look like the kids that they're talking to and say, hey, I'm here, you can be here too. And so we just need to, like I said, it's not brain surgery. These are things that we can do that we can affect and make happen now. And I, I think it's imperative that we do this. We need to stop Everyone has an opportunity, and we should just make sure that all of our students know that. So um, I, I understand the, the older student as well. I mean, our demographic is that. But at the same time, I, I'm sick of kids getting left behind. So I think these are things that we can really affect in the next year. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, for the record, Taylor Kiaga. So I'm, I'm keeping notes, and I'm hearing what I could see for future staff presentations about financial aid, presentations about what we do for student ambassadors, so you can talk about scale. Um, I, I do want to um, acknowledge what is being done and could be scaled. And then there are huge holes in the financial aid net in this state. Um, and so that's a conversation that you could uh, have as well. So I'm trying to, to glean your inferences as we go. Um, Mr. Chair, if I might, I think I'll move us to the next big topic. Um, if you know what, we have just a, we have a couple of other questions um, in here. And before we get to Regent Breger, what I what I want to do is ask because there's a time delay based on our technology. Sometimes it's difficult for those who are on a phone or who are coming through through uh, Zoom to chime in. So I'm going to pause for a second to ask if any of the regents who are um, using technology to attend the meeting if they have any questions. I don't see any, so we'll move right to Regent Breger. Sorry, Susan Breger, for the record. I don't want to belabor it, but when we talk about our numbers being, you know, down low in the states and other states have more people going to college, I think we do need to remember we're a unique state. And approximately, three, just in Clark County, approximately 300,000 people work in hotels. That doesn't mean they can't continue to be educated, but we have to find ways to get to them. The same thing as uh, we've been hearing around the table today. We're all thinking, and it feels really good for all of us to really be thinking very much alike. And I think our student achievement is our biggest factor other than hiring uh, a chancellor. And so hearing that today is very rewarding. Um, and you're right about the you know, uh, scholarships. 
like the Public, Edu Found Public Education Foundation that I sit on, they do a number of millions of dollars for students. But we need to look at our 16 to 18-year-olds, just as um, Regent Goodman and Regent uh, Chris Crawford, and all of us really, I don't want to leave anyone out, are stating that we need, it's too bad we don't have one, and I've said this giant bucket. They jump in, and they don't go because someone needs more FTE, or they want to increase just their college. I think if students know that they could go where it best meets their need, maybe they need two years or three years at CSN. Maybe they need to go right to uh, UNLV. So I've seen that across the board. I mean, I've had so far six or eight of my grands graduate and six of them from UN, uh, UNLV. But um, I think we look too narrow sometimes and what it takes to educate a student and not what we want for them, but what are they looking for? And so I think identifying that could increase our numbers. And if we look at a five-year goal, that that's approximately what it's going to take. But don't forget that in a state of, what, a little over 2 million, 300,000 just in Clark County work in our hotel industry. That is vital. Mm -hmm. But they need to feel rewarded, and they need to feel good about themselves. And I'm all for college degrees, but I'm also for what meets society's certifications. I don't want to fix my plumbing or my electrical. So let's make sure that we are identifying a worthy uh, fiscal responsibility to those that do serve us. You know, everybody can't be at the top. Thank you. Um, for the record, Dale Urquiaga, so I'd just say to uh, Regent Boylan's earlier question, the conversation we had uh, this last two weeks with the UNLV College of Urban Affairs research team um, is about the hotel program that y'all have approved, the MGM program its success, and now they've asked us to go find out a little bit more about it. They've asked them to go find out a little bit more about it, and they're working with us. I would also say, um, I agree with you, it's um, really nice to hear the board about be up here and to talk about the, the students. And what I would say to you as a, someone who has dabbled in research, we should go talk to young people. You're being talked at by a nearly 60-year-old white dude um, from rural Nevada. So we should probably go ask some students. <laughs> uh, and not our students, but the ones we missed, the 27 to 29% who went nowhere. Um, so that's another thing that we can put on our agenda is what and use our own research institutions, sir, to go and ask um, the youth in our communities, um, why did it even come? What could we change? With that, Mr. Chair? I don't want to... I've got one more, of your time. one more question from Regent Downs before you continue. Thank you, Regent Downs, for the record. Let me turn my, take my hand down. So uh, you know, I appreciate the opportunity again to speak. Um, so I'm curious what the enrollment managers of the different campuses have, um, what their experiences are in all this, because I know I've been in that area for a bit. Um, they're always looking for ways to, to reach out to students and to um, and work with the academic side to develop programs that are attractive to students. Uh, so I, I assume there's coordination there and has your office heard from those enrollment managers as to what they see are the challenges? I mean, one of my questions are, is, um, do we are, we, are we capturing some of that enrollment as dual enrollment now, so we don't necessarily see it as college enrollment later on right. when they're college age? Yep. Um, thank you, Regent Down, for the record, Dale Arquiaga. So we, again, um, were asked a question similar to that by the legislature about what uh, strategies do work. And so I believe a document was pulled through uh, student and academic affairs as to kind of what the enrollment folks said about that. But I would say we could do a lot more of uh, working jointly across the institutions to hear what they're hearing um, and aggregating it uh, for trends. Um, and as, as the presidents have all said to me, like, look, I'm running out of tricks. They're, they've done this and they've done this and they've done this. And so if we, could, if we could do a better job of bringing you that information of which tricks worked, what are our best practices, I think that would be very useful. So thank you for that reminder. And we'll, I'll find that um, information that went back as well as the diversity information. Thank you. You bet. There's, there's just a couple of things, and uh, having uh, provided, I believe every region has been able to ask the, the questions that they want pertaining to this uh, agenda item. So what I, before you move on, what I wanted to add is there are a lot of things that we could take a look at underneath this, and there's still a lot of spokes on the wheel. One of them, if we're talking about strategies, particularly enrollment, um, is 
how are we setting students up and how are we supporting our institutions and do we need to put the community back in community college? Is that something that we have to do to, to, be, to, to be part of the process of providing a very clear picture in terms of what institution does what and what is it that they're providing? And then the other part of that is we've, we have to have conversations about dual enrollment yeah. um, because there seems to be a process in which while we recognize there's a significant decline in enrollment overall based on years, data, we, we, we can't use a dual enrollment model as a way to prop up, at least I'm gonna suggest this, an institution in terms of the numbers that they have. Because then you kind of turn this into a feeding frenzy almost of how are we going to be attracting students so that we can put them in our dual enrollment program so we can elevate the numbers that we're showing for, for enrollment. And so then it becomes, is there a process in which the board has conversation and decides that there will almost be areas that institutions will focus on specifically for dual enrollment. And that model may have been something that was used quite some time ago, or is it simply statewide? And is it a essentially a free for all and then if, if we're taking a look at these and we're recognizing that other institutions are coming into areas where current institutions exist, is it because there, there are needs that are not being met? And if so, what are those needs? And then what can be done with the institution in that community to be able to support the needs of those students so that somebody else doesn't have to come in and um, make sure that things are getting taken care of? And so the, the dual enrollment whether it's a statewide mission or service areas, if you will, I think is a very important conversation to have when we talk about strategy. And then the, when we talk about the system of education, it still feels to me like we're having lots of conversation about the system of education, but we're not entirely operating as a system. And part of that system is K through 12. And so there's a consideration that there could be more in ongoing conversations with the Board of Trustees, with Superintendent Jara, so that we eventually come up with a process for educating folks in Nevada that really is a system, so that there's, there's clear channels and clear understanding of what, what's happening for students when they graduate from a, a high school and where, where are they gonna land inside the state of Nevada, and hopefully have implementations of, of processes where once those awards are given, those, those students have the opportunity to stay in Nevada. And so those, again, are part of process that we should be speaking about in terms of, of um, where the board sits and who's, who's driving those agendas and who's holding who accountable for, for some of this. In other words, uh, it is, are we setting this up so that we're providing lots of, of lat latitude for institutions? Are we setting it up to provide the system office with the ability to execute things through the funnel of the institutions? Or is the board overseeing this and the board is holding everyone accountable for the things that have to be done. Um, and so those are more conversations that I think we could have, particularly when it comes to the, the overall mission of the board itself, so that we can take a look at the conversations we should be having to be able to support access, student success, the campus experience that these students are having, and then what it looks like to support the institutions and where do those institutions play a role inside our community. And so those are some of the things that I wanted to offer um, so that we can consider those prior to moving on to the next, <laughs> next place in your, in your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Taylor Kiaga, that's a perfect segue to the next section um, because the next packet of information you have is about mission. And um, the primer from Witchy, I think, is an excellent way to sort of get into this. It's really easy in this conversation to talk about mission creep, which is a pejorative, and they encourage us to use mission differentiation, so you're clear. Um, they also encourage, to the chair's point, what is the mission of the board? What is what I would call as a planning nerd the vision uh, overarching um, that sort of holds that together? You've heard me talk about systeminess. Mathiness is Andrew's thing. Systeminess is my thing. Um, what does that look like? And then if you take the what I have called in previous lives the ecosystem of pre-K-12, pre-K-20 workforce, um, that's the conversation about the broader um, population we serve. And so what is the vision for that? I always say 
parents don't think of their child as this is my third grade child and that is my college student or this is my Pell Grant student and this is my WIOA student. They're, they're kids. And so our systems are not di- designed that way. So I agree with you. There's lots to be had there. When I go through the witchy primer, I get to there. There's a need for a good, healthy conversation about the role of the system, why it's a system. Because remember, there are folks who don't want to be a system anymore. They want it to be several systems. And so why is it a system? Is that the right method? You could ask those questions. Um, The chair has outlined several. Um, When I look at the the other documents, I get to a couple of nitpicky things, because I'm sassy, I guess. Um, I would look at the tiered definitions in Title IV workforce training or workforce development, I think probably needs to be more explicit than it is in the community college tiering, given where that has gone. Um, I would uh, encourage um, you to work with um, at least the three of the institutions, CSN, WNC, and TMCC. Again, no criticism intended. Their mission statements feel like vision statements. GBC has done a really nice job, I think, Um, not to edit people, but I think that Statement is pretty important to how then you align programs that come to you for approval. Um, And again, I'll go back to my earlier comment about I think you should consider workforce as a a major strategy. Well, largely workforce programs are not funded by the state. They're self-supporting. And so we price them differently, which means often we price them high, which is exclusionary when we're an access system. And so making an effort to have them be state-supported um, Federico is going to cheer. Um, excuse me, President Zaragoza is going to cheer because I know this is his thing. Like that's an important thing you could think about um, as the fun- funding formula is um, considered. Um, Regent Del Carlo, some time ago, and I apologize for the length of time. It's about the shortages of staff. Has asked us to look at the self-supporting programs and the, the degrees that or the certificates that come out of there, and you know, how does that process align? The question got shuffled around internally a lot. Man, that's my fault, not the staff's. And one of the things that I got to when you all began to ask us questions about your committee structure, you'll see the proposal later from us for you to think about is, I have administratively put the vice chancellor or assistant vice chancellor position for workforce into academic and student affairs because it, when they were separated, they were separated for lots of good reasons, um, and they worked over here and they worked over here. And if we are thinking about this as an academic mission or as a student support mission, administratively we've put them together. And that's why one of the things we've asked you to think about is having you do that with your committees um, as you think about their revision too. So um, those are sort of the things that I take away from um, the mission time. Um, and then uh, the chair has expressed um, some others. I just, in the time you have them reigning, if you have other things you'd like us to bring you um, that ties to these earlier conversations, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. Thank you. We, we have a question from Regent Brown. Thank you, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, I just want to say I'm really invested in this idea of building out a strategic plan for the system, and I appreciate that I'm hearing from the chancellor and my colleagues that we're ready to kind of actually do a deep dive into you know, how we can not only raise retention rates, but make college more accessible by creating more exposure, et cetera. Um, and I think Chair Brooks summarized my next point really well. Um, but I do believe that we should build a better working relationship with us and the school board trustees. So when we say we're focused on K through 16, there's actually more of a collaboration and strategy across the state. Um, especially since we're already involved in high schools with dual enrollment. And I know, you know, we need to address mission differentiation and defining the parameters of dual enrollment so we can expand, um, but expand it appropriately and ensure that we're setting students up for long-term success. Um, I am optimistic that we have a funding formula study coming, excuse me, a funding study (laughs) coming um, because I think it, I'm hoping that it will take into account that our colleges, community colleges have very different needs than our R1 needs. Um, And then I'd also like just to put on the record that I'd like to include stackable credentials in that discussion. Um, UNR has an amazing pilot program with Google right now 
Um, and I think that's amazing exposure for their students, but the students who go through this program are not actually receiving college credit, um, but it is re amazing real world experience. And I'd like us to consider and look at these different programs that our institutions offer and figure out how we can expand these stackable credentials. Great. And the last point that um, I, own, I recently learned about this thing called the Sandy program, uh, which is a partnership with GoEd, local libraries, and our community colleges, and they offer free training certifications in key industries to all Nevadans. I mean, this program is awesome. It's done through VR goggles, so it can be done at home, and it is meant to give access and uh, open a gateway into getting a degree and additional certifications. And I think this is a really good way for us to um, have discussions and be strategic on how we build out our workforce training programs across all of our institutions to make higher education more accessible. You know, Regent, Regent Brager, Regent uh, Goodman, uh, Regent Cruz Crawford, really everyone. But those are the three I heard today that really honed in on this. And I think I'm just very optimistic that we're thinking in this way. Um, so, you know, there's so much information and opportunities out there. And I would just like to think us as a board, as a system, um, that we are looking at all the institutions on how they grow within their mission and, you know, kind of build up as we have these strategic conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, for the record, Dale Urquiaga, um, I appreciate that, Regent Brown, and I would I would echo much of what you said, and, and I think dual enrollment is one of those mission conversations. It's also an area that's ripe for further research. Um, what is what does it look like in Nevada? I know what it looks like nationwide. It's a really great strategy. How is it working here? Um, uh, Nevada State has really good data um, on that. Not all of our institutions have the ability to, to pr produce as much longitudinal data um, as that institution does. And so I think, again, we can ask our institutions to, to look at some of these questions. Uh, and I think Regent Brown is correct. The, the, this notion of stackable credentials um, should be included when you um, talk about um, the funding formula. So, Mr. Chair, I know we're about at time. Um, any other questions for me? I just have one or two last things just to say. Are there, are there any regents that have questions? Seeing none. Okay. Go ahead. And I'll just make some um, concluding remarks. So, first of all, thank you um, for bearing with me and for um, getting to this conversation of looking at the whole um, corral. And that it gives me guidance to, um, as you hire a new chancellor, to orient that individual about holding time in your agendas for these kind of what my planning friends would call generative conversations and to bring you or showcase for you programs that work that could be scaled. Because again, you can't policy this to death. You have to, I think, engender a conversation that will lead to the conversation about funding that will lead to perhaps rather dramatic requests in the 2025 legislative session where this year I think you were wisely more um, modest in just trying to get back uh, from the pandemic. So I think that this gives the staff some um, kind of like a punch list of things that we can work with the presidents to bring you. And then it allows me to help, uh, as I hopefully orient your um, new chancellor to, to, again, hold that time. So I just wanted to close, um, of course, with a story because it's me. Um, this week, I oddly had an opportunity to attend two events um, here in uh, one virtual and one here in Las Vegas that were about K-12 rethinking itself. Um, Regent Cruz Crawford was at one of those events um, with me. And, you know, I came from the K-12 space most recently, um, both as your superintendent and as the president of CIS, but I was struck by the way in which K-12, some in K-12, have are trying to use the pandemic as a means to rethink and do different because returning to the status quo is not cool for them. They want something different. And I was also struck that I was, we were in one instance, and I was in another, one of only two or three higher education folks in this conversation. I do believe in blurring that line between grades 12 and grade 13, if you will. Um, I don't like that we segregate those systems based on old models and funding formulas. And so I was encouraged that folks are rethinking K-12. It gave me a little bit of hope as someone who has six grandchildren, um, in that, some in the system, some on their way there. 
But it also made me think about us and in the higher ed system, are we rethinking or are we just the, the, the little story from my youth of the boy in Holland with his finger in the dike, we're just trying to hold things the way they are. I can't answer that question. I find us often protectionist, um, just keep it the way we are and not change it. I also know it's a very complex organization. Um, but it, I, off, I ask you to think about that. In one of these conversations, I heard a quote um, that really stuck with me. And I didn't catch the author's name as the person um, quoting this person uh, read out the quote. But then I went and Googled the quote and I found the person's name. And it makes me laugh because this writer, um, Robin Kelly, is a far more, I will say, radical revolutionary thinker about race relations than even I. And I'm pretty far out there on some of that stuff because of what I've seen with my um, students over the last 15 years. So it kind of makes me laugh that this old bureaucrat um, was like totally gravitating to this quote from someone who I think styles um, themselves as a revolutionary. But there's the quote. Without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. And you know I get irritated and you know I get sassy and that's because I feel like there's a lot of knocking down and not a lot of vision. And so I would give you that quote again. Without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. And so I'll end where I started. If you knock down the fence, all the cows leave. And they take with it, with them, not only your livelihood, but your purpose. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Do you know what? We, uh, I spoke too soon. I thought we had wrapped up questions. We have not. Um, we've got... Uh, You're ruining my end yeah, with a flourish. It was, it was a beautiful Chair. ending, too. It was that, a that rhetorical was, flourish. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> it, it really was. I, it couldn't have been done by anybody except you in the way that you ended that. It was great. Um, uh, Regent uh, Boylan has a question, and then Regent Del Carlo. Please let it be about cows. <laughs> right, right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> it's not really a question... Uh, it's more of a suggestion. When I was on the State Board of Education, we were talking about bringing higher ed and K-12 through together. We used to have a meeting with the Board of Regents, the December meeting, yep. and we, that was a way of reaching out to us in K-12, through and I think we could start doing that again. I'm not sure who stopped this process, I think it was a great process. It showed that we are working together and we had a one, it was usually, the, like I said, the December meeting. So just something to think about. And, uh, you know, I don't have any questions because you covered them all. But thank you for everything you've said today. Thank you. And for the record, Dale Urquiaga, so um, Regent Arascata is your representative to the board and both he and uh, the former chair of the board talked with me about that joint meeting. Superintendent and Ebert and I had every intention of reconstituting that. And so with my many other list of things I have failed at in this job, you can add that. So it's my fault because you didn't get that meeting done in December. But I do think that's wise. I, it was still done when I was um, the state chief, even after you were off the board. And I know superintendent supports it. And so um, Carrie's got it on her work plan um, for the coming year. I, I do think it's wise. Thank you. So we'll, we'll, we have another question from, we'll go Regent Del Carlo, then Regent Downs, and then after that question, we'll go right into the next agenda item with um, uh, President Zaragoza. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Mine's not a question. It's just that I think this is probably one of the healthiest conversations we've had as a board, and I hate to see this end because there's so much more we could talk about, and I would hope that, you know, I'm I, know, I don't know if you'd still be here, but we almost could do a workshop out of all this because we really didn't get to some things. And I, I look on page, oh, slide, this is slide 19 from WISHI and for consideration. I mean, their first bullet point, mission differentiation, the mix, location, size, et cetera, of institutions within a state system are policy choices. That's the crux of what this board does, policy choices and budgets. And we didn't even get into any differentiation today because I have talked to you about that. And the thing I think we really need to talk about is the dual enrollment, how we're going to go forward with it, even though um, I, I don't know if an R1 university belongs in a um, um, dual enrollment space. I don't know if there's other 
R1 universities that are out there doing it. And I understand why it's been done and they've done a wonderful job there. And um, Chair Brooks talked around it all without saying anything, but I really think we need, we need that conversation and we need it sooner rather than later. So that's, I, I, I will hold that for our agenda conversations. I thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Regent Downs, for the record, I want to thank you for your um, you uh, giving us a uh, very you need to be sad. Um, vivid image at your 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 end of your speech there, and it would have been good to end there. But I, I do feel the need to uh, since we're we're speaking, I wanted to speak. I thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, I would like to see uh, retention be explored more and more, and that's one of my areas of study. Is and I want to back up what. Um, Regent Brown had brought up, but retention efforts do make a difference. And that's sometimes when the population isn't there, you got to keep what you have, <laughs> find ways to do that better. And I, I am curious what the schools are doing. Uh, I, I know some that some schools are doing. It'd be, it's really interesting to see what the other schools are doing just to, to help that po student population to stay in school, to be successful. And um, you know, that's that's one of my big question marks. Um, so again, sharing across the uh, the institutions across the system, I think that could be really beneficial. And this topic, we we had an hour for it, and I don't blame anyone for this. We had an hour; we could probably spend a week on it, and we, no one has the time for that. But it's it's great that we have a board who is this interested in this topic and and how this goes forward. So I applaud everyone and their their dedication to this. Thank you. Thank you. I would, for the record, Dale or Kaya, I would echo that. Um, thank you for your time, and it's on me and whoever takes this job to sort of help you hold that space um, to keep you up here looking at the things you um, all have uh, opinions and desires about. So, appreciate it. Thank you for the presentation. We have uh, one more question or statement, Regent Boylan. Oh, okay. So, Apparently. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mr. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I see, or oh, has he gone now? I saw Dr. Khan sitting here, and uh, maybe it's, uh, the lawyers can tell me if I can ask for this, but I'd like to have a moment of silence for our young student that graduated lately and was murdered, killed, passed away. So I was hoping Dr. Khan would tell us more. Is there anyone else from the medical school here that could tell us more about the young lady doc, uh, that she became a doctor then? Yes, sir. Uh, of course, then, of course, uh, Dr. Whitfield, please go ahead. I was going to say, Dr. Khan will be back, actually. Um, there is uh, an item that he's going to address, which is about the hiring, and perhaps we can revisit it at that time and he can provide you additional information. Thank you, President Whitfield. Uh, that's even better. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. If I, if I may, Deputy Attorney General Becker, for the record, um, that might be actually best served in public comments so that you can come up and it's independent from any agenda item. Thank you. We appreciate the council and the guidance. Uh, President Zaragoza. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chancellor Arqueaga, regents, colleagues and guests. For the record, Federico Zaragoza, President of the College of Southern Nevada. And, and this morning, uh, I'm pleased to provide a uh, update on the CSN multi-campus uh, kind of migration journey. And, and I want to emphasize journey because I think that gives us a context for the rest of the information. Uh, there was also a report in your board materials, I think, that captures uh, and then relates a lot to the earlier conversations you were having. You know, I, I thought that that really served uh, well in terms of framing where the College of Southern Nevada is, but more importantly, where the college that never came from. And I want to just very quickly remind the board uh, of, the, um, of the reasons why uh, CN began this journey towards uh, uh, a multi-campus structure. And I want to emphasize that I wasn't even hired at the time <laughs> that this journey started. Uh, but I want to do emphasize that uh, the journey began in part because of conversations 
similar to the ones you were having before. Uh, questions about whether the campus was structured to meet the growing needs of students, uh, the growth, uh, kind of uh, ra the, the rapid growth of the time. Uh, and if you remember back in uh, the period that, that, that we're looking at 2016, CSN was actually on, on a tear in terms of growth. And that's true for a lot of our community colleges uh, throughout Nevada. Uh, but some of your earlier conversations touched on some of these points. Uh, but the question was, how effective was CSN in terms of responding to those students uh, in three different campuses and in three different communities? Uh, and obviously, uh, if you saw the, the report, uh, it made it very clear that there were concerns by the community about whether CSN was responding to community economic development needs, uh, whether com CSN was responding to workforce needs. Uh, and I would also kind of uh, extend the observation that the conversation was also about uh, how well are we connected to the public school system. And again, you, you know that we're looking at three very distinct communities with very distinct uh, personalities and data and, and, and clearly north of Vegas uh, a, a, as a municipality, uh, the uh, Vegas proper and Henderson, each, if you would look at it, would have its own uh, profile of labor market, of, of, of demographic and on trends. And so uh, all of that kind of was the backdrop, I think, for what uh, then was the charge, if you will, uh, on a study committee to one, and I think this is really important, to standardize the student experience. Uh, and what that really means is that students back then had to jump between campuses uh, to complete the program of studies. And 50% of students actually had to go between campuses. And for those of you that have taken that drive from Henderson uh, to Charleston or Henderson to North of Vegas campus, uh, that's not an easy uh, kind of migration. And many of them were taking public transportation. So all of this is well documented in, in why uh, we moved toward this multi-campus migration. Uh, the other element, and again, it's part of our, of our legacy, is that the Charleston campus was the campus where everybody was located. Uh, and so if you were up in Henderson or up in North of Vegas, as a student, you weren't having the same experience as those students at the Charleston campus. So that's the, the, the genesis for this. I also want to emphasize that, uh, and I think this is very important, you've heard about scope and complexity. And I want you to, to, to kind of remember that uh, at the time that this conversation was being held, CSN was one of the largest community colleges in the country. I think we were, I think, fourth uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, student enrollment. Uh, and since then, we've experienced declining enrollment. But I just want you to think about, uh, about something. And that is that even at 30,000 students, CSN is three times as large as TMCC. So it would be three TMCCs that, would, that, that we're kind of looking at, or 10 times WNC and some of their community colleges. That speaks to the complexity, if you will, uh, of, of the journey that we've taken, but it also speaks to who our peers are. And in every one of those peers that you see listed, they're either in a, a multi-campus structure or they're in a district structure. And so th this is kind of the impetus uh, for why we've, we've kind of moved in the, the migration uh, with obviously the goal of creating that common student experience, but also being responsive to those communities uh, that we serve and, and I would say diverse communities that we serve. This slide uh, talks about not only the journey, but it talks about how CSN has capped the, the Board of Regents uh, involved and engaged and informed on the journey. Uh, and, and you see that in 2016, uh, basically the, the feasibility study that, that's in your packet uh, kind of was in fact uh, approved. And then you got a report in December and this bo the board at that time authorized uh, that CSN began that migration uh, towards creating kind of this uh, uh, integrated model of uh, common student experience, and then more attachments to, to, to our respective communities, especially as it relates to aligning to the, to the economic development, to the workforce and public education needs uh, of each of those respective campuses and the communities that they serve. Uh, the journey that CSN has been on uh, has been one that um, uh, has can bro been broken down into an incremental process 
uh, and it's reflected as phases. And we've been reporting on phase one, and I want to emphasize that uh, most of what you're going to be hearing today speaks to phase one, and it speaks to uh, uh, the recommendations that are made, and then obviously the, 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 the challenges that we might have moving forward. And you heard some of the, the conversation earlier today. Uh, th this is a complicated journey, uh, and it's also one uh, that, uh, as has been articulated throughout the kind of the document, is not going to be an easy journey. Uh, but, but I would argue that it's really a conversation, a journey that we need to continue to have, and we're going to be focusing on the crucial, crucial factors of student success. So here are kind of the, the, the six areas that uh, uh, the, the migration is intended to address, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how, kind of where we are in some of these areas. But, but the, the first area is about building those uh, communication links uh, to both the communities uh, that we serve, our stakeholders, uh, and, and we talked about three very distinct, the distinct municipalities. And then secondly, uh, obviously to provide the resources that are needed uh, to support a multi-campus structure. Uh, so implied in all of this is that obviously resources uh, would be needed uh, uh, to begin the journey. Uh, and so that was one of the, the asks that was made early on when this board approved it, that there would be some resources allocated. So earlier today, you heard the $1.2 million. Uh, those $1.2 million were, in fact, appropriated to the state legislature under capacity. Uh, and so I, I wanted to kind of emphasize that, that that was part of the, the first step in this journey. Uh, but the more important step really was uh, uh, the, the whole process of creating that common student experience. And that uh, focused on, uh, again, migrating advising, uh, counseling and retention, student life and enrollment services to the campuses. So that is that irrespective of what campus you are, as of today, you have access to these services in your campus. Uh, and the vast majority of students now can complete the program of studies without having to take public transportation or other transportation to other campuses. That was implicit uh, in the charge uh, to, to the CSN and to this committee. Uh, obviously, um, uh, we've also worked and, and very diligently overcome some of the space uh, uh, constraints that we had at Henderson uh, with the student union being built. Uh, that uh, again, how is it common in spirit, experience? And then our Henderson campus, which provided STEM facilities uh, that complement the Henderson scenario. So we're making progress in some of these critical areas that were embedded in the initial uh, charge. Uh, I also want to kind of emphasize that the uh, uh, job descriptions uh, of individuals, because again, campus administrator in itself is not a job description. Part of it was that, with the, that, that we uh, develop kind of the prototype for what the campus administrator position would be like. And that has been done, and it was classified as a campus vice president. Uh, and that captured and not, not, not only the, the quality of the individual, but the responsibilities to establish those relationships with those stakeholders, uh, again, including the public schools, the municipalities, the community organizations, and all that is associated with a community college. Uh, and then the kind of the last component, which I want to just talk about very quickly, that is that in the original proposal, they had uh, suggested a center of excellence migration, which we had seen, by the way, in other parts of the country. Uh, but, but in the proposal that was developed, that would have, in fact, decentralized the academic component. So that would have moved uh, academic programs under the campuses. That part of it migrated into what I think is a more effective strategy, which is the complete college America. Uh, and that allows students from any one of our campuses to connect to any of those pathways, as opposed to just uh, uh, ex a center of excellence concepts that it would have been kind of narrow in terms of whatever programs you're bringing, able to bring to the campus. So uh, the complete college America and the career pathway has given us really a, 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 an effective uh, way of continuing the, the, the services to our students uh, and doing it in such a way, I think, that, that, that gives us that, that pathway forward uh, that makes it easier, if you will, to begin uh, and to bring that college experience and, uh, uh, to the students faster, which is what we were able to do. Uh, the phase two uh, recommendations uh, truly move us towards more of the implementation. And I want to just emphasize that uh, uh, we hired our vice presidents. Uh, I believe this was in 2018. So that was a very important part of, of our move forward because that provided the leadership, if you will, 
of to be able to uh, uh, begin to articulate and develop kind of those action plans and really to, to do the work, if you will, of connecting to our communities and the work of, uh, 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 of developing the protocols, the processes, so that students would have that, that common experience. So there's a lot of work that's been done in that space that obviously is behind the scenes, but we couldn't be able to offer what we offer today if we didn't have kind of this migration and those campus vice presidents are essential uh, to the model, the way that it stands now. Uh, and, and again, in each one of these areas, you're, you'll see that the term ongoing and completed is used because I want to emphasize this is an evolving model uh, and uh, it has to be evolving uh, because there are constraints here uh, that are very important in terms of the funding formula. Uh, I, I guarantee you that we could not afford a district model that would call for a chancellor, would call for four presidents, and would call basically for uh, the ability to, to, to have consolidated and complete services in each one of the campuses. So uh, the, the next step on that is, you know, what can you do in a matrix organization? And that's what we've got. That's what we really have moved towards. It's more of a matrix model that allows us to uh, provide those, those, those common services, common experiences, build those relationships uh, without uh, having to rely on, on additional funds. Uh, uh, but clearly, uh, the other element here is we're not growing at the rate that, that um, probably was assumed early on. Uh, and so those are kind of the considerations. When you're not growing, you don't have the, obviously the resources. And that all goes back to some of the anxiety that you heard earlier today. It's very real. And I'll be the first to admit that it's very real. It's an anxiety because uh, obviously you have diminishing resources, uh, but you have a, a scenario here that uh, also calls for that decentralization of services into that common experience. So that's a dichotomy that we're working with as this moves forward. Very quickly, just want to emphasize, uh, uh, this is at, 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 at the um, kind of macro level, and you'll hear very specifically from the president in a few minutes, for the vice president in a few minutes. But our model basically migrated uh, the um, uh, components of advising, and you all know how important advising is to that common experience, uh, the counseling, the uh, dual enrollment. So all these conversations that you heard uh, earlier today, for CSN, that conversation has to be at the, at the program level. And it's got to be tied to the school attendance areas and whoever, whatever campus is there to articulate those services. So that is happening. Those conversations are happening uh, at the multi-campus and at the campus level. And I want to emphasize that, 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 that we've seen some great, uh, uh, some, well, I'll show you some slides, uh, some good progress in terms of what this is uh, yielding. Again, uh, We've also kind of landed the responsibility on the uh, uh, campus vice presidents to build those relationships with the municipalities and elected officials uh, to be able to ensure that what we do in terms of our programs are aligned to the labor market and that in terms of the uh, uh, program development phase that it's tied to the aspirations of the local communities and that we basically are engaged. Uh, last point I'm going to make is that all that you will see here it's been accomplished on a cost-neutral basis. The only positions that are funded outside of the um, a neutrality concept are the capacity-funded positions of the vice presidents. So all of this work, uh, and, and I want to commend, uh, has happened because of the um, uh, commitment that we have uh, to continue to provide student-first uh, agendas and student-first services and to be responsive, quote-unquote, to the community college mission. <clears throat> so just want to give you a very high level. So this is what the students are saying. Since uh, we started kind of this migration, the student satisfaction levels uh, continue to increase at each one of the campuses. And to me, this is really, really, really important. Because if you recall, you know, I, uh, the student first mantra to me it has to translate to students uh, uh, getting what they need to be able to success, succeed. We, we have this data by campus. And, and, and so obviously, uh, you know, you can ask the, the uh, campus vice presidents because they'll be uh, up here in a few seconds uh, uh, if you have any questions on any one of these slides. But every one of our campuses show an increase in student satisfaction from before we started the migration to now. And in some cases, very substantial. The, the long game in terms of student success, 
we were looking at 7% completion rate in 2016. 7%. That was one of the lowest in the country. Now you're looking at 19% completion rates in that window of time. And then the, the six-year graduation rate for students, because 72% of our students are part-time, is 28%. So I, I, I bring this to your attention because that's what the data is telling us. We're seeing some promising results. Then we were talking about the enrollment uh, scenario, and we obviously were hit very, very hard by, by COVID, as you heard earlier today. And, and that obviously raises the anxiety, both in terms of the enrollments, the questions you were asking earlier, but also the consequences in terms of funding. But if you look at the trends under our current structure, we're positioned to grow again. Uh, and obviously some of the questions that you all were talking about in terms of workforce development, we're a community college. Uh, and I expect our campuses to, to, to be championing kind of these agendas in the local communities. You know, I expect us to be innovators in that space, et cetera. But that's part of the journey. That's not where we were at a few years ago. So there's a lot of progress that, that's been made. And this indicator just kind of show that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, so at this point, I want to ask, uh, uh, we've got three of, uh, of our vice uh, presidents who are going to very quickly uh, talk a little bit about the work that they're doing. And I'm going to start with Marissa Coda, uh, and she's our vice president at the North Las Vegas campus. Thank you. So good morning, Chair Brooks, Board of Regents, and she members, presidents. My name is Clarissa Coda, vice president of the North Las Vegas campus. And it's, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you an update on our CSN multi-campus model. So since 2019, it has been my honor to oversee the North Las Vegas campus and respective region, which extends to the Mesquite, Moapa Valley region, Nellis Air Force Base, and the East Las Vegas Valley. This campus had been my first home at CSN 25 years ago. I was invited as a new attorney to the Las Vegas Valley to teach as an adjunct instructor. At the North Las Vegas campus, I saw a vibrant, dedicated campus community and culture, all in the name of service to students. This environment convinced me that I had uh, found my calling and decided to join the CSN community. Therefore, returning to the North Las Vegas uh, campus has been truly my, my honor. Our campus serves some of the most underserved communities in the Valley and is the most diverse of all three campuses. Our CSN mission of empowering communities and students to achieve, succeed, and prosper has never been so critical to a region as it is in the north and east side of our valley in Las Vegas. Our faculty and staff who work at the North Las Vegas campus all understand and embrace this mission every single day, and together we work to serve the students and our community. As CSN has grown over the last 50 years to being one of the largest community colleges in the country, the multi-campus model has been able to provide the framework to ensure that all of our campuses are providing an improved student experience and that we foster a strong community connection serving the unique needs of each of our service regions. The organizational structure of the multi-campus uh, provides for executive oversight and campus-based teams dedicated to ensure that all students receive a consistent student experience at each of our campuses and that we are uniquely connected to the community which we serve. This includes the municipalities, nonprofits, chambers of commerce, state, local, and federal districts, K through 12 systems in our region. When I first started in 2019, there were gaps in our student services at North Las Vegas. We had areas of the campus which needed repair and renovation. In the next couple slides, I will point to examples on how we are improving the campus and the student experience. The organizational structure at the North Las Vegas campus, which you see here, is similar to the other campuses, where we have executive oversight and campus teams reporting to the campus vice president. The organizational structure also relies on a matrix reporting structure so that the model remains cost neutral. A matrix organization is a structure where teams report to multiple leaders. The matrix design keeps open communication between organizational units and helps to break down those silos for innovation and problem solving. The organizational design within the multi-campus model keeps the student experience as the number one priority. So if you take a look on uh, the chart there, you will see that the North Las Vegas, we have two academic deans who are part of our academic structure, as do the other campuses. 
The academic deans remain within the centralized academic affairs division reporting directly to the vice president of academic affairs, but they also have a dotted line or a matrix structure to the campus vice president and therefore assist to bridge and connect the campus to the academic affairs division. Collectively, we work on issues such as enhancing the academic scheduling for the campus to have completable schedules and degrees for our students by increasing, for example, the number of course sections. We will also work on expanding and renovating campus facilities to improve the delivery of our academic programs, such as at North Las Vegas, we completed the, completed the expansion of the culinary labs and are looking at expanding our advanced manufacturing labs. In addition, we also have the associate vice presidents at each of our campuses, and they also help to oversee the student experience. They serve as the student conduct officers, therefore providing students a direct point of contact at each campus. The campus AVPs are in constant communication with our centralized student affairs divisions as needed to resolve problem real time for students at the campus. Campus life is also part of the campus structure, and we oversee the campus life coordinators. Our campus life coordinators are responsible for overseeing our unions, our student basic needs services, such as our coyote closets and coyote pantries. They also develop and execute campus events to help promote student engagement and enhance our campus cultures so that our students feel at home and want to be there. At North Las Vegas, we have a few signature events. Some of you have been able to be there and we love to have you anytime. And so we've had the Latinx Heritage Month kickoff at the beginning of the year, the Harlem Night Celebration during Black History Month, and we are just about to celebrate our annual Campus Appreciation Barbecue. We actually celebrate almost 700 different events and activities um, this past year. In addition, it was mentioned that we have a very important advising unit. And so uh, the campus AVPs oversee the campus team of advisors and the number of advisors at each campus are in alignment with the campus size. So for North Las Vegas, we have 11 academic advisors, one senior advisor and one manager. The advising teams transferred over in January of 22. At that time, we had significant uh, turnover in our staff and so we, tirelessly work to recruit and fill these vacancies so that they would not be a break in student service. So I'm proud to report that we are now fully staffed and this is evident in the increase in student advising numbers in comparison to last year. Just last month in March of 2023, our North Las Vegas campus team advised 1,200 students, which was a 49% increase from the March before. The campus-based advising teams work very closely with the centralized student affairs division so that we maintain consistency among the campuses. Finally, our early college teams. The multi-campus structure supports CSN's goal to increase dual enrollment and provide every high school student with the opportunity to not only be college ready, but college proven, as Dr. Saragosa likes to say. Each campus serves high schools within their service region, and for North Las Vegas, we have close to 40 high schools we work with. Our early college manager, works directly with the service area school so that we're better connected. This approach has, po has yielded positive resorts, results and additional revenue for the college. So prior to 2019, the North Las Vegas campus service area high schools had a historically low engagement in our early college programming, including Jumpstart and dual enrollment. Many of these schools are Title I low-income schools. Since we moved to the multi-campus model structure, we have much more of a customized attention to the schools. The North Las Vegas Campus Service Region has seen a 110% increase in our dual enrollment um, numbers from 517 students in 2019 to 1,089 in 2022. This engagement comes from 16 CCSD schools, five charter schools, and two private schools. We are signing on six additional charter schools this year. We are pleased to report that we are working hard to deliver equitable early college programming by having dedicated campus-based early college managers. We also work with the centralized team to maintain that, our, that the MOUs and the curriculum remain consistent among the regions. In final closing, I would like to also make note that all of our campuses have different learning sites assigned to each of our campuses. So for North Las Vegas, we also oversee, I oversee the rural regions of Mesquite and Moapa Valley, 
Over the last three years, we've expanded our early college programming to those CCSD high schools that are there, Moapa Valley, Virgin Valley. We've also increased the number of CTE programs aligning to the local economy, for example, in EMT, CNA, phlebotomy, and currently working on medical assisting. We also serve the Nellis Air Force Base and offer classes on base and provide college services to their families as well. So as far as the, uh, also we oversee some college-wide divisions. And so for the North Las Vegas campus, I also oversee the Title V programs and also the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Development programs. And the final piece to, to our, our model is working intentionally with our community partners. And so we are, we, for example, one example is regularly meeting with the city of North Las Vegas and fostering mutual support. We are in direct alignment with their new medical district by working on expanding our nursing programs at the North Las Vegas campus and have received the support of Congressman Horsford's office for the funds to build a new state-of-the-art new nursing skills lab. So community engagement includes all the chambers, um, and most recent example was a partnership with the Urban Chamber and My Brother's Keeper for the CSN Harlem Knights sponsorship. In conclusion, the, the next, I'd like to invite you to our next community event next Friday when we will be hosting the Latin Chamber of Commerce Luncheon featuring our CTE dual enrollment programs. At this point, I would like to hand it over to my colleague. Yes. Thank you very much. So hopefully that gave you a, a kind of an idea of the day-to-day, -day how the, the model actually works and the day-to-day -day, day operations uh, of our uh, campus VPs and, and the campus uh, uh, operations. But I want to also emphasize that what you saw has been replicated at each one of the campuses. And, and we have uh, our other campus VPs, Dr. Sonia uh, 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 Pearson is here, as well as Dr. Uh, uh, Rebecca Gates, uh, if there's any, any questions uh, to any one of the other campuses. So I want to just summarize now what, what, what you have heard. Uh, and that is obviously that uh, the data suggests uh, that we're definitely moving in the right direction. Uh, but I want to emphasize that we're still in our infancy in terms of the multi-campus migration experience. Uh, uh, but a lot of good things uh, have happened since this project began. Uh, and, and I think that's reflected in some of the accommodations we got from the, our accrediting body, which included uh, commending us for the student experience, uh, the student first work that we're doing there. And secondly, our community partnerships. Uh, uh, and again, that, that is what I would call a third party, very, very, very high level evaluation uh, of some of our mission uh, focus work that's so important to the multi-campus uh, uh, intent and originally. Uh, then I want to also very quickly uh, just touch base on, on a couple of the other areas that I think hopefully you're beginning to, uh, to see or, or are taking hold. One, that this is more of a matrix uh, a structure than it is a decentralized model at this point. So we're going to continue kind of the ongoing work uh, moving forward. Uh, it's important that we emphasize that this is an evolving model. Uh, and that this model basically is going to land uh, where we uh, where we first started, and I think that that, that um, uh, when you first started, the, there were the elements uh, that were of great concern at the time. So th those issues of enrollment are important to us. We need to find out how and where we're going to land in terms of recovering uh, our. Uh, uh, students and, and what the size uh, element is going to be, uh, what are we going to norm to in terms of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a structure. Uh, secondly, we have to be very realistic about the funding that's being generated by the current structure. So some of the anxiety that you heard from some of the earlier comments is very real. Uh, like all of the other NG institutions, uh, that $9 million includes the assumption uh, that we would have to fund the COLA component. So we're already looking at some of these uh, uh, issues and, and we have to kind of incorporate them into our internal processes uh, overall. I do want to give you kind of a, just a, a sampling of what we've seen in terms of the early college, which is one of those responsibilities attributed to, to each one of the campuses. We've seen uh, the number of students graduating uh, with an associate's degree go from 60 uh, to 100 uh, in, in the same period. And we've seen uh, that 70% of those students earned an associate's degree. So the early college model is, is definitely growing. And it is one of those drivers that drives the conversation uh, for each one of our vice presidents. Uh, and again, in, in the early college space, uh, we're looking at retention rates at that 70% level. 
And again, our goal would be to grow back to pre-COVID levels. We're about 20 uh, uh, students uh, short in that specific range. Uh, this is just an idea to, to kind of show you that while well, you've heard the $1.5 million uh, kind of gap there that we have with capacity funding, uh, I hope you can see that the campus VP is bringing a lot more than $1.2 million. Uh, to the left, you see uh, uh, almost $7.5 million of resources that have either been received uh, and that are under the oversight of the campus presidents. So without their efforts, it's very difficult uh, to see how we would have been as successful in generating that kind of funding. And more importantly, we, we have close to uh, 48 million dollars in pending applications. So a lot of work is happening and a lot of that work is happening at the campus level. Uh, the community acknowledges that and I think it's been affirmed uh, by their support of the model. Mr. Chairman, that constitutes our presentation. Thank you very much. We have some follow-up questions yes, for you. Regent Perkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I was looking at the model organization for the North Las Vegas campus. It seems like there's no advisors on that campus but I thought in the multi-campus model, each campus was supposed to have like all the services at that particular campus. Is it, so is that a, how does that work? Yeah, we're going to have yeah, our campus VPs jump in. Thank you for the question, uh, Regent uh, Perkins and Chair Brooks. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm going to be quick. Um, so for each of the campuses, we do have uh, spread out across each of the campuses and regions academic advisors. Our ratio right now, I believe when you all uh, supported this model or the former region supported this model, this model actually was looking to arrive at 350 to 1. Today, I can say we're not years away from that. We're close, very close. We're three, 392 to 1. At the uh, North Las Vegas campus, at campus right now, uh, due to more stability and staffing, actually they're uh, leading the way in terms of having more advisors. At my campus overall total, actually, for the advisors, let me give you that number. Let me interrupt. Sure. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, it's just on the, the model sure. of the organization that you presented to us. Yes. Under the North Las Vegas campus, there Correct. are no advisors listed. Yes. Which is quite confusing considering Absolutely. that. So why Absolutely. isn't it listed on there if that's what you're doing? Absolutely. And I think that's an excellent, Sonia Pearson for the record again. So I think that's an excellent observation and it's things that we need to brush up on the charts. If you look at the subsequent organizational charts, you'll note that the advisors are listed at the North Las Vegas campus, although you don't see it on the chart that you did receive. There are advisors there and we will update and amend that chart. Um, thank you for that. Um, yes. I have lots of questions if you don't mind, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and ask another one, and then we'll let other regents chime in as well. Thank you. Um, what grants? You said you you mentioned that you got grants, and um, let's see, with you got grants using the multi-campus model. What grants were those, and could they have been uh, received just because we do have you know three different campuses, or actually we have more than three different campuses, but CSN you know uh, takes up such a wide swath of Clark County. So thank you very much again, uh, Regent Perkins, Sonia Pearson for the record. So with the grants that we write, we don't write the grants with the lens that it's only going to apply to one campus. We're very intentional about making sure that it spreads across all of our regions so all students can benefit. So as you look at the table, you'll know, for instance, the submitted grants. Um, with that particular column, uh, you'll note that we also had a HRSA grant and it says $46 million. Actually, we had close to 93 million. Part of that grant was really trying to support an early childhood education center at Henderson campus. It fell through. We're still trying to move forward to make sure that we're leveraging those grant funds to offset administrative costs, student needs, and so on. So are you saying that these grants would not have been possible under the, without the multi-campus model? You want to? Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so a couple of things uh, that I want to emphasize there. All of these grants and most of these grants require engagement with your municipalities. Uh, and so the, the campus VP structure just makes it easier for us to be connected to the, 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 the individual uh, uh, municipalities uh, funding cycle. So for example, when you look at kind of the ARPA structure, the, the county and the cities were very, very, very much part of driving that. And our campus VPs were engaged. 
but we were engaged in three different communities. So that, you know, we, there's a CSN component uh, when you look at, at the Henderson plan. There's a CSN component when you look at the Las Vegas plan and, and when you look at North Las Vegas as well. And that is attributed to the work that is happening by the campus VPs. So I, I would say that it's part of the model. The College of Southern Nevada basically uh, uh, is more successful because we have that connectivity and we're proactively involved. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Sandy Grant, the same thing. Somebody talked about, uh, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, was, was it you, uh, Regent? And Regent Brown talked about the Sandy Grant. So again, the, the Sandy Grant talked about uh, uh, the, 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 um, the opportunity for us to be part of a statewide system. And we basically used uh, the health pathway to be able to create programs uh, at the Charleston campus that would allow us to access some of the Sandy funds. In that particular case, the lead was from the, 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 the West Charleston campus, in part because that's where the majority of the programs are. So th there's a different kind of response to, to these, but the basic premise is that, yes, the multi-campus model helps us be more effective as community resources are developed and for us to align, and the heavy lifting is being done by the campus VPs. And that's to follow up on what he just I was just going to ask if you have follow-up questions. Thank Regent you so Perkins, much, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your dive into that. Yeah, no, I have please lots do. of questions. Um, I'm just trying to like get the whole entire picture. Right. And, and try, I'm trying to see the whole the uh, corral as opposed to just seeing the section of my fence. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to see the cows, so we're in the same place. <laughs> I'm trying to see that. Um, why were, okay, with the multi-campus model, you chose vice provost. So couldn't that help? Could that have possibly been um, campus directors, and that's wouldn't that be able to accomplish the same things under the multi-campus model without um, the salaries that are attached to the VP? Yeah, and, and I want to emphasize it's not a vice provost. The provost model was the one that had kind of the centers of excellence involved and would have migrated academic programs into that. So these are just campus vice president administrators, uh, and their focus primarily is in building those relationships uh, as we've taught, as we've kind of structured it. The model that we're looking at basically is a campus VP. Uh, model that really provides uh, leadership and, and connectivity both to internal and external communities uh, uh, at the level of the institution. So the vice president is part of the executive team. It would be very difficult to, to have a relationship with a, a, a mayor or a city official if it wasn't at that kind of level of responsibility. More importantly, they can make campus-based decisions appropriate within the components under their umbrella. The HR kind of assessment, which is very objective, classify kind of that level of responsibility at the vice president's level. If the responsibilities had been reduced and expectations were reduced, it probably could have been a different classification. And I can tell you that there are other parts of the country that have, you know, they have campus deans, they have campus vice presidents, et cetera. But it all aligns to the responsibilities and the expectations that one has of those particular campus uh, kind of models and, and campus uh, uh, leadership positions. Thank you. I think my point, my train of thought is going that since the enrollment has plummeted, I mean, it's at, at the uh, community college level, is this still practical? Is this still feasible with the current funding levels? Yeah, and, and I think one of the, um, I mean, that's that, that's one of the issues uh, that, uh, was brought up earlier today. And I can tell you that, that sustainability uh, is an issue, but it's, 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 it's across the institution. And there's a lot of kind of elements here. It's not just the campus VPs. Uh, and, and sometimes, uh, and we're going through what we call a budget alignment process for in, in, internally institutional stakeholders. That includes faculty senate, that includes our classified council, administrative council, is addressing kind of those, those very issues uh, because, in fact, uh, there's a domino effect. I've shown the slide, you know, campus VPs bring in resources as well. Uh, so it's not that just they're taxing the, the 1.5 million. And we are also kind of in a scenario where we have the HERF funding. Uh, and what this also would call for is in 2025, I think that's going to be a much better time to do an evaluation of this model. Uh, and we have that plan in part because this is a, in its infancy. This is uh, basically three years into implementation because of, uh, of the COVID period. So uh, there are promising results. 
Uh, this structure obviously needs to be validated. It will be validated. I can tell you just, uh, you know, by experience alone that the, you know, that the sustainability component uh, is tied to enrollment growth, obviously, but it's also tied to how you grow. I'll give you an example. We have a lot of programs that are forced, but that's kind of uh, programs that are basically uh, under funding formula calls for uh, uh, four to one kind of ratios. If we grow those programs, and that's in the CTE space, that would generate significantly more resources, even if enrollment doesn't grow for CSN. To do that, we have to partner with CCSD and our communities because the CTE component in dual enrollment is almost non-existent. So we have opportunities. That's the kind of work that you heard from our campus VPs. They're working basically to promote sustainable models. So enrollment is a very key variable, but it's not the only variable in terms of sustainability. And I think that that's what we're looking at holistically as part of our budget alignment process. Do you have any additional follow-up questions, Regent Perkins? <laughs> Why, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I do not. I am done. Okay. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, yes. thank you, President, for your presentation. Um, question: What um, what requirements do uh, advisors have to have to get the job? I'm going to defer again to our vice president. Okay, and I apologize if it's. In, I don't think it's in the executive summary. It's for some reason that's not opening on my. So we're going to showcase Rebecca Gates at our Henderson group. So. Thank you for the question, Rebecca Gates. For the record, interim associate vice president officer in charge of the Henderson campus. For an academic advisor, uh, typically not for a senior, but for an academic advisor, the qualification is typically a bachelor's degree. Okay. However, I can tell you that most of our advisors have master's degrees. Okay. As is, that's the precedent in the industry. Awesome. Okay. And then, because I feel like some of the advisors that I've worked with in the past could be, that could be just a skill, you know, they're trained, but definitely the background in higher ed um, mm -hmm. is important. Yep. So earlier, I heard, you have 1,200 students on the uh, North Las Vegas campus, I heard earlier, or how, Vice President? No, no, no. 7,500. 7,500, yes. Got it. Okay. I was like 1,200 students and 11 advisors. That's great. That's 110. <laughs> okay. Um, so... A couple of things. I know you guys have a great system in place where you have academic advising at the 15 credit, 30 credit, 45 credit level. What do you do for onboarding of new students? Because um, I didn't, I never saw anything about what you do for onboarding for advising. So new student enrolls, what is your system in place to contact that student or is it up to the student to contact the university? Thank you very much for that question, Regent. Sonia Pearson, for the record. So our onboarding process is very comprehensive. We work extensively with our central team mm -hmm. uh, who has a director of advising. What we actually do right now is comprehensively work with our IT department to instigate a lot of outreach campaigns to these students. Mm -hmm. We also have a team of individuals through our call center who are working also with the advisors mm -hmm. who are trying to make contact, but they go through prescribed steps when they actually come into the college. So they actually have the advising, the orientation. We have a fabulous first year experience team that also tries to walk and hold their hands through that process. And then we also have our assessment process. In addition to that, we're putting also these retention connected folks on the front line that we did not have before. So we're trying to use our resources very wisely to make sure that the students know that they have hands around them as they go through the process. One of the things that we saw, particularly like with our Nevada Promise students who were leaving high school coming in, is that they were falling through the cracks. So to your question, and it's a very good one, is that we have to be careful and recognize where the gaps are along the student life cycle. So we have strategically aligned our first step program to fill those gaps with students coming in. And we're making some good headway to make sure that they are not being dropped through the payment process. And when they are dropped, if they are, if they don't pay, we're quick to respond to that, try to get them connected to additional resources. So abundance of our work has actually been placed on the front end, trying to make sure that we can create that seamless experience. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's my question because it's mm -hmm. so important that advising piece yeah. and those first, uh, that first year. 
Um, my second um, question is, I know you guys have advising, and the reason why I'm concerned about advising is because I think it just, it, it's mentoring, right? And so um, with the advising, I know you guys do phone call and in person. Do you have, are you going to add virtual options for advising or do you have those? Yes, okay. we do. We oh, do okay, have perfect. Yes. I didn't know that. Okay, yes, yes, perfect. Yes. And are they uh, flexible hours for yes. non-traditional students? And we're also looking, uh, listening to our students. Mm -hmm. We assess the data regularly to decide when we need to extend our hours because we want to be responsive to the student needs. As you know, it's not uncommon for us to have a larger population of non-traditional students. Mm -hmm. So our hours need to be reflective of that population of students as well. As well. So we do make adjustments. Perfect. Do you guys have a 24-hour um, call center? We uh, we do have some call support services, and we have our CIO who's actually in here, and I'll let him speak more about that because I don't want to misstate that. Short answer is yes. Okay, okay. that's it. I just I wanted to educate myself because that's important. So that's all my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Regent Downs? Thank you, uh, Chair Brooks. I'm wearing my CSN shirt. Yay. Right? So. <laughs> and I know that the Chancellor has CSN socks. So. <laughs> and I, I just, I need to be honest. I've been trying for a while now uh, to understand. I've talked to faculty and, and different people at CSN trying to understand the multi-campus model. Um, I am curious, just, I don't want to get into a lot of minutiae and detail, but uh, I am, I'm just a couple things I'm curious about. Um, how do the, the VP level um, campus directors, if they're not academic, how are they able to grow programs at those campuses? If they're not the academic person, they still have to go to an academic VP to build up programs, don't they? Can't, or do oh, they have the authority yeah. to... To grow things. Yeah, the program development is centralized, uh, and that's through the Vice President of Academic Affairs. So all of the programs basically uh, uh, are developed through a single program development process. That hasn't changed. That's the original model. However, there is a matrix relationship, and the, the effort there is internally, the campus VPs provide input. Uh, for example, we're talking about advanced manufacturing, and, and I, I believe in the last uh, few years, we brought a couple of programs here in advanced manufacturing uh, that were actually uh, instigated by local demand in the Henderson area uh, because of the, 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 the uh, uh, emergence of Haas in advanced manufacturing as an employer in that area. Uh, but that information comes into the Vice President of Academic Affairs was responsible for all academic programs. And then that's how that matrix kind of relationship works, where basically you've got the, the local uh, kind of component that the campus community con connecting with the program development function, which is still centralized. So that hasn't changed. Okay. okay. Um, so that's, I guess, part of my question is why would it need to be VP level if they still have to go to another another department to get that, that developed. But um, but one other question is on the page that's on the screen right now that I'm, I'm looking at. And this is not a nitpicky thing. I'm just trying to understand. Earlier, the slide said 19% graduation rate and 28% graduation rate. And this says uh, the, the third from the bottom bullet says 60 available degrees to over 100 yeah. with 70% of students earning an associate's degree. Does that mean 70% are enrolled in a, in a degree? No, and, and that mean that so... We've had some kind of uh, slight, uh, we have a new uh, staff person working with us. And what that is, is that, can I look at the, the bullet before that? It says CSN early colleges. So all of the bullets below that are about the early colleges. So, and it should be 60 graduates to over 100 graduates with 70% of students earning associate's degrees. That's what that should say, very specific. The, the retention rate is specific to the early college model. And then obviously we went okay. back to the pre-COVID levels. So, and we apologize for that. We, 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 we had some uh, uh, challenges with uh, our, our PowerPoint development process. Oh, it's going to say 70% uh, graduation rate. You should be getting awards. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I, I agree. <laughs> okay, thank you. Regent Borland. 
Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Z, thank you for the great presentation. Always learn something new and all your people who put it together. I have a few questions and I know um, Mr. Sassy uh, Chancellor earlier said we shouldn't try <laughs> to break down things, we should build them. But I, I think of it as accountability, breaking something down is, you know, like all the uh, casinos that have changed on the strip, we would have still had the dunes and the stardust and all those old, old. So we break down things, build it new. I have a few questions. In my personal opinion, I think you're too top heavy. There are too many administrators in all of this. I see uh, campus VPs, then I see assistant to VPs. I don't know if you have assistant to assistant, assistant VPs <laughs> or what it is, but I see that in most of our institutions. And it's just not you. But I don't see this three campus, multi-campus thing it may be a good idea. But all this administration, I'm following up on what Regent uh, Perkins was asking, I think. Good questions. So how much does all of this cost? How many administrators do you have? How many faculty? I mean, this I'm going to ask later mm -hmm. as a, a Regent request. And uh, one other thing, how many, how many <coughs> vice presidents do you have? Do you, do you know? I, I'm kind of trying to count them. So, Regent Borland, I'm specifically in the multi-campus model, and I think I made the comment that all of the positions that we've got here are cost neutral. That means that when you see these uh, uh, kind of VPs and associate VPs, those AVPs were already in the structure. They were just reporting to the student affairs vice president, and that line would have been kind of the advising uh, AVP which now we've kind of deployed to the three campuses. So those three positions that, that, that you saw for AVPs were just reallocated. There was no additional cost for that. All of the advisors and, uh, and any of the kind of leadership positions that were there were reallocated from what we had in the centralized model. The only new positions that, that are in this model are the campus VPs. There's three of them, and they have a, an administrative assistant. That's that 1.2 million supplemental appropriation that we got to make this, this happen. Uh, early on uh, in, in my conversations uh, about kind of the, the, the multi-campus migration, uh, several kind of realities hit us. One is that there had been an assumption that there was going to be more funding, if you will, made available to, for, for CSN to make this migration. Uh, and obviously, uh, some of that would have uh, uh, relied on that 4% uh, student fee option. It was just put out there, sure. uh, but it was part of the model. But then we went to, to predictable pricing uh, so that that revenue source kind of closed on us. And that's why you saw the focus on cost neutrality. So that everything you saw here yeah, yeah. was reallocating from the existing resources that CSN had back in 2016. And, okay. And, I'm, okay. I, I, I hope I that explains you. that. I get you, but uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I do want to put you on the spot at sure. the same time. How many VPs do we have? Do we have three for each uh, campus? That's correct. There's three campus We've VPs. We've got nine VPs, and they have three VPs, assistant VPs to them, or how many do they No, have? The, what you it's saw is what they had. The, they have the campus AVP, and primarily... Uh, how you know, many are those? Yeah. Uh, do you know offhand? Because I see this as, and I don't mean to be rude, but ridiculous for the money that's being spent, and it's taxpayers' money that we are paying them. So the, the answer to the, to the question is for the campus VP structures, there's three VPs and then three AVPs. Yeah. Three AVPs for each campus? No, no, one for each campus, I'm sorry. One, okay, one AVP for each campus? Yeah. One VP for each campus? Yeah, it's the same, it's the same configuration on the administrative side. Okay, so we've got all these administrators, and uh, like I said, uh, cost-neutral basis, I know you keep talking about that. Just because it's cost-neutral, do we have to have someone in there? I mean, I remember the days when this was just a, a campus administrator, small campuses, then I understand totally. I used to teach there, and I'm, I understand Regent that. Boyan, I can tell you, yeah. I can tell you that 
we're probably understaffed uh, for a campus of our size. Sure, and sure. If, we, if we had the resources, we'd be talking about a district model. Uh, so actually, the, the multi-campus effort has been very efficient given the resources that we have. And when you think about, uh, we were talking about kind of the, uh, uh, the enrollment at, at, at North of Vegas. So our COVID level kind of enrollment level was worth 13,000 students uh, at the uh, Charleston campus, 9,000 uh, students at the North of Vegas count, uh, campus, and 5,000 at, at the Henderson campus. I want you to compare that to our peer institutions in terms of TMCC, WNC, sure. et cetera. So we want to go there. Uh, you know, I, I think I could make the case very, very strongly that this is a very lean and understaffed uh, kind of staffing. And that, again, uh, it is very efficient given the resources and given the magnitude of the population that we have and that we serve. And again, I would use my other peer institutions if you want to make comparisons. Uh, compare our Henderson staffing to any one of the other institutions, and you'll see that we're understaffed. Okay, I get you. I have one last question, Mr. Chair. So, but basically to confirm that we have three VPs and three assistant VPs all together. All together. All together. So we can call them VPs, so we have six of them. All right. No, 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 no. <laughs> three VPs yeah. and three assistant AVPs, a total of six total in the six. whole structure. Yeah, yeah. For each one of the campuses, we have one VP and one assistant one AVP. AVP. That's what I meant, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they're, kind of, they're still VP name. Kind of, okay. One last question, like I said, Mr. Chair. And since, I don't know if the young lady is still here, why are the faculty afraid of speaking up and why are they getting letters or notices from lawyers? Lawyers scare me anyway. I've got two years <laughs> both sides, you know, it makes me tremble in my boots and all that stuff. But what, what's this going on with the lawyers and the faculty? And this is part of all the structure. Regent and uh, if I could, um, that is a confidential matter uh, and it is related to a Title VI situation. Uh, and I'm not authorized to comment beyond that at this point. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Martinez, how, how does that work? How do we find out what's happening? Uh, Jimmy Martinez, for the record, uh, I just want to point a couple things out. One, I, I think this matter is is pretty far outside of this specific agenda item. Is it? Okay. Um, a lot of this matters are going to be subject to attorney-client privilege, so I think we these are conversations that that we could have in a either an attorney-client session or on one-on-one. -on -one um, briefings. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate that. I didn't want to put you. No, on no, the thank spot, you. Appreciate. It. But the young lady was here, and she mentioned something. So that always gets my pitbull feelings up. I'm like, why is this? Why is this happening? Okay, that was it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate your patience. Thanks, Doc. Again, Regent Carvalho, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, President Zaragoza, you you said some of what I was going to say. M my understanding. First, uh, I think it was commented that that this the members of the board today were not on the board at the time that this was first started. So, from context that I've heard, it sounds like this this multi campus um, evolution um, began because of the size of of uh, College of Southern Nevada. So, I I see from the the presentation and and um, previous communications that that this um, is the result of efficiencies of programming and um, economies of scale uh, with your resources, and I understand that. Um, and so I think that that's that's commendable that 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 work has been done because, like you said, you're you're doing more with less. So um, I appreciate that that further clarification on that. I do wonder um, is. Does this sometimes make it difficult for students to be able to get what they need at one campus? Um, if you have a, a student who um, is in one part of, of Southern Nevada, who um, maybe say lives closest to the North Las Vegas campus, but that the the program that they are interested in attending is in Henderson, um, we're still. Uh, there's still a need for that student to, to move between, among the three campuses or, or other campuses in addition to that. So I, I do wonder if sometimes our, uh, I, I hope, and I know that, right. that your staff is, is, looks at this, but I hope that at sometimes these efficiencies, um, 
it, I hope that they take uh, a look at what students have to do to, to get, um, you know, to reach their education goals. Regent Carvalho, and obviously, uh, I think it was mentioned that, you know, we listen to students, and so we've heard some of the of the issues, too. Uh, our programs are not offered in all campuses, but the pathways are at all campuses. And so you, you heard from the North of Vegas uh, uh, vice president that we're working and bringing health occupation opportunities into that campus uh, with the idea that when they get to the associate's level, they can transfer to, to Charleston, et cetera. So we're always looking at how we can make it a better experience for students, even though there might be programs interested in programs that are offered only in one of the campuses. So it's a work in progress for us. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo, for the record. And I was running for office in 2016 when they voted this in. So I was watching and I was paying attention. And at the time, for over 40,000 students, it's huge. And I, I remember when we hired you, and I thought, it was really a great idea to go to this model to try to rein it in and define it more. And it's like what, what you govern closest to governs best. So having the three different VPs I thought was so important to each campus. And then this board approved the three different student unions. It's exactly the same blueprint. They got exactly everything. Nobody got anything better than the other, so that kept it really great. And um, I personally feel it's, I mean, I'm not on your campus very much. I live up north, but from what I have been able to see, you've done very well with your resources and your model. And I didn't know until this discussion today that the it was your um, enhanced capacity. or what Capacity they call funding. Yeah, yeah capacity, capacity funds. funding yeah. funded the $1.2 million. So... And just to make sure we all understand what that means, when we get capacity funding, that gets added to your budget, and going forward, that's part of the money that the state gives you, correct? Uh, no, ma'am. The capacity funding okay, is a line item. let's make sure item. we get that right yeah. then. Yeah. So, uh, the, actually, the intent is for uh, you get the investment, and then your enrollment grows, and you're able to sustain it with okay. the income revenues. There is enhancement funding, uh, but the criteria for the enhancement is very different than capacity. Okay, I see our acting uh, chancellor shaking his head so good. I, I got that. So, I mean, in the in the scope of your budget, this has not been a uh, budget buster for you then? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, I, I I think it's looking pretty darn good, and, and I agree with you that you're going to have to wait a few more years to really, really uh, measure. But I think that slide that showed what the students are saying, I don't know, well, what was your... Um, uh, participation rate was it good for the students? I, well, I think it was like exceptional. It was what yeah. what three thousand? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, over three thousand. So it's very very high participation rate. Okay, because that's really yes. why we're doing this work Absolutely. and who we need to listen to. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Regent Goodman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I came out to this school and it was wonderful. And I, I just just from a business perspective. You essentially have three individuals out there that are acting as CEOs of each campus so that they can work closely with the municipalities and everything we're talking about with workforce development, developing these pathways. You need that kind of business background and that kind of relationship and, and that kind of work to make this all work. So we can't sit here and talk about creating pathways into workforce development and then keep everybody in their silos. So I just really feel that this is a great model and I appreciate um, having the, that business-minded individual work and reach out to the municipalities so that we can all work together to get all of our students everything that they need. So municipalities, workforce, all of these things are very important. And I, I, I do see this as a model, especially since it does not cost um, significantly more, a model that's going to work, especially as we start talking about these pathways. So thank you. Regent Boylan, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, one last question. Yes, and, uh, it's numbers again. Uh, somehow I like numbers. How many total VPs do you have at the community college system? This is, you've got VP for finance, you've got VP for other things also. Not this, just this, but all of them. How many VPs do you have? Six, is that right? 
six. It's it's kind of pace. confusing me why we have so many. Yeah, we're we'll, we'll gonna knock sure with you, but I believe it's six uh, VPs. So altogether, you have nine, six VPs on the side. I'm gonna call them, you know, get us something on the side, kind of. Yeah, six total, six dispersed at the campuses, three basically in the administration. And then of course, we, we, we do have a, within that structure, we have a CIO uh, that, that's not called the VP, but kind of VP level responsibilities. But it, 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 it's overall not, not, not six plus six. No, but, but it's six, six including the campus including VPs. VP of finance, VP of because you've got other titles, VP. VP is of hard finance. for me to say, but VP. How many all together is my question? Just a number. Yes. How many VPs? I believe it's six. Six. Six VPs in the yeah. whole system. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah. And I'll confirm that. But six. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah we'll <laughs> talk about that later. Yeah. We're very lean, especially when you compare us mm -hmm. to, to places like Dallas Community College, Tarrant yeah. Community College. When you look at, at, yes. at CSN, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and again, I, I would make the argument that uh, uh, these are some of the issues that create the anxiety for CSN, mm -hmm. you know, because we are really doing the best we can with very limited resources. So think about kind of six VPs for an operation, you know, that serves 30,000 students. Compare that against comparable institutions of our size, oh. and you're gonna. It will just reaffirm uh, this is not a top-heavy organization by any means. Okay, and so each VP has an assistant VP. I want to get all the VP things. <laughs> the, 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 the AVPs focus on the student services side of the house. That they're aligned to the AVP, and remember, those were already in the structure. They were just centralized. Sure, sure. No, I, yeah. I, I hear you, but I just want to So that is correct. Every numbers. VP has an, an AVP. So altogether, we really have 12 VPs in that end in VP. AVP and VPs together. There are six 12. total VPs. Yep. Three that are assigned to campuses. That's nine or separate? No. Total of three. All together, six, we have six. Including, including the campus those. VPs. That's right. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And then each one of those has an AVP. So that, we that have would be correct, probably. six more VPs. Also, altogether, we have yeah. 12 VPs. Yeah, I, I would love to come back and give you an organizational structure. I, I guess that we didn't come prepared to address yes, that. Sorry but for uh, on your direct yeah. question, yeah. uh, there are six AVPs total, and there, there's three assigned to the campus, uh, uh, multi campus structure. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, President Zaragoza, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple of questions for you. The, um, because we intentionally <laughs> focus on student experience, the student yes. experience slide that you showed where the, the category of error was shooting up past 90 percent, I thought was fantastic. Where, where did you, how did you um, aggregate the data Good. for that? Yeah, and I'm going to kind of defer to, to, to our campus VPs because we collect that as part of our ongoing continuous improvement process. So that that, that data is built into the services we provide. And I'll, I'll let them kind of talk to that. At each of our campuses, we have something called the QLIS system. So anytime that a student goes on, on at any one of our campuses, they're checking in to some of the student services at that moment, then they're going to be getting an email back that's going to be asking them how was their service, what was their impression, and so forth. That's why we have longitudinal data for the last five years, and it's campus-specific. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, I think that's a, a pretty strong testament to the way you have things set up, where you have that many students who are demonstrating a significant experience that they're in favor of. Um, the other question that I have for you is that it's come up several times that there's some criticism in terms of costs for what this model looks like. And, and the simple question that I want to pose is, um, is there another model or structure that is just as beneficial that would cost less? So my, my response to that is, are we talking about an ideal structure? Or are we talking about with the resources that we currently have? With, with the resources that you currently have. I, I think we have probably, uh, with the resources we have, the optimum model in mind. Uh, a, a centralized model, which costs the same, gave you the demographics and the data that we started with. 7% graduation rates. Uh, 
campuses were not attached to their communities and a lack of alignment to the workforce and economic of those communities. So yeah, you can have this kind of model move back and forth central versus decentralized. The basic premise though for what we're doing is, is to be more responsive uh, and to be more effective given our limited resources. Uh, I would love to come back to you for, with a, an optimum model in terms of what I think would be great that everybody would uh, endorse. Uh, we just don't have those kind of resources. No, I, I, I appreciate it and I recognize some of the limited resources that you have and it's not uncommon that some of our institutions frankly have limited resources and they're, they're doing the absolute best that they can. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, are there, I don't see any other additional questions for you again. Thank you for your time and for your staff's time. What we'll do is take a, a thank 15, you, thank you. We'll take a 15 minute administrative break. And because CSS has offered these fantastic clocks for us, we can keep track of the 15 minutes. If you take a glance at the clock, they'll let you know because we will start promptly in 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna be moving forward with agenda item number six. Mr. Uh, Chair, before you go to that, I have a request, please. What, what, what is it, Regent Portland? What's the, what's the request that? Thank you. Could you possibly move the action items up and the information only items further down so we can get those out of the way? Regent Borland, just so you know, we're moving into a possible action item now. Yes. Seven, eight, nine are possible action items. 10, 11 are action items. Um, oh, okay. So, so we're going to okay. keep moving forward. I, Thank you. I messed it up. I All apologize. Right. Yeah. So we're going to move on to agenda, uh, agenda item number six, um, revision of vacancy in the office of chancellor. This is a code revision, and uh, I'll let the acting chancellor take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Dale Urquiaga, acting chancellor. So the board will remember uh, you've seen this item once before. You requested an amendment uh, to the language dealing with uh, the idea council being represented in the um, search committee. Um, this item, to refresh everyone's memory, is derived from last summer's um, conversation, I'll call it, about my appointment and the process that was used. And during the fall of last year, the <clears throat> former chair and uh, then vice chair Carvalho worked with me on a revised process that is more public, um, probably clearer to understand, and um, uh, I think more concise in terms of what the outcome is if, if the chancellor's office were to suddenly become vacant. Um, you have the process also that you're going through now for a search. But this process revision is really about the, if I got hit by a bus on the way home, um, what would you do? So happy to answer questions. Are there any questions? Uh, just a, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you so much. <laughs> just, uh, just a comment. Uh, why exactly do you need another person uh, Mr. Kiaga, we're running short on funds, like I'll say again, but we are hiring more people. I'm sure you have a good reason, but help me out. Mr. Chair, Taylor Kiaga, I'm sorry, <laughs> Regent, I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, good. Let me rephrase the question. Why exactly are you hiring another person when we are running short on funds already? So why do you want to hire this other person? position. Do you know what? Uh, I'm just going to chime in here for a moment. Uh, yes, Regent Boylan, if yes, you sir. take a look at the agenda item, you're going to see that this is a code revision for the hiring of a it's chancellor. Right. Yes, yes. It's a, it's a code revision, which I'm against, but I was wondering why he's asking. To do Our that. chancellor is an acting chancellor. Yes. And he will be departing. And so we have to bring in another chancellor. As you know, this is simply a code revision in terms of how things would be outlined uh, regarding the chancellor's roles uh, and, and employment. Uh, I so apologize. I, I, th this isn't two yeah. positions. I'm yeah. so screwed up. I haven't even started drinking yet, but yeah. Um, Acting Chancellor, was there anything else that you wanted to, um, was there anything else that you wanted to present? <laughs> no. He okay. mentioned a drink. I could, yeah, I got it. Um, Mr. Chair, if there are no further questions, I'd like to move for approval. Okay. What are we doing with? 
Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to approve the uh, code revision for the vacancy of the chancellor. It was um, brought forward by Laura Perkins. It was seconded by Regent Del Carlo. Um, is there any discussion? All of those in favor, please say aye or yes. Aye. 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 Those aye. who oppose, say no or nay. Okay. We will move on to item, agenda item number seven. Uh, President Whitfield will present a multi-year employment contract. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, Keith Whitfield, President of UNLV. Um, to assist in this, because it is a uh, request um, coming out of the Kirk Akorian School of Medicine, I'd like to ask uh, Dean uh, Mark Kahn to, to join me and provide the specifics about this particular uh, item. Dean Kahn. Thank you for, for the record, Mark Kahn, K-A-H-N, Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of the Kirk Akorian School of Medicine. So, um, what, we're, um, what we have before us is we would like to offer an extended contract to an individual who, um, as part of the Conrad J-1 visa process. So the code requires any contract longer than a year uh, for a faculty member to be approved by, by this board. Um, Dr. Schiffler is a pediatric uh, otorhinolaryngologist. I should mention we have none in the state. He's trained in Canada, so he currently carries a J-1 visa. <clears throat> we would like to have permission to convert that to an H-1B visa as part of the um, Conrad waiver, and that requires a three-year contract. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, uh, Regent Brager? Not a question. I was going to say if there were no questions, I would make a motion for approval. Second. Second. Oh, okay. Okay, so... We have a motion to approve the multi-year employment contract by Regent Breger. It was seconded by Regent Perkins. Is there any discussion? Regent Perkins? Um, I was looking through the contract and the fixed initial expense, where did that amount come from? So there's a salary associated with this individual. Uh, Mark Kahn, for the record, um, Dean of the Kirk Accordion School of Medicine. There's a, a, a salary associated with this position. I'd like to remind the board that at the School of Medicine, uh, the vast majority of that contract is through earned income through the practice plan. So roughly 12.5% comes from the state. The rest is earned income. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Regent Carlo. Thank you, uh, Chair Brooks. I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Scheffler, for coming to Nevada. And we hope I hope you love it here and never leave because we just don't have anybody with your skill set. And it's just wonderful that you're going to be here with us. So uh, welcome to Nevada and thank you for coming. So, so you, sorry, is Dr. Scheffler here? No, okay. So again, there was a motion to approve this multi-year contract uh, by um, Regent Breger. It was seconded, thank you, it was seconded by Regent Perkins. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying yes or aye. 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 All those opposed aye. say no or nay. That clearly passes. We'll move on to agenda, agenda item number eight. Excuse me, Chair. Yes. Could I uh, just add a piece to that particular item. So this is, sure. the, sec this is the second time we brought up um, this particular sort of action. And I'd just like to offer it for consideration by the board to think about, this may be something that might need to just be delegated to universities to do. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's one of those things that it almost falls within normal hiring practices. But in our code currently, this has to be brought to here. I just offer that up that um, we would be perfectly happy to, to do that ins inside the university walls if uh, you all so uh, deemed appropriate. So I, I uh, President Whitfield, I, I appreciate that you would bring up something that might help streamline processes, um, particularly for our campuses. Um, and it's certainly something that we will take a look at um, and have some, have some discussion about and then 
obviously come come to you and 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 have an answer or some other additional considerations. But I really do appreciate that you brought this forward, Regent Breger. Just very quickly, if it um, needs a policy change, but if it's within the pay scale, maybe that would be a way to not if there's not a raise being attached to it or anything like that. And it's a normal situation. Maybe we could look at it like that, to where it doesn't have to be a piece of business. Thank you, Regent Breger. Thank you, Chair. And we will now move on to agenda item number eight, uh, food service agreement with uh, President Sandoval still online. I am Chair Brooks. I'm in the Reno office. Can Thank you. you. Uh, please go ahead, President Sandoval. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Scott, and members of the Board of Regents and Chancellor Berkeyaga. For the record, Brian Sandoval, President of the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, we are respectfully requesting approval of an amendment to the Compass Group USA food service contract at UNR for the provision of food services to the Lake Tahoe campus commencing on May 20th of 2023. Yes, that's for next month. Uh, <laughs> joining me today is Vice President of Student Services, Dr. Shannon Ellis, as well as who is the Associate Vice President for Student Life Services, and Dean Kennedy, who is the Executive Director of Residential Life Housing and Food Services. Uh, Mr. Chair and Regents, uh, this is, for the most part, a very straightforward contract. However, um, I wanted to bring all of your attention, and I have uh, Dr. Ellis here, Last fall, we got some negative feedback with regard to the provision of services by um, the entity that is that we seek for approval today. So for that reason, I asked for a campus audit to be conducted upon um, the food purveyor <coughs> compass, as well as our campus oversight. We received a copy for a final uh, copy of that audit this week, which found some, they had some negative findings with regard to the provision of services and, and the oversight. So I thought it was incumbent upon me to bring this to your attention uh, prior to your vote and consideration of this agenda item. And I have uh, Dr. Ellis here with, um, is happy to provide any some more specificity with regard to that. Thank you, President Sandoval. Are there questions regarding the contract um, specifically to what, or, or additional to what President Sandoval had just brought up about the the audit regarding the, the company that's going to be doing the food services? So, uh, Regent Brager? If there is none, I would make a motion for approval. If we need I a just motion want, on this. I appreciate that, Regent, Regent Brager. I just want to make sure that there no, are no... No, that's why I said if. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So then we'll accept approval. Um, a motion to approve by <laughs> Regent Brager. Um, and a second by Regent Boylan. Yes, sir. Is there any Chair. discussion? Regent Goodman. Chair Brooks. Regent Goodman, for the record. Uh, President Sandoval, would I, I'm assuming that because of the time frame, you'd like for this to get approved and then you'll deal with the issues with the audit at a later date. Is that kind of the plan? And Mr. Chair, to you and through you to Regent Goodman, uh, we are already handling this, so we've already taken corrective action and put, in, uh, put new accountability in place. But again, I just, in, you know, in, for the purpose of transparency, I want you to be aware that there was a negative audit and with, with this very entity. And again, uh, there is a sense of urgency in terms of getting the, them up there at Tahoe because we will not have anybody to provide food services there without the approval of this contract. Um, we will be providing you uh, with a full copy of the audit. We've already uh, provided it to the audit division, but they, because of the fact we received the audit this week, there simply wasn't enough time to supplement the record prior to, to your consideration today. Regent Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to you, uh, President Sandoval or Vice President Ellis, can you give us kind of a, um, a, a summary of what those findings were? This is Shannon Ellis. I'm the Vice President for Student Services at the University of Nevada, Reno. The findings stem from Chartwell's lack of compliance with certain commitments 
and our lack of oversight and follow-up as a university. So uh, there is a responsibility taken on both sides. The final report includes three audit issues in areas of contract management, staffing, and financial reporting. Most important uh, for you to know is that there are no health inspection concerns or financial discrepancies, particularly in the follow-up we've done since um, getting the audit findings. What is most relevant to this item today is that the final audit report you, you will see has recommendations to improve uh, Chartwell's performance and our monitoring of that performance, as well as our management action plans and responses. Those were prepared by student services that detail actions already taken and future actions with specific deadlines. Um, I, I need to, as the Vice President for Student Services, I need to apologize to the board, to the chancellor, to my president and my campus. Uh, we have been better at serving our students in uh, our contract with Chartwells. Um, I am committed, as are the leadership that the president has mentioned and Chartwells, to getting back to being as good as I've seen us before. I know we can do it, and I feel we're already on that pathway back. Thank you. I appreciate the um, the added detail. Regent Arascata. Actually, thank you, Chair Brooks. Actually, um, the table just answered the questions I was going to present. I was going to say thank you for your candor during this conversation. Uh, what would the what has the University of Nevada implemented to assure that the student services and the highest quality of food will be provided, especially not just here on the Reno campus, but in Lake Tahoe, where you have the distance between leadership on campus and up in, up in Lake Tahoe, although Dr. Joel Heaton is up there. What has the university implemented? Thank you. Uh, Shannon Ellis, Vice President of Student Services. I think the most significant thing we have done is we have hired two staff people to specifically oversee the contract. One will be, that is her job, and she comes to us with rich contract management experience and a knowledge of the university. And she is hired and already um, creating templates and lists and follow-up with a very lengthy contract. It's uh, 100 plus pages, plus the few that we're adding with this amendment. Um, she will also um, have a person working uh, that she will report to who is responsible for the larger budget picture to make sure that all of the detail that is required is provided to us and we're um, being fiscally responsible with student money. I think those are the two biggest things. We know that this audit gives us a great opportunity to do things right up at Lake Tahoe. We won't have to go back and get reports we weren't getting. Um, we're making sure the health inspections come directly to us at the university instead of to Chartwells. These kinds of things will make a, a significant difference uh, already, and we will be able to start with a great foundation up at Lake Tahoe. So will the University of Nevada be producing a follow-up report? We will be producing a lot of follow-up reports. Um, I will personally be overseeing weekly meetings of the group that Chartwells and the university individuals represent, and we will provide our own documentation of those meetings and put them into summaries. And we're very happy to share that uh, with the board at a presentation or uh, in writing to give you any way you want that. We're happy to do that. Appreciate appreciate the strong leadership. Thank you much. Nothing else, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, if I could just supplement, Chartwell's individuals have completely turned over as well. So there is new leadership on the Chartwell side. Okay. On That's campus. a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, President Sandoval. Isn't there also a, um, <clears throat> in taking a look at this food service agreement, a consideration that lo logistically this might be a, a, uh, the only option that um, that the university has. Yeah, and Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, Brian Sandoval, President of the University of Nevada, Reno, for the, for the record, you are correct. 
um, and as I said in my opening remarks, I think it's May 20th, is when we need this to uh, to occur, and we are practically fully booked for the summer, and so it's very critical that, that we have food service up there on the campus. Thank you, President Sandoval. Regent Breger? I'm happy to make an amendment to my motion that would state in the next three to six months that we would have a written report of the corrections that they have made, if that would help anybody from the questions that I'm hearing. If not necessary, I'm fine with the motion that was stated, but just in case from what I've heard. I think it's, it's um, the motion that is stated, I think could work for us. And certainly we could always bring okay, something I'm, back where I we make a request. Yeah, thank you, Regent Breger. So again, the, the motion was made for approval by Regent Breger. This was seconded by Regent Boylan for the food service agreement um, at UNR. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying yes or aye. 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 All those aye. opposed say no aye. or nay. That agenda item passes. We'll move on to agenda item number. Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, sir. Sorry for but <laughs> no, 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 it seems to be part of the day. Go yes, ahead, Regent uh, Barlett. Yeah. Yeah, it has yeah. the things we have to do. Now that I've e eaten, I'm feeling a wee bit better. My whole idea was to move. Oh, it's gone off my screen. Uh, agenda item number 10, I think it is, because I'm off my screen here, up uh, and move the other agenda item number nine, I think it is about athletics down further in time. That was what I was trying to say, but I was hungry and I couldn't talk. Okay, I appreciate that. I, I don't know why we would, why we would switch that up. Because we have a few members who are going to be busy with either a doctor or something else. And I think we should have all the members present to, you know, go through that, listen to what's happening. <sighs> So yeah, just a suggestion, and I apologize for butting in every time you speak, but uh, that's just a suggestion if we could change it and bring it further on. The, that was it. The, the only regents who I believe are not available right now is Regent McMichael, who left, who, who left our meeting earlier. Um, and so that would not have much of an impact on the order of things. Are there other regents that are leaving early that would impact this agenda item? Mr. Chair, I have a previous Chair appointment, so yes, that will impact my ability to stay. Okay. Regent Del Carlo. Chair Thank Brooks. You. Thank you, Chair Brooks. I have a four o'clock flight, and I was going to the WNC award ceremony tonight. So normally I don't mind staying late, but I've already committed to go to that. I don't know if we're going to get to that after we do athletics. So... Yeah, athletics is... You're going to have to do what you got to do. Hour. And there was one other region, I think, coming in through technology. Regent Brown, were you coming in also? Yeah, no, so, thanks, Chair Brooks. Regent Brown, for the record, I unfortunately do have a 2 o'clock uh, hard stop. Okay, with, with that, then let's move some agenda items around so that everybody could be part of the conversation. So we will, we will move out of order and move right into agenda item number 10. Um, and if we have to, we'll go to 11, and then we will go back to 9. This is Regent McMichael. I'm still in the meeting. Oh, thank you, Regent McMichael. For some reason, I thought you had, had left. I appreciate you letting us know you're still here. Um, is Regent Tarkanian present with us? Okay. So here's what we'll do. Because I don't know if Regent Tarkanian has come back from lunch, I'm just going to, we're going to have a five-minute administrative recess um, just to make sure that we've got all of the regents who would like to participate in these conversations have the ability to do so. So we'll take a five-minute administrative break. Okay, I think, I think we're, while we're still working on some technology uh, challenges, what I'd like to do so that we can move our, our meeting along today is we are going to move into agenda item number nine, <clears throat> because we're still waiting for 
a regent to be able to come in telephonically. So we will hear an order of presentation. We'll hear from UNLV, and then we will more than likely, if our regent is is in, then we will move into agenda uh, agenda item number ten, and then we will come back to nine for the other reports. Um, and what I'm gonna suggest is after, regardless of how we do this, after each presentation, we'll just make a, we'll look for a motion to approve the report and then, and then go on. So that we'll do this individually rather than one whole section of, of athletic reports. Um, so with that, we will begin with uh, President Whitfield and UNLV. Thank you, Chair. Um, Keith Whitfield, for the record, Keith Whitfield, president of UNLV. Um, you will hear about our um, report from my athletic director, Eric Harper. Just do want to uh, put out there and allow you to remember that uh, our Lady Rebels were Mountain West Conference champions this year for the second year, went to the tournament for the second year. And one of the many things that we're just very, very proud of. But with that, I'll get out the way and allow uh, Mr. Harper to pro provide the report. Uh, for the record, Eric Harper, Director of Athletics, UNLV. Thank you, Dr. Whitfield. Uh, UNLV Athletics, again, saw opportunities in FY22. Uh, we continue to serve our student athletes in their space to excel academically, athletically, and in the community. FY22 was filled, was filled with transitions, but our administrative team continued to devote our energy and passion in providing the best possible experience for our student athletes. Just to speak of some of the accomplishments, as Dr. Whitfield just mentioned, our Lady Rebel basketball program. But I'd like to talk, start off by talking about the academic success of our student athletes. Uh, once again, we had the ninth and 10th consecutive semesters of a 3.0 cumulative GPA or better. Uh, semester GPA of 3.26 for our student athletes, cumulative GPA of 3.35 in the fall of 20, <coughs> in the fall of 21. A graduation rate at 85%. It's up from the 2015 cohort of 82%. The academic progress rate multi-year score, 987. 228 of our student athletes earned academic all Mountain West honors, and that represents over half of our student athlete population. 113 of our <coughs> earned the prestigious Mountain West Scholar Athlete Award. So academically, our student athletes are excelling at a high level. Dr. Woodfield mentioned championships. Four conference championships and one national championship title this past, uh, in FY22. Men's swimming and diving completed a back-to-back -back championship. And let's make that a three-peat, as they just won recently their third championship uh, in swimming and diving. And Coach Lords was once again named Coach of the Year. Um, Lady Rebels earned a second conference championship as well as the tournament championship this year after completing that last year. So Lindy, Coach Lindy LaRock is doing a fantastic job with our student athletes. And their, and their GPA, cumulative GPA as a team, is, is right just short of 3.5. Baseball won a Mountain West title last year with Coach Stolte also claiming the Coach of the Year honors. Women's volleyball won the National Invitational Volleyball Championship in the postseason. And once again, our Rebel Girls and Company won world championships in dance. <clears throat> Six of our student athletes were named all region district over the sports of those sports, men's golf, Caden Fiora, Fioroni, softball, Samantha Diaz, defensive player of the year in the conference, volleyball, Marina Hayden, Mountain West player of the year, all region, honorable mention, all American. Lady Rebel basketball, Desiree Young, Mountain West player of the year, Neka Ob Obiazar, Sixth person of the year. Football Cameron Friel was a freshman of the year on offense. And men's tennis, Christopher Bulis <coughs> was an all Mountain West uh, winner. As we move forward, and as Dr. Whitfield appointed me the athletic director in January of 22, after a four, four month stint as the interim, 
we embarked on a strategic plan that started in March. We completed that strategic plan and implemented it in September of 22, and in the progress, and in progress to work the plan and not let the plan work us. The plan is aimed at delivering a premier student athlete experience in college athletics and providing Rebels the opportunity to succeed as students, athletes, into the future as well-rounded community leaders. We currently have uh, one of the one of the import, important pieces for me what, in a world that we live right now is mental health and mental wellness. We currently have 2.5 full-time employees in the mental health space. We are adding a third and potentially a fourth in the next fiscal year. Uh, but we also have access to CAPS on campus. But in that space with 500 plus student athletes, I thought it was important that we add an additional mental health, mental wellness uh, person to our staff. And that's, uh, we're in the process of doing that right now so that we can take care of our student athletes, not when they have issues, but before. Uh, as that strategic plan went into place, we focused on, on six pillars, student athlete development, Athlete, athletic excellence, fan experience, and also to grow and maintain a model enterprise through revenue generation, the value to our community and, and community engagement, and diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging were the six pillars that we utilize for our strategic plan in, in alignment with the institution. I go back to community engagement, <clears throat> and I may get a little teary-eyed on this one, so <laughs> please uh, bear with me. But our student athletes last spring and last year uh, had a mindset to help those less fortunate. And in that space, what they decided to do was build beds for underprivileged youth, young, young kids that are sleeping on the floor, sleeping two and three to a bed, some sleeping on a couch. Uh, so they wanted, to, they wanted to do that. So what we did as a department, we supported them and we supported them in a great way. Some of our donors helped, our president was out. Uh, vice presidents on campus, our provost was out. Some of our re very well-respected donors were out. We set out with a mindset last spring, last April, to build 100 beds. The record at that point in time was 30, 35 beds in a given day. We built 100 beds for underprivileged youth in Las Vegas, <coughs> excuse me, that were sleeping on the floor, sleeping on, on an air mattress. I actually delivered a bed with my 15-year-old daughter. There was an air mattress with four people sleeping on it. Four people sleeping on that air mattress. And it was a way for us as a, as, as a department to give and do something for our community. And I say 100 beds, only 98 of them were certified because some of the wood split uh, in the process. But lo and behold, it was, it was the message and the, and the method that our student athletes wanted to do. So we supported our student athletes in that, in that endeavor. As we continue to move forward, we will continue to do that. Uh, this year, um, last year, was some facility improvements uh, with the lead athletic complex, basketball locker room, tennis, baseball, softball. Uh, our fundraising, uh, obviously due to COVID, that was a little slow in the past year, <clears throat> but we will be coming back with a vengeance uh, to hit the numbers that we need to do to take care of the student athlete experience. Hence, we will have a Rebel Excellence campaign involved with a capital project campaign. And both of those campaigns <clears throat> will be designed to enhance the student athlete experience. <clears throat> That's part of our strategic plan. Uh, one will be de designed specifically for nutrition, mental wellness, academic success, career development, and the holistic growth of our student athletes. The capital projects will build, will be to enhance our facilities. If we need to build new facilities, we'll obviously go through the process that we need to go through but we will raise the funds before we do that. <clears throat> the, and so that our student athletes can train, study, grow, and compete at the highest levels. We were able to, re to in extend our Learfield partnership. And in the first three years, we will receive 100% of revenues. 100% of revenues with a guarantee number of $2, point, uh, $2 million <clears throat> in, in year one, year two, and year three of the 10-year contract. Projected at this particular point in time is north of $2.5 million with Learfield. Learfield is a great partner with Dan Dolby and his team. <clears throat> UNLV was selected to host the, the, the um, 2023 NCAA men's basketball regional that took place at T-Mobile Arena in March. That was awarded uh, to UNLV and with Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Bureau Association in 22. 
So I considered that part of our 22 report. And then in that same time, we were announced that we would host, help host the final four here in Las Vegas. So the economic impact of, Las, of that plus the UNLV logo brand marks will be on full display uh, for several, several weeks. Culture of compliance, <clears throat> 161 rules violations, ed rules education presentations conducted, more than 80 new system and control workflows created. <clears throat> Part of that, people say, why do, you, why do you have violations? Well, it's healthy to have violations. That means our monitoring systems are working because we, mo all of the violations that we have are all found out by our, our compliance team that actually reports to Dr. Whitfield. And in the 50th year anniversary of Title IX, uh, UNLV athletics, athletics is one of the most diverse uh, institutions, athletic departments in the country. We help celebrate Title IX with multiple home games, women's games. Yes. And then we celebrated, UNLV Athletics celebrated National Girls and Women in Sports Day in the spring of 22 with a reception and panel that included Nikki Fargus, world champion Las Vegas Aces, Lisa Motley, LVCVA, and former UNLV track and field student athlete Jordan Hardy, who is currently a Fox Sports Premier Boxing Champions promoter. UNLV Athletics is committed to the student athlete experience and strive to achieve that commitment each and every day. It gives our department great pride to see our student athletes graduate, graduating at an 85% rate, but we intend to do more. Thank you for that. Any questions? Thank you for that presentation. We do have a question from Regent Breger. So my grandsons would not forgive me if I didn't ask, is hockey not one of your uh, prevalent sports is that those boys just play their hearts out? My grandsons played a total of six years for your school and graduated. One's a police officer, one's a nursing recruiter, so you did well by them. Uh, right now, UNLV hockey is a club sport. That's what I thought, it's but they wanted to do so much more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, but we, when, when we look at, at sports, which we're not looking at adding any at this particular point in time, we have to keep in mind Title IX and the opportunities that we present. But now that we have, and this is just now that we have the Golden Knights, it's such an amazing opportunity that they don't have to play at 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning at the, I used to go, it was horrible. Um, but they're really not thought of, and these young men work really hard and are part of your university, and they're never recognized because it still has to be a club sport. I think that's kind of sad. Anyway, I just, I don't mean it derogatory. Mm -hmm. I just know if they ever watch this, they'll be like, you know that we did that for six years, so and good graduates. So I just think it instills uh, grade point averages that are highly thought of and they have to get all their own money and everything that they do uniform. So it's pretty nice if once in a while, even though it's a club sport that they're recognized. Sorry, they've been gone for years now. Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford for the record. Um, thank you, Director Harper. So lovely to see you. Um, I did wanna share with the board um, first of all, the story about the beds was great. Um, I guarantee that that did more for your athletes than it did for the families. And, you know, it, until you see that, you know, um, it's hard to understand because um, that's the community that I service. And um, so the community that I service is similar. Um, we have a, a nonprofit inner city um, uh, competitive sports team through greater um, greater youth sports. So my students get to uh, watch them play soccer last night, soccer, basketball, and flag football. Um, for kids that organized sports are really something that you can't really engage in in poverty because it's expensive. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out to um, Director Harper because my student athletes were all able to go to a UNLV basketball game and were able to get a UNLV shirt through the um, through the alignment of the K through 12 outreach that UNLV is, is doing. So my students are wearing their UNLV shirts all the time. Um, it makes um, college less foreign to them. So I just want to thank you for um, supporting, I think it was 60 or 70 of my students. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Um, I was looking at the report too, and on, on slide 37, I was really a chagrined, I guess is the best word, the discrepancy between the head coach salaries between the men and women's teams. And, you know, I know this came up really big when uh, our soccer team in the United States won the 
the national something and they were paid so much less. And I know that, you know, I fight for equity in pay and women make maybe 80 cents on the dollar to men. But looking at our coaches, I want to know, are you paying market rate to the women? Are you basing that on the revenue coming in? Or why is it that the women are paid so much less than the men? It's just not fair because if you were in an art class or an anthropology class or an engineering class and you had a, a male instructor versus or professor versus a female professor, you wouldn't have such a huge gap in pay. So I just, and, and it's probably not just UNLV, but I just want to know because we got to be equal someday. We continuously look at that, <clears throat> excuse me, each year um, and we obviously signed Linda LaRock to an extended uh, contract. She is the highest paid uh, lady women's basketball coach in the Mountain West. Uh, and we try to look at the industry standards as it, as it moves along. But we want to make sure that our, our, our lady rebels, uh, women's basketball, volleyball, all feel appreciated uh, as well as showing their student athletes our value, that, how we value our women's sports. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Regent Carvalho? Mr. Chair, Laura Perkins here. Oh. Regent Carvalho, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, uh, A.D. Harper, thank you for, for your presentation. Um, I want to commend um, UNLV Athletics for the successful year and also for um, the story that you shared with us about the, the service that, that the athletes do. I, I agree with my colleague, um, that this is uh, these kinds of um, events are are impactful to those people who do them too. So I, I think it's great to to share that uh, to be that role model for that. I do have a question um, on page twenty four um, regarding your budget projections. Um, first, you it shows for um, for year twenty 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 two um, your operating revenues. Um, we're about ten thousand or ten million dollars more than the previous year, so that seems to be a success. But I feel that your um, budget projections um, kind of go backwards again. Um, so it it looks like it was almost sixty four million for twenty twenty two for total operating revenues, and then your your projections for twenty twenty three and going forward start at about ten million dollars less than that. And we see the same um, with expenditures as well. But I I wanted to um, ask you it it was there an anomaly in twenty twenty two or it, it, is there some way that you can um, explain that a little bit more clearly? And also I. There, there shows, it, it says um, there's some footnotes, note two, note three, note four, and I don't see where that's, um, those footnotes are. I have, I have, for the record, Eric Harper, Director of Athletics. I have my CFO here with me. If you look at the first line there on ticket sales in 2021, it says 324,000. That was, we obviously instituted a mask uh, requirement to attend games at Allegiant Stadium, and a lot of our people opted out, so their monies were rolled over to the next year. So we, and then also, if you see, um, there's another line there. In game guarantees, it's at one hundred ninety-eight in 2021. In 2022, it's one million because we didn't have those games game guarantees at that level in in that particular year before that. So. In game guarantees, like for instance, this year we play at Michigan. That's a 1.8 guarantee game. We don't have that game the following year. And so those are, are things like that. And, and Iowa State, for instance, when we played them here, they purchased more season tickets. They purchased about 400 of our season tickets because for the price of one of our games, for our season ticket is one game in Ames, Iowa. So you see the, you see the difference in the dollars and cents there. We are going, we did see on that note two, note four, note five, my CFO, who's Sam Marone here, Sam's been with me about eight months now. Uh, we noticed that that report, uh, for years, that's the way it was set, and now it's no longer that way. So we will be correcting that moving forward. Thank you for that clarification. That makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? 
Is there a motion to approve the report? Second. Okay. So a motion to approve the athletic report from UNOV um, was made by Regent Del Carlo. It was seconded by Regent Brager. Are there any, uh, any discussion? All in favor, uh, please signify by saying aye or yay. Aye. aye. Those who oppose say no or nay. Okay, the report was approved. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. We Thank appreciate you. it. What I want to do is, um, because we're still having some issues, is, is move right into the report by UNR. And then after this report, we will go back to or go right into uh, agenda number 10. And then after that, we will finish up with the two other reports. But this seems to be a, a reasonable way of cutting some time um, in half based on requests that were made earlier. Um, so if we could hear from uh, President Sandoval and UNR. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Board of Regents, Chancellor Piaga, for the record, Brian Sandoval, President of the University of Nevada, Reno. We are pleased to provide you with the report of the athletic department. With me today is our athletic director, Stephanie Remp. I believe it's her first uh, appearance before the Board of Regents. Uh, Stephanie came to us from LSU last July and has established herself as one of the country's most respected athletics administrators during a distinguished career spanning more than 25 years. And she's doing an incredible job for the Wolfpack. Uh, she's working extremely hard and I'm very honored to be able to introduce you to Thank her, you. Stephanie. So, um, yes, I'm Stephanie Remp, uh, the Athletic Director at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, first of all, thank you for having me today. I am uh, honored to have the opportunity to sit in front of you. Uh, this is, uh, I just finished month nine. So as, as you might imagine, um, still getting my arms around the department and the direction we're going forward. Um, today is a special day, if a, a little bit different from the report. We just were able to announce, and I thought you all might enjoy hearing, that Joel Batonio, who is a football player who played at the University of Nevada and currently plays for um, the Cleveland Browns, donated $1 million today to pay for a weight room for our football program. So we were really excited about that. We announced it, and we're going to be celebrating it all weekend. So I thought you guys would enjoy um, hearing that. So with that, I won't take up too much time. Um, the report, obviously, as you know, is from 2021-22 academic year. Um, some things that I wanted to point out uh, would be the performance of our teams. And we went to a bowl game in 2021. Uh, we had 16 All Mountain West Conference honorees. Our men's tennis team won the conference regular season and the conference tournament. And our coach was named Coach of the Year last spring. Uh, for the first time in history, we had two women's golfers go to the national championship. And our women's basketball team had great success with 20, uh, 20 game win season. 20 win game, 20 game win. Um, and then in terms of coaches, so during that academic year, uh, President Sandoval was able to hire Ken Wilson as our new football coach. Towards the end of the academic year, I had the opportunity to hire a baseball coach and a men's golf coach, which we are excited about. In addition, um, over the summer, um, the University of Nevada, Reno, added skiing as a Division I team. It was part of the University of it was part of Sierra Nevada College's uh, NAIA ski team, now became um, a ski program for us. And so we have another coach uh, for that as well. Academically, um, I just wanted to point out that we now had uh, a 15th semester and a 16th semester in a row of 3.0 grade point average for our student athletes combined. And from that, um, we are looking forward to doing a lot of things ahead. Um, in terms of our finances, uh, we have been spending a lot of time um, making sure that we have our arms around our finances and going forward, being able to project a couple years out, working closely with our campus and then spending a significant amount of time uh, determining how we can grow our revenue as an athletics program. So with that, that concludes my report. And um, I'm again honored to be here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions. That was a fantastic report. Is there a motion to approve UNR's athletic report? Motion to approve. Um, 
Motion Second. to approve the UNR athletic report was made by uh, Vice Chair Arascata, seconded by uh, Regent Goodman. Um, all those in favor of accepting the report, please signify by saying aye or yay. Aye. 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 Those, who, those who oppose say no or nay. The report's been accepted. Thank you very much. We'll now move into ag uh, agenda item number 10. This is uh, an agenda regarding the roles of uh, chief of staff and special counsel to determine whether or not this should be two separate positions or should it, re should it be one position. Um, rather than speaking for the system office and the chancellor, I will allow him to weigh in with his remarks or recommendations that are noted in our, in our materials. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Dale Urquaga, Acting Chancellor. So the board understands um, the Chancellor's Office prepared this briefing paper um, and the draft language for you, gathering up the resources, recognizing that you have an interim person acting in this role, and um, she felt it was a conflict for her to develop this item. And so we, uh, under the direction of the Chair and the Vice Chair, prepared the document in front of you. So. This item precedes the item requested by three regents to immediately begin a search for um, the combined position. So as you see in the briefing paper, the question before you is, do you want a combined position, as you have had for some years, of a chief of staff and special counsel? We've provided you with the um, bylaw position description, or duties description, and then the position description questionnaire. If you're not familiar with our processes and hiring at um, the system administration office, um, many, a, a couple of jobs, the chief of staff, the chancellor, have duties spelled out in the code or the handbook, if you will. And then for every position, we create what's called a position description questionnaire. It's an administrative function um, done inside the office for HR, and that includes everything. The, the, some of the duties in um, the handbook are truncated, I guess. Every position has a rather lengthy position um, description questionnaire, and that document is also provided for you the, as it was used in the last search um, for this position. So the question as you think about how to move forward has been now for several months, is this one job or is this two jobs? As you heard in public um, comment this morning, um, the position at the chancellor's office is it's two jobs. There is a historic secretary to the board, which was retitled chief of staff um, some years ago that has that, I'll call it administrative function. And I don't mean that in any diminutive or lessening way. It's a critical role. Corporations have secretaries as well. Um, those duties used to be vested in the chancellor. Uh, and then, uh, as you've also heard, the legal duties to provide um, open meeting law guidance and ethics uh, advice to the board um, was added to that position um, in, in more recent years. So it's really a question for you. We've given you a couple of ways you might do that. If you keep it as a single position, it is as it is, and you would go to the next agenda item um, and decide if you wish to commence a search. If the board decides that this is two positions, you would give then direction to staff to prepare for you any revisions to the handbook that are necessary um, and any position description questionnaires, um, depending if you gave us single direction or if you wanted to have a choice. Because the two choices we've given you if the position is split, you could have a council who reports to the board and is therefore appointed by the board. Um, and you, or you could have a council who is part of the general counsel's office and would um, be assigned to the board um, in the way that we assign uh, counsel to committees um, and to uh, other uh, bodies like the sexual misconduct task force. So if you're familiar, when you have a committee meeting, um, a member of general counsel staff is there with you. So you could operate that way or you could have a special counsel what we would need is some direction from the board. Um, if you vote to have it be two positions, do you want to see both those position descriptions or do you wish us to um, prepare only one? Got it. Thank you for your comments. Um, Regent Perkins. 
Regent Perkins was on deck with a question. We'll go to Regent Brager. Thank you. Hold on. It took me a minute. <laughs> okay. I'm here now. Thank you, Regent Perkins. Um, okay. About the splitting the positions, I will uh, lean back to what uh, Regent Boylan was saying. How do we get all these all this money to have, create all these new positions? I think the commit um, being fiscally responsible. I think the, the two positions should remain combined. Um, just because they're uh, to create another position would co would cost a little bit more money, and I don't believe there's enough to justify a full time um, attorney uh, because if they're only going to be doing advising us on um, on uh, open meeting law and uh, those types of things, so to um, and I don't believe that. A attorney that is not, but that is hired out, or like a contract attorney, would do the board justice. And I believe somebody else mentioned earlier in the conversation that the board definitely needs an attorney because sometimes the, the needs of the system are different than the needs of the board. Thank you, Regent Perkins. Um, Regent Breger, I apologize. There was. On our queue, oh, no, Regent I'm, McMichael I, you know was, was next, and then we'll, I just want to stay with, with, with how these requests are coming in, um, Regents being placed in the queue. Um, and so, Regent McMichael. Oh. Okay. R Regent McMichael, do, do you need a second? Can you hear us? Okay, we'll go to Regent Breger while we wait for Regent McMichael. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak from experience, and maybe not on this board, but 24 years of working school board and county commission. Um, we did have a, we each had our own, of course, executive assistants that to work our uh, work for us. The, the university system seems a little bit antiquated, and I'm just, I mean that kindly in regards to starting out 30 years ago on the school board, we had one person and then we ended up moving through to where there were three or four staff members because we're on a volunteer basis technically. $80 a meeting is um, can be as harmful as it is good. But uh, I, what I'd like to say in regards to this agenda item, to stay on task, is that I believe that uh, coming from that experience factor that we do, I'm very comfortable with Mr. Martinez or staff provides, if he were not here, someone guiding us. We also have a DA that does Robert's Rule of Orders and makes sure we stay on track. I believe that money is always an issue. If we're looking for efficiencies and we don't want to spend the money, I think that uh, to me, and I'm just going to speak out loud here, that in all the people that I worked with, Carrie is admirable. The whole staff is admirable of how they work and what they do with technically 13 people. And I'm not certain that it's necessary at this time to, number one, spend more money, and number two, to put it as one person, I don't think is necessary, and I feel very strong about this. I believe that we do have counsel that makes comments. I believe that with the DA's office coming to every meeting that we're very well protected, but I think uh, I'm 100% uh, against a new search for anything at this point in time. Thank you. Regent Downs. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Chair Brooks, um, Regent Downs for the record. So I I'm kind of reiterating what, what other people said, what Regent Perkins had mentioned. Um, and I, I was wondering, is it cost effective? If it was split, I don't think we need a full-time attorney and a full-time chief of staff. I could see the chief of staff was already working uh, pretty fully, um, would we have an attorney on the side or someone to consult as needed? Uh, I'm very much in, turn, in favor of fiscal uh, responsibility with this. I also defer to what my colleagues who've been here longer have experienced in working with uh, different uh, structures of chief of staff. So um, being an attorney affiliated, affiliated versus not. So I'm, I'm open to hearing some uh, some other ideas. Thank you. Regent Goodman. Thank you, Chair. Um, so 
This isn't my first rodeo when it comes to politics, and I've worked with chief of staffs, and I've worked with legal counsels, and uh, never the twain shall meet. I feel that a legal counsel is definitely not a corporate secretary, and I say that with all due respect. I feel that these need to be two separate positions. Again, um, I don't know the need of special counsel. I'm not going to go into that. I would defer to individuals that know more about this, but... We're talking about a person here who's currently holding this role, who's actually been incredibly uh, efficient and very good at what she's done. Her staff has come up and um, uh, basically testified as to how great of a boss she is. I, I think we have someone here that's doing a great job. I think we should just keep her, and then we'll decide if we need special counsel or not. Uh, but a special counsel slash chief of staff is... Uh, is not realistic. I believe that from the history, this happened because there was one person who was a unicorn that wanted to do this. So that made sense, I guess, at the time. But moving forward, um, I, I completely support Carrie and her staff and um, think that we should move forward in that direction. Thank you. Regent Borland. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I don't know where and why this is becoming a personal issue and uh, forget politics, like she mentioned, there's no politics here that I see. This is all education. And why you're mentioning, why Regent uh, Goodman is mentioning personally, Kerry or any names like that. This position is a one position and it's in our code. We don't have in our code anything that says, hello? ghosts. Anyway, well, we don't have anything that says we need two positions in there. We already have it in our code. Why do we always keep changing our code? It works great with one position, and it works really fantastic as it has worked before. We saw what happened in the last couple of years. We spent nearly a million dollars on private lawyers and paying out funds to different people, you know, Kilroy and Dean Gould and Melody and all that stuff. Uh, if we had had a competent board uh, council, and no disrespect to any of you, you know, councils that are here, but we, we need someone who can tell us and take us in the right direction, bring this board together as a team. It's not a personal issue about how good somebody is or isn't. It's a, it's a question of what's in our code, Let's stick to what we already are supposed to do. We're not even doing that. So that's my say on it. I think it's one position and has to remain that way. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Cavallo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have more uh, questions than uh, really comments, but um, I, I, I think I, it's important to, to hash this all out. And um, I don't know, I, I hope that we can do it all today. But, but first, um, I'm not sure if our, um, if our general counsel staff is, is equipped to handle the, the added responsibilities of the board at this time. I, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask the chair to, um, for an answer to that. Um, and, and Carrie has done a wonderful job in this role. I, I do get concerned about changing our code because a, because a person has done so well in that position. If, if we want to do that, I'm, I'm open to talking about that with, um, understanding what the the differences in those roles are um, because we haven't seen that at this time um, and so I I only know on this board what what we've had previously um, and I, I've also been um, under the impression that our special counsel in the past if if they've been separated from the chief of staff duties do is there enough work for that person to handle, or I mean, to to do, is there forty hours of work each week for them to do? 
I, I don't know if that's the case if we separate it out unless we do make that a part-time position. And I'm not sure that that's the direction of the board. Um, and and lastly, I, I have to ask, are we being charged by the Attorney General's office for their services? I know in the past we weren't, but I don't know if at some point that has started to happen or will it in the future? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. So I just have, I have a lot of questions that I'd like us to, to be able to discuss before I come to any conclusion. Thank you. I appreciate that. It sounded like you had posed a question to me, so I want to be able to answer it. And the question was whether or not we have uh, adequate time efficiency with council now. And I can only tell you from my perspective, the answer is yes, we, we do. Um, and the other question that you posed was, what does this look like if there was a full-time position of chief of staff and council? What would those hours look like? What I would offer is uh, that's where we could probably have a potential waste um, because the amount of hours that council plays into the board um, is not 40 hours a week. It's If you were to take a look at the position chief of staff and council, you'd probably find that the council part of that is maybe... I don't know, 20%, 15 to 20% of what that position would be, where we have a chief of staff doing 100% of chief of staff duties. Um, and then to the, to the question that's posed about um, what this may look like, um, one of the things that we could look at, should this be two positions, is that there is a process in which we either contract somebody who we bring in on part-time, or we bring somebody in who actually falls underneath the, the, the system office. In other words, they would fall underneath Jimmy Martinez, and that person would be the sole counsel for the board. But because the amount of hours are limited in terms of what that counsel would do for the board, the other, the other part of, that, of those hours where that person would spend their time is with the system counsel because they're understaffed. And so it's almost like killing two birds with one stone if we take a look at what does that look like from a financial perspective. Um, also keep in mind that our current chief of staff is on contract until the end of the year. And so again, if we're looking at, at, at finances as a consideration of this, um, those monies have been spent. And so I, I, hope, I hope that that... Um, uh, I hope that that answers your, your, your questions, um, Regent Carvalho, and I will move to... Um, um, well, I do have some follow-up Oh, questions. you have some follow-up? Okay, uh -huh. sure. Well, I, I would like to pose that same question to either the Chancellor or, or to Mr. Martinez if, if they feel like there's enough, um, uh, enough uh, bandwidth in, their, in his office to do that, and then I have one other follow-up. Jimmy Martinez, for the record. Um, one thing that we have been talking about is we are currently understaffed, but our, our office does have one current legal position that was, um, the funding was taken away in years past. So we are going to be asking for that position to be funded going forward in the next biennium. Um, so there could be some opportunity there to, to share that position. Um, in terms of the Attorney General's office, we are not currently being charged by the AG's office for their presence at our meetings. They are just doing this to help us out during this period where we are, where we have a shortage of this position. Um, it, it's not currently intended to be a long-term long -term fix. I don't know if the AG's office would, would entertain doing something long-term with us. So we don't, we, that's not something that I think we can count on at this time. Um, and, one one thing I'll say about the the position being in the bylaws is that that part is kind of a tricky piece to rely on because even though the current bylaws say chief of staff and special counsel, this board never voted to amend the bylaws to add that section <gasps> to the, the bylaws. So it's this position has had a very long and, and unclear life that belongs to it. And it was, the board never voted to create it in the bylaws. So while of course the board can do, go any way it wants and, and vote any way, I just wanted to point that out because I, I don't want you to strictly rely on the current wording of the bylaws 
when this board never voted to change the bylaws in the first place? Mr. Martinez, a quick question, uh, Mr. Chair. You're saying the board didn't vote on this. Do we have any proof of that? When was this, you know, put into the code? Which meeting did they not vote on this? Why is it in there then? If we have such good counsel and chief of staff and all those positions and all this good stuff, why is it still in there? And why are we being told? See, now if we had our own counsel, he could have found this and told us this. So that's, that's a slip, you know, to me, I know you're the lawyer, but that's a slippery slope to me. How do you say don't pay attention to your own bylaws? That's, that's really bad to tell a board, so. James Martinez, for the record, um, I, it, it is problematic, and I can tell you this, the change was done by the pre previous chief of staff and special counsel, and it was done as an administrative change to the bylaws, um, but it wasn't brought to the board for a vote pursuant to the amendment to the bylaws provision. Um, there, so there's a lot of tricky little things that have gone on in the, in the past years over this position. And I think the best way to move forward at this point is for the board to just make some, hash it out, make some decisions and let staff make a clear record moving forward and make sure that all of these decisions are documented and done, done correctly. Question, Mr. Martinez, again, since you're speaking, I'm Mr. Chair, I'll take the liberty to just ask him. I think there's a lot of tricky little things going on right now. Forget that there was tricky things before, it's going on right now. So we really need to get to the bottom of this. We've had a uh, lawyer who answers to the board. This very idea that the lawyer would answer to you is fudging ridiculous. I mean, that is the board counsel answers to the board. You cannot have a slave answering to two masters. So that's from the Bible. Don't get me any of you racist people think I'm saying this racist or whatever. So. It's just ridiculous. Some of these ideas that have come up, and I apologize to the chancellor, I don't know who's coming up with these tricky ideas right now to change. It was a simple thing we asked for, just to get the uh, search going. And now it's become this uh, Alice in Wonderland thing going on. So I, I don't know what's happening here. It's a simple thing. Let's vo vote on keeping it as one position. Obviously, the person did it. There were people before who did that position. So it's not like they're not working. So by the same token, if you say that it's only 40% that the lawyer does the work and there's 60%, so then are you telling me that the 60% that the chief of staff does, and then what does he or she do for the 40%? Yeah. It's and really ridiculous math to me that I'm hearing and all these tricky, wee little things. And uh, James Martinez, for the record, I just want to point out that our office has no input and no position on how this board moves forward. We're just providing information and we will move forward any way this board sees fit. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks. There's only four of us left on this board that even know what it was like to have the chief of staff and legal counsel position all together. There's only four of us which says a lot about stuff. And I can't compare it to anything else because I don't know anything before that. But for what we had, I thought worked very, very well. And when the breakdown came was after the person left, and then we had the two failed searches that were not really well handled. And then we picked the wrong, as it turned out, you, you know, anytime you pick an employee, uh, select it. You just never know what you're getting, and I, we picked the wrong person. So we've been a long, long time now without our own legal counsel, and um, I really miss that position. I think it was really helpful to have that person that we could um, go talk to on lots of different things. I, I um, Not that I don't come to you, Jimmy, but there was a, a, a difference, and in my understanding, before when the, we had the combined position, Yes, we all knew that it wasn't a full-time 40 hours work with legal stuff, but that that person that we had at the time was able to also assist the general counsel. He had particular skills that complemented what we needed. And with that person leaving, then we've had to contract someone else completely separate 
I think, you know, I mean, I don't have anybody's permission to use anybody's names. That's why I'm, you all know who I'm talking about. So, um, so we've left ourselves pretty vulnerable. And um, I don't like to f fix what's not broken. I know that um, when we had our, our combined position back in 21, sometime in, from the time I got on the board in 17, um, Carrie, who does do a fabulous job, is very dedicated, as is her staff. They're all very good. Um, she was promoted to the deputy chief position. Is that, if, if I'm correct, Carrie? Okay, and so that's that was really great. And I really appreciate the job she's done keeping us going and afloat. I am not at all in favor of a part-time position. I, I, how does that even work? And it's been very difficult um, with the pandemic. I don't know if Enchi is part of the governor's directive to come back to work July 1st. I, I'm hoping they do because, you know, I don't even know if, when I come in the office if, I, if there is any, going to be anybody here. But anyway, I didn't think, the, I thought it worked well. There is legal work coming up. I mean, more than 15 hours a week. We've got a whole code and a whole ma procedures manual that really needs to be gone through. I mean, when's the last time that was ever gone through? And it's going to take a lawyer reading it, reading the NRS, and, and coming to the board to give us guidance on all of that. And no better way to, to learn their position than going through the code. And then they would also, Jimmy's understaffed, they would be able to help with Jimmy. And um, we've got an agenda item coming up about talking about adding a developmental committee for the regions, which I think we really need. I Hopefully, I don't know if I'm going to still be here when we get to that. But if we had that combined position, that position should be this, that our combined lawyer chief of staff position should be our staffer for that because they could really help us um, get, the, get the, the development committee going and all the things that need to be done because the position before was supposed to do the orientation and it never was enough. I mean, it wasn't really good. So I'm in favor of just going back to what we had in 2021 and having a combined position. And, you know, here's the thing. If we do that, start a search, get the right person in, we can always look at this down the road too. But... We really do need a lawyer. Thank you. Let's see. Regent Downs. Thank you again, Chair Brooks. Uh, so I guess my one question is, would there be independence of, of the council if, the, if we hired a full-time attorney that worked did some work for us and did the other work to have fill the gap in uh, the general counsel's office with that person. And I guess I'm, I'm trying to, I, I can't see who talked when about it, but um, talked about the, the value and the importance of the independence between the council for the board and the council for the system. So is that, is that an issue? Is it a concern anyone that there might be that, um, that person, if that person then reports to the general counsel as a, as a role, then would they um, not be able to be an independent voice? Jimmy Martinez, for the record, that's one of the, the very critical pieces of this position that, um, that has always been missing. And one of the reasons why I think this is a very good opportunity for the board to really define the duties. Because when we talk about the independence of this position to the board, we have to be a little bit careful about that because if you if you recall from the original training that, that I did earlier in the year, um, you have to be able to rely on the appropriate legal advice for your own safe harbor. So you don't wanna create this position such that the legal advice that that position is responsible for conflicts with our office. So you wanna define separate roles. So. It depends on what you mean by the independence of legal advice. The, this position was really intended to be a position so the board has somebody to go to to answer their questions directly um, while our office is working on all the system issues. And that is ethics, open meeting law, 
um, and, and Robert's rules. Mostly ethics, because a lot of the questions that come up that, that regions really need to talk to somebody about are in the, the ethics realm. So with that, um, at the end of the day, the organization is our client. This board is the acting body for the organization. So the sense that there's independence from our office um, it, it's, it's almost like there can't really be independence from our office because you are our client. It would just be another attorney who might have separate duties. And, and those duties okay, just need so, to be clearly outlined. With, well, I guess someone earlier described that there's a time when we need, um, there might be counsel different for the uh, board versus the system. I mean, has that happened in the past? I feel like it did, did happen like five years ago or something, some time frame like that. Can you elaborate on that situation where there might be? Um, Jimmy Martinez, for the record, it, there should not be an, there should not be a time when there's a conflict between the board and the Office of General Counsel. Um, the when there is a conflict that arises, the board policy specifically states that the the Chief General Counsel's duty is to change the reporting structure to the board chair from the chancellor. So if, if a conflict ever does arise, our loyalty stays with the organization and the board, not with any, any other individual. So while that situation did arise in the past, it shouldn't have. Thank you. And I apologize, uh, Regent Goodman. I know you, you had your hand up too, so. Um, we'll go to uh, Regent Brown. Thank you, um, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, so I would just want to first like take a half step back because this isn't a referendum on any single person who is already here. Um, I feel like uh, Council Martinez has been wonderful every time I've had a question for him. Um, acting chief of staff, uh, Carrie have just been amazing and ever all the staff, but I did want to just give kind of my two cents in this because I don't believe as a board, we've ever really defined what we're looking for as far as guidance. And personally, you know, we're talking a lot about changing strategic planning, wanting to make us more accessible and have a have a mission differentiation discussion and doing all these things. Well, I would really appreciate a trusted advisor that I can get legal, political, and structural guidance from. Um, and then like Martina said, a little bit of ethics guidance, right? And so for me, I would like to have a separate position because there are five new regions that could definitely continuously use training. Previous regions that always good to get a refresher I've read through the handbook. I've marked it up. There are things that contradict each other. Um, it's not clear, and that's not fair to keep operating this way. And I think that's why we need someone to be our, and again, this is not to differentiate between what Jimmy and his staff are doing, but I also know that you're very busy running a whole system and the legalities that come with that and all the things. I personally would like someone who can represent the 13 elected regents give guidance and help us actually make all these strategic changes that we keep saying we want to do. And I think this is how we do it, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Breger. Thank you. I appreciate it. Not to belabor our, our meeting or anything. May I, do we know what the regent's budget is? I'm just, I'm curious, so if we can't have it now, I can get it later, but um, it seems like for a 13 people that are non-paid entity and give of their, you know, hearts and minds to come and do all the work that we do, we are understaffed, and I'm going to, I'm using that, and I'm, I'm not going by county commission, because that was absolutely, I guess it's okay if they spend all that money there and have five assistants and you know, all the things that we have and, and look at fiduciary responsibility and what we spend. But if we want to be efficient, truly efficient, 
this job would have one more person up in Reno and two more people down here and legal to really run efficiently. So you're, some of us uh, work for a living, and I'm just, I don't like the personal stuff, but I think this goes along with it. Some of us work for a living. We schedule all of our appointments. We have to schedule if we want to fly. We have to schedule if we want to do this. There's so many things that we burden everybody with on a $80 a meeting. I, I don't want to be paid. I don't even want the $80 a meeting. But what I'm getting at is that if you were to check before we had an item like this, what happens in other municipalities, I think you'd all be shocked of what goes on. Um, I need to ask a question if the DA does know. The school board and county commission always had a DA there and we've never paid. All, at every meeting that we ever hold to make sure that we're doing the right things. We always had an attorney that was there and we each had uh, assistants and executives and liaisons. Is it here just as a courtesy right now and it is going away? Or do you know? This is Deputy Attorney General Becker for the record. Um, first, just to clarify the, nom the nomenclature, it's um, Deputy Attorney General, not District Attorney. I'm, I'm sorry, I and meant Deputy Attorney. Yep, I know. Um, as far as the payment arrangements, that's a little above my pay grade. Okay. I, I haven't been around long enough to know that. Um, but my question about the, the topic itself comes down to billing. Because legal work is very expensive mm -hmm. and um, staff work is a different rate, not a different value, because <laughs> I know the value, but the rate is different. Mm -hmm. So my question to you guys would be, are you paying an attorney to do staff work or are you paying staff work to do an attorney work? Either way, that should be bifurcated. <laughs> So what you might want to do, the way I see it, is allocate the funds for the position being done so that there are responsibilities that are for the staff and the chief of staff and responsibilities that are legal only. And they, too, cannot be intermingled that much. Right? You have to have, uh, I'm sure the person who did it before, like I believe the term was a unicorn, that you used, who somebody did. Somebody used the term unicorn, and I, I agree with that because it's very hard to wear both hats at the same time, especially legal, because that encompasses a, a, and is a very specific thing. Um, so the fact that it was being done by one person was amazing. I don't know if it was the most efficient use of board funds and time. Um, yeah, but that's just my personal opinion, and, right and I think that it might be. Can somebody mute? I think somebody needs to mute their. Um, yeah, thank you, Regent Arcanian. It's just uh, Regent Arcanian. Can you mute yourself, please? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? No. Nope. Very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Talk. So, like I was saying, I think it would be a good idea for the board to. Take a look accounting wise at the money being spent. Are you paying a lawyer to do non-lawyer stuff or are you not paying a lawyer to do lawyer stuff? And that's kind of an important distinction. And just to follow up very briefly then. So what I take out of this is that we need a chief of staff. And I believe since the uh, chancellor's office is understaffed, that we could have someone uh, B, it's not really on call. We know what meetings we have. They know when they need to be there. If there's questions, you would have a point person. So I think that hiring uh, an individual that would be uh, distributed equitably and keeping a chief of staff, uh, I think it'd be important. It's just from where I come from. I guess I've just never seen it be such a big conversation over something that I think could be very simplified and no disrespect to anyone. And yes, there are five new people. We're not new in the sense. I'm not new other than it's a different title. Um, I don't want to speak for uh, Regent Goodman. She's not due other than new than a different title. Um, Cruz, uh, Regent Cruz Crawford comes from an educational system and knows what it is to run her office. So I think that we're I don't know. I, I professionally think we're making more out of this when we could have a chief of staff because we're understaffed already and have an attorney that works in both departments. That would be my suggestion if we move forward. And I also want to say we have a chancellor search and a legislative session 
It would be really nice if this came back in July. <coughs> Regent Goodman. Thank you. I, I realize we're short on time, but I just want to add this. Uh, at the city, we had a city attorney that represented the uh, city council and represented the city. And I'm not sure, I, I don't think we're that fancy. I think that we're supposed to be fiduciaries for the system. And in that space, the system attorney should be able to give us the advice that we need. So it just makes sense to me from what Regent Brager said, I believe that we should have a chief of staff, and then if there is a position that needs to be filled in the general counsel's office, that position can also advise us on, on anything that we need moving forward. So that's just where I stand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it seems as uh, Regent McMichael is back online. Regent McMichael. Uh, I would like to make a motion to make these uh, positions separate. So, Second. Regent McMichael has made a motion to split the roles so that we have chief of staff and special counsel. It was seconded by Regent Goodman. Is there any continued discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Regent Tarkanian. <laughs> Sorry, I've been having difficulty here. Um, I just wanted to say, and I believe Regent Brager was with me at the time, that when we were on the school board, we had a lawyer who was part-time, Johnny Rawlinson, who was so good and so ethical. She was able to handle the protection of the board. She worked just with the board, and um, uh, it was part-time. And uh, that's worked out very well that's for us on the school board. Got it. And number two, I'd just like to also state and put on the record that I believe we should have two positions. Again, as uh, Regent Brager said and Regent Goodman, we we're reaching for a higher level of professionalism. We're talking about putting our committee so that we don't just sit there and listen to people regurgitate information to us, but we're being part of the policy decision making and that we need to have a full time person because we are very, very much understaffed. And I wanted to say so I agree that um, if I'm hearing correctly through my defaulting uh, tech material, if I'm hearing correctly, I agree that we should have uh, two positions and one should be chief of staff, a full-time position, and the other a part-time uh, legal position. And that's all I wanted to say. I think it's very important. I think right now we're on the cusp of making some big, big moves as far as our committee work, as far as what we're doing, and we're going to need the help. We don't even have a secretary, you know, just for us right now. And... Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Tarkanian. The um, motion that was, uh, Regent McMichael, I just want to make sure you're still with us and that you can hear me. Yes, I'm still here. Okay, and I, I appreciate that there's a delay. Um, in, in the motion that you made, clearly you were making this a split position. However, in our agenda, the way it's set up is in a split position, there are two options. And so I'd like to um, probably ask you or somebody on the board to make a friendly amendment who is in favor of splitting this so that I think Regent McMichael it should come from you in terms of whether this is the first option that's in the uh, agenda, agenda information or the second. Uh, in the first. Okay, so I'm gonna restate this motion and I'm going to ensure that Regent Goodman who seconded the motion is still going to maintain her second after this is read that Regent McMichael um, made a motion regarding the chief of staff position to establish a chief of staff 
which is a split position, and establish a new position in the Office of NC General Counsel that supports the Board of Regents. I will now ask Regent Goodman so that there's two positions. Yeah. Mr. Chair, yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, I'm right in the middle of ha having a, a dialogue with Regent Goodman. As soon as I hear her response, then I'll, then I'll move on. Is the second position, is it, is it qualified, whether it will be under general counsel or is this yet something else? I guess so it's, it's, it's written in a manner that I'm gonna let okay. Jimmy Martinez explain that. Isn't get, it option A or option B? That's what I'm trying to ask. Jimmy Martinez, for the record, in the backup material, uh, page three of seven, there are two options for how the split position would be, would be set forth. Um, Regent McMichael is, made a motion to establish it under option 2A, and that's, okay. that's what the chair is, now wants to clarify that, that your second would apply to that motion still. Yes, I still second that motion. Okay, thank you. Then we will just continue on with discussion and... Regent Del Carlo, was there more that you wanted to discuss? No, I was just looking for clarification because it was it's sure. stated here what we what we were going to be voting on. There was three things we could have chose chosen: option one, option two A, or option two B. I just so we're talking option two A is the motion. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Sure, Mr. Chair. Um, almost. Regent Boylan. Lord. Next will be Regent Cruz Crawford. No. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, can you explain option A and B one more time, just in words? Because I'm I'm having a hard time understanding. I apologize. Yeah. Jimmy Martinez, for the record. Um, <laughs> So option, option 2A splits the position it establishes. And, and w w I, don't, I want to be very clear about this. When it says it establishes, what this motion really does is gets direction from the board to staff to bring back the handbook revisions that are necessary to effectuate these changes. So when I say it establishes it, I just want to be very clear that today is not the, the establishment, the formal establishment. Um, so getting back to it, option 2A, which is the current motion, establishes the chief of staff as, as one position and establishes the special, it wouldn't, it, we don't know what it would be called yet, but it would be a separate position in a separate attorney position in the NC chief general counsel's office that would be dedicated to, at least on a portion of the time, directly to the board of regents to answer those areas of ethics, open meeting law, those types of those types of areas. Option B would also establish the chief of staff as a separate position, and it would create the new position in the board office um, as special counsel that reports directly to the board. So that would be a direct report to the board and be supervised by the chair as opposed to being a direct report to the chief general counsel in our office. Regent Cruz Crawford, does that, did that answer your question? I wanna make sure there's, it's clarified. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, Regent, um, I'm sorry, Vice Chair Arascata. Thank you, and I just wanna make sure, uh, Councilor Martinez, so, or excuse me, Regent McMichael and Regent uh, Goodman, are you, what is the percentage of the job that's going to be allocated specifically for general counsel to the board? Is it going to be an 80 20 position? Is it going to be a 70 30? Is 30% 30 of the responsibility of the new hire going to be specifically for board legal representation? How would that be divided? Jimmy Martinez, for the record, I, I, that would be something that we would figure out at the staff level and bring back to the board in the, in the 
in the documents and for approval that we bring back at the at the next meeting. Okay. Regent Borland, did you have a follow up? Let's vote. Just a quick uh, remark, because most of my stuff, uh, Council uh, Jimmy answered. Uh, I'm not in favor of a split position, but it, today is not the day that it's going to take place. It's just if this motion goes through, then it's just work more work to change our bylaws again, right? That's clear. Thank you. Jimmy Martinez, for the record, that is correct. This would be direction from the board to bring back the amendments to the board. Is there any other discussion? Regent Del Carlo? I'm really confused now by what he just asked and he just answered. Jimmy Martinez, for the record, um, one of the issues here is that, um, as we've mentioned, we, we want to make sure that this position is very clear moving forward. And because the, the bylaws currently state that it's a chief of staff and special counsel, what we want to do is use these items to get direction from the board on what to bring back. And then staff will bring back those amendments for the board to consider at, a, at a, another meeting. But this will give us the direction for what the board would like to see those amendments say. You have a follow-up, Regent Yes, I do. I just wanted to say this has been a really interesting conversation. I didn't know where we would go with this, but I do have to say that our former chancellor always wanted it to be this way, and, and she had said that it was a national best practice that a board doesn't have its own attorney, that the attorney's out of the you know, general counsel's office, and that it really sets up distrust between the two. So, you know, so maybe we're going to get back to a national best practice, which I'm all in favor of. But with that, I do have to go. I'm going to call in so I can vote. And until my plane leaves, I'll have you. I'm going to be on. Well, let's 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 make this happen now, then, Regent Del Carlo, while you're here. So we've. Is there another point of discussion before I, we get to the vote? I do. I just sure. I just have one question about this um, to post to Mr. Martinez. So if this this does uh, become approved, um, nobody's changing positions right now. So I'm asking specifically for Carrie Thank for you. for for clarification for her. Jimmy Martinez, for the record, that's correct. This any changes would require bylaw and handbook revisions. So we do want to make sure that this is just direction to staff for what to bring back to the board. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Um, we're gonna take a roll call vote. Before we take this roll call vote, I wanna make certain so that it, it doesn't come back. Is there anybody who does who, who would like more clarification in terms of what we're voting on. This is a motion to split the positions generated by Regent McMichael, who chose 2A in our agenda piece of information, seconded by Regent Goodman. I wanna make it very clear that we understand that, that information will come back and that we are splitting these two positions. So we will have a chief of council and then we will have another position that is council and Chief of, Chief of Staff and um, special, yeah, did I, did I just mess that up a little bit? So, so I apologize. I just want to make sure that we know that we have two positions that we're looking at. And special counsel works under the Office of General Counsel. Right. Okay. All right, great. So let's take a roll call vote. Regent Boylan. No. Regent Brager. Yes. Chair Brooks. Yes. Regent Brown. Regent Carvalho. Aye. Regent Cruz Crawford. Yes. Regent Del Carlo. Aye. Regent Downs. Aye. Regent Goodman. Yes. Regent McMichael. Yes. Regent Perkins. No. Regent Tarkanian. Yes. 
Vice Chair Arascada. Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Now that we have agenda item 10 done, we, we do not need to move into agenda item 11. What we will do is go back to our athletic reports. Um, uh, let's see. On deck will be CSN. However, um, we're going to take a five-minute administrative break, and then um, we'll come back and get the athletic report. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll move right into um, uh, CSN and their annual athletic report. Mr. Chairman, Regents, uh, here to provide the CSN athletic report is CSN athletic director, Mr. Dexter Irving. Dexter, it's all yours. You think you haven't been doing this. Dexter Irvin, for the record, Athletic Director of the College of Southern Nevada. Thank you for the chance to uh, spend a little bit of time with you today. We uh, embarked on this journey 10 years ago, 10 seasons ago, as we do in athletics, to, uh, to build an athletic department that was based upon student participation, academic success, and community service. And I'm very happy to report to you today that uh, those all those things are in line. We have a wonderful model that we've able to per pursue and to put together um, that could be utilized in other areas. As I listened to you talk this morning about retention and about recruiting. Nobody's better recruiters than coaches. And uh, we hope to utilize their services in the future to, to enhance enrollments, not only at our institution, but I think there's opportunities in the system. Uh, hopefully you would look at some type of community college sports system as we look at other community colleges uh, at, in, in the system. At CSN, we had a wonderful year in 21-22 coming out of the pandemic. We're very proud of the uh, achievements of our student athletes and those things that they did. Um, we had over 3,900 hours of community service uh, at CSN of our athletes. We have over 200 student athletes now. Um, they put in 3,900 hours in our, back into our communities from food services to different projects throughout the communities. They did a wonderful job of investing themselves and a wonderful job of being part of the community. We had uh, large-scale academic success uh, led by our volleyball team with the 3.43, our women's cross-country 3.30, softball 3.23, cheer 3.23, baseball 3.21, 320 for men's cross country, women's soccer 310, and women's basketball just missing at 2.99. So we had some wonderful academic success. Our baseball team has been over a 3-0 for 14 in the last 15 semesters. And if you know anything about baseball, that's quite an accomplishment. We're very excited about uh, the success that they've had, not only on the field, but off of the field. Uh, we were able to fill some positions coming out of the pandemic that have been very, very helpful to us. Talked about academic advising. We, we were able to fill our full-time academic advisor position that is part of our model. It helps us be very, very successful in the classroom and, and on the field. Uh, we had some wonderful awards this year. Um, we had a second team All-American, our women's basketball uh, team and the conference player of the year. We had uh, a third-team All-American and a first-team All-American. We had uh, some wonderful uh, all-region awards and all-American awards. We had over 90 academic All-American and all-region participants in our program. So we're very excited about the success that they had both on the field and off the field. Uh, we have some challenges, of course. We have uh, 10 sports at CSN now. We have eight part-time coaches. And... We, we talked to them, we talked about contracted coaches because there's really no such thing as a part-time coach. Um, but they put in exceedingly large number of hours. They work very, very hard for, um, I'm not going to tell you how much they make, I guess I can tell you later, but it's, it's, it's a model that works for us and we built our program that way so that we could, we could build it out to provide opportunities. Over 80% of our student athletes are local kids. 80% of our student athletes are local students. And that's the mission of what we have, is to provide opportunities for these young people to go to school. There's a reason for them to come to CSN. There's a reason for them to do well academically, and athletics is a part of that success that they've had there. We have a great staff. We have wonderful people that have worked very, very hard. We are excited that we now, in this past year, migrated back to our campuses. 
For a while there, we were off campus, uh, and that was a challenge for us to be off campus and not be associated with, uh, with our students on a day-to-day -day basis. With Dr. Zaragoza's help and, our, and his leadership, we were able to get back to campus. So now at Henderson, we have our baseball and our softball programs, our athletic director's office is there, and our sports information office is there. At uh, North Las Vegas, we have our basketball programs, and we would love to host uh, your students at our basketball games as well. Uh, as well as any of our other events. Uh, and we have uh, our volleyball program at there. And then at North, La excuse me, at West Charleston, we have our cross country programs uh, and our cheer and dance people at North Las Vegas as well, uh, as well as moving our soccer programs over there that we did in the cooperation with the city of North Las Vegas as part of that district model that we find very successful for athletics uh, and for our students. So we are excited to be part of the system that we have here. We're excited to be part of the success that we've had um, both again academically and athletically. Uh, we win championships. More importantly, our young people are graduating. They're going to class and they're acting with class. Um, and ultimately, we, we look forward to the continued success. We have a graduation rate that hovers around 75% with the five-year average is closer to 80. We did have a downtick this year in our graduation rate because of COVID. Some students got an extra year of eligibility. And so they didn't leave. And so it affected our graduation rate. They stayed and worked on another degree. And so we have a number of students that now, surprisingly enough, are third and fourth year players at the community college because of the years they got back because of COVID. Our softball team, for example, will graduate uh, 11 players this year um, and that team at our sophomore day tomorrow. Finally, um, with Dr. Zaragoza's leadership, we were able to start a... Um, an officiating mentorship program with the Southern Nevada Officials Association. Maybe you heard of the lack of officials that we had in the, in the, in the area. It was causing some real problems with CCSD and, and with all of our youth activities with people would show up to games, there'd be no officials. So we partnered with Southern Nevada Officials Association. Uh, we hired uh, a person to direct that program. We partnered with the city of, of Las Vegas and our goal was to increase the officials in the area by 60. Um, we have increased the officials in the area by 400 for this year. So we're very excited about the success of that program. Uh, what that means moving forward is to now we have the quantity to increase as we all feel interestingly different about officials. They increase the quality of officiating, but we need the quantity first, right? And so uh, we're excited to have that opportunity to be able to do that. But it's been a very, very successful program, we think, moving forward that will continue to help us uh, develop officials in our community and provides a base layer for a lot of our sports activities and our activities for youth. And with that, that's my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for that report. Susan, I'm sorry, Regent Brager? That's fine. Uh, Susan Breger, for the record, thank you so much. You can just see the joy when you speak. And I, I really think that's nice to, to uh, just to see your presentation just spoken from the heart. And I really like seeing that. And I'm glad your sports are going well over there. And the officials thing, it's more the that they're not good. The parents are very critical. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a little bit of both of that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Regent Carvalho. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you for the presentation. I do have a question on um, uh, page 18 uh -huh. um, for, your, for your annual report. Um, it looks like uh, line item number two, all other men's and women's sports revenues, including ticket sales, tournaments, fees, et cetera. Um, beginning in 2023, um, it, it's 100,000 and then it goes up to $120,000 a year. And that seems like a very, um, uh, aggressive um, budget, and I was wondering what what was behind those numbers. Well, we, quite frankly, we added men's and women's basketball, and we're anticipating that as we build that program out that we're going to have a lot more people come, quite frankly. And so we're looking forward to uh, to trying to build that out. We, we have a tiny gym over there at North Las Vegas, and uh, we've maxed out the seating a little bit, but we're looking at some options. But we think through our basketball programs, and uh, quality of our, our baseball and softball programs. We've been able to acquire some additional seating in some of our venues. So we're, yeah, we are being aggressive about that, but it's one of those things that we, we think is achievable. 
Thank you. Please let us know um, when games are. Uh, we'd, we'd love to support you. CSNCoyotes.com. We'd love to have you. All right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's funny. Are there any other questions? Regent Downs. Mr. Thank you, Chair Brooks. I want to first say that's a great tie you have on there. Thank you very much. He and Jerry Garcia and I are, no, we're not really close, but anyway, thank you. And, and it's great that you have 80% of your athletes are local. That's a great service to the community. Thank you. Okay, were there any other questions? Is there a motion? I mean, just a comment sure. if I could. I just ahead, wanted to clarify. Uh, I, and thank uh, Dexter for giving me credit for the officiating program. Actually, that program was the initiative presented by Mayor Goodman. Thank you for clarifying that. Is there uh, a motion to approve the report? So moved, Susan Brager, for the record. Is there a second? So the motion to approve the athletic report from uh, CSN um, is by Regent Brager, seconded by. Regent Carvalho, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye or, or yes or aye. 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 Those who oppose say no or nay. The report has been accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Aye. Thank you. And now we'll hear the athletic report from TMCC. Good afternoon, Chancellor Herkiaga, Chair. Brooks, Regents, and members of the board. I'm Jeffrey Hawkins. I'm the Director of Fitness, Wellness, and Athletics at Truckee Meadows Community College. Today I'm here to present our annual athletics report for fiscal year 2022. Uh, I did want to mention very quickly that President Hilgerson wishes she could be here today. However, uh, she is chairing an NWCCU uh, accreditation college visit uh, that is unfortunately out of state, so she is unable to be here today. I do also have, in conjunction with me, uh, our budget director, Krista Jorgensen, should we have any questions in that regard. Um, as many of you know, uh, we are, have a young history at Team CC Athletics. We first broke ground in 2018 and had our inaugural season for both our men's and women's soccer program in 2019. Since that time, uh, we've had a chance to introduce a new mascot, Mighty the Lizard, We've had over a 90% recruitment of our athletes from Nevada high schools, and we are leading the way in diversity and gender equity. During this time, we've had three very successful seasons, both on the field and more importantly, in the classroom. Our primary objective is to uh, further NC objectives, with number one, of course, being student success, which we are very proud of our data and analytics in that regard. Uh, this is a direct reflection of the hard work of our student services division, our coaches, our academic committee, and student athletes themselves. I'd like to recognize three particular individuals that, in my opinion, as I run an athletic department, go above and beyond. Number one is Tara Conley. She's in our academic advisement group. Archites Aldel Cotolora, who is our compliance officer. And Dr. Olga Messina, who has created a program which we refer to as Homeroom, which uh, provides college and life skills management. Um, within our uh, student success, we our academic support services, we provide our mandatory study hall, tutoring, a homeroom as we just mentioned, and a numerous mentors and liaisons that can help guide our students in their success. Our academic focus is incentivize our athletes to uh, attend classes as well as be successful through participation in the sport. Uh, we have a miss class policy in place that we work very hard with our professors to overcome the challenges associated with class absences due to the demands of athletic travel. Our academic success rate is probably the pride of us at TMCC Athletics and our institution. Uh, we start this process through recruitment and emphasis on academic expectations, a wonderful academic advising department, support staff, again, tutoring, and our academic success plans that we sit down with and create with every athlete as they enter our program. Um, one of the data and analytics I would like to bring to your attention is during the fiscal year of 
2022, we had a 300% increase in associate degrees awarded. We had an increase of significant value in skill certificates awarded, and we had 17 individuals acknowledged through the NJCAA and Scenic West Athletic Conference uh, for their academic achievements. And finally, we had a record 55 degrees declared. Uh, as important for us in the MC objectives uh, as student success is student access, of course. Uh, we make this a priority during recording, uh, recruiting, excuse me, uh, that we recruit mostly Nevada high school graduates. First generation students are a priority. A broad range of interests as far as degree pass. And of course, we look for students who have no other opportunities due to financial means to bring them into our institution and athletic department. Again, as we mentioned, um, we have over 90% of our athletes are from Nevada high schools. Uh, we continue to look at diversity, inclusion, and gender equity as a priority. And we provide equitable resources, facilities, and opportunities, all of which ensures that when our student graduates, they will become ambassadors and leaders within our Nevada community. In fiscal year 2022, uh, we saw a, a lot of unique and interesting challenges as COVID-19 uh, presented some, some new and interesting ground that we've never had to face. Fortunately, we saw the return of our athletes to the field, um, and we had some great success on the field, wherein both teams, both men's and women's soccer, had new win totals in the Scenic West Athletic Conference, as well as preseason records. The preseason records were obtained regard, uh, with regard to local community college teams in the Sierra Nevada region, and we were definitely the standouts in that local area. Um, in addition to uh, success on the field, we always want to highlight our excellent achievements uh, with regard to academic awards. And again, we had 17 academic awards through the NJCA and Scenic West Athletic Conference. We had both teams had commendable GPAs, the women's team well in excess of a 3.0 mark. And we had in the fall of 2020, 2021 alone, we had over 20 graduates with, between the two teams. Uh, we continue to innovate at Team CC and refine our processes with regard to athletic department. One example of this in fiscal year 2022 was automated per diem cards. This is, became a cashless system that streamlined the process for coaches and the accounting department. It also lended a, a, a degree of safety to our coaches so they didn't have to handle large loads of cash. And all of this was worked through uh, Workday and in compliance with all accounting protocols um, that are necessary. As you might imagine, in 2022, coming out of the pandemic, uh, we still had a lot of financial um, changes as with most athletic programs, we are funded by specific student fees, departmental fundraising, and institutional support. I would like to say that each year, including fiscal year 2022, uh, we maintained a positive balance. At the onset of COVID, uh, our fundraising was hurt significantly because businesses had to tighten down uh, to prepare for the uncertainties uh, that the pandemic brought, brought forth. However, as the pandemic has dwindled, we have seen a rise in our um, enrollment, as well as finding a, a good balance with our student fees and our assistance from our student government association. Uh, so I think the, the situation for us is no longer in a dire situation, but actually a positive situation that we move forward. Our program uh, caters to 50 to 60 full-time students, of which brings a brings in an estimated fee, val of two, fee values of $200,000 to our institution. Um, last but not least, uh, I'd like to bring attention to our philanthropic work of our students. Uh, they continue to be well-rounded students and give back to the community. Three of our favorite partners uh, are, number one, the Food Bank of Northern Nevada, which provides 130,000 um, provides assistance to 130,000 individuals each month. The Eddie House, which uh, helps out the homeless and uh, at-risk youth with life skills and job skills to help them have a sustainable independence. And three, uh, the animal shelters in Northern Nevada continue to be a favorite amongst our student athletes. 
Uh, as we highlight one last thing, I would like to bring attention to the fact that we were 100% compliant with um, the, uh, excuse me, the National Junior College Athletic Association and the Scenic West Athletic Regulations. And we have to bring um, recognition to Archites Aldo Cotetera for his adherence to these policies. Uh, he worked tirelessly and his attention to detail is nothing short of amazing. Um, we continue to participate in the NJCA, which as some of you know, is the largest uh, athletic association for junior colleges in the nation. And as a source of pride for us, we compete at the division one level, which we love to present to our student athletes and the community at large. And as we always endeavor to consistently improve, our future plans involve five major aspects. Number one, we are going to formalize a master marketing campaign. Number two, we are going to have a capital campaign for TMCC athletics. Three, we are building uh, athletic grants for scholarships. Four, although we're not in Vegas, it's still warm up here in Reno and we need to have shade structures at our athletic events. Uh, and five, closest to my heart are the youth soccer camps that we are going to be implementing this summer. In fact, they just went live and we're hoping to have as many youth come to our campus and the, their parents to see just how amazing that our TMCC facilities are, as well as what we can offer them as a community college. Um, and finally, I'd like to finish up with highlighting five of our individual athletes who I believe have earned it. All these individuals were all region first team athletes during fiscal year 2022. And Alan Somera will be graduating this, Somera, this semester, is pursuing uh, his academic path at UNLV in business. Uh, Luis Chavez, who was a first team All-American, great academic awards and received a division one scholarship from Utah Tech University to pursue his academic adventures. Eric Seha, who is currently putting his academics on hiatus because he just signed a professional contract with Lexington, Kentucky and the USL division one uh, professional teams. Yalison Espinoza, numerous upon numerous academic awards from the NJCA and Scenic West Athletic Conference, is continuing her academic pursuits at University of Nevada, Reno in pre-medicine. And finally, Yanitia Perez, who also had academic awards, uh, first team all region, is continuing her academic career at University of Nevada, Reno in social work. And while 2020 certainly presented some uh, unique challenges, uh, I'm proud to say that we adapted and came through uh, and handled each and every situation. And as long as we continue to, to recruit these amazing students, I know that our, um, they will continue to excel both in and out of the classroom. So in, in sum, I believe our athletic department at TMCC, the future looks bright and mighty. And this concludes my presentation for the athletics annual report. And I thank you for the opportunity to present here today, Chancellor, Chair, and Regents. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that report. Um, I'll ask if there are any questions from Regents. Um, Regent Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your report. Um, I, I do have some questions on page number eight. I think this is the same page that I've, I've uh, um, asked questions from other institutions as well. Um, the supplemental annual report. Um, first, you have some um, uh, parenthetical notes, note one, note two, and also B, and I don't see where the, the actual footnotes are on that, and it could be um, the same that uh, your colleagues at UNLV said it was, it's older reporting standards that probably need to be cleaned up. Um, the, the other issue is that for the projections, um, both for revenues and expenditures, um, your, well, we'll start with revenues. Your total operating revenues for um, 25, 26, and 27 are all essentially the same. There's just a difference in uh, as of $1 on there. And then I see the same thing for expenditures um, for uh, 2023 through 2027. And, and we know that with inflation and obviously cost of living, um, prices increase. And so I'm, I I'm, don't have a lot of confidence in these numbers right now. Um, I, I don't know if we can just approve this with maybe a, 
um, and some corrections coming back to the board on, um, on this report or accept it as it is. I, I'm not sure how we wanna do that, but I'm not very comfortable having the, the same exact uh, numbers for revenues and expenditures for several years moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, for the record, Krista Jorgensen, um, just to answer your first comment on the notes, um, I believe, that, so they're in the, the grade sections. Um, number one is in the gray under the direct institutional support and then as well as note two in the gray box. Um, and then there's also an A, um, a and B note um, at the bottom. And um, so I believe that addresses your first comment. And then um, on your second item, I believe um, the original thinking was that without better um, information at the time, we did continue the trend from 23 out for the next several years, but um, we can absolutely look at um, making some more solid assumptions with what we know now, um, a, a, now that it's been you know, a year into um, since this report has been prepared. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for pointing out where those notes were. That just wasn't very clear to me at the time, but I see that now. Thank you. Are there any other questions regarding the TMCC athletic report? Is there a motion to approve the report? I'll motion. motion to approve. Oh. <laughs> so the, the motion, I think, came... Uh, because there's a delay, I believe it did come from um, Regent Cruz Crawford to accept the report from TMCC. Is there a second? Would that be your second, Vice Chair? Second. Okay. So, Vice Chair has yes. got a second of the motion. Um, is there any? Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying yes or aye. 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 Those who oppose, say no or nay. The report has been approved. Thank you very much for the report and thank you for clarifying the questions. We'll now move into agenda item number 12. These are potential bylaw revisions for standing committees and, and really redefining some of their duties. So this is an information only item. Um, it's presented so that we could have some conversation and discussion about this. The, just so that we're clear, the, any changes that, that may come out of this discussion, which would certainly happen at a future date, the effectiveness of what we would do is really January 1, 2024. Um, while we can have some conversation about this, it won't, it won't affect anything that we have going on currently. It will begin um, again January 2024, typically when committees are put together and, and, and regents are assigned. So having said that, and recognizing that this could come back um, at, a future, at a future time, um, I'm going to allow our acting chair to present some proposals um, that, what did I say? I apologize. It's, uh, I, sh I should have had a lot more coffee. So I I'm going to say, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, our acting chancellor will provide us with some additional information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, I'm Dale Urquiaga, Acting Chancellor. Um, and I'm gonna work on the joy thing from the previous speaker, and my apologies again <laughs> for my snippiness this morning. Joy and I are not great friends, um, so <laughs> I'll work on that here. So the matter before you, as the Chair has said, is purely informational today, and it's the staff's attempt to distill your comments over some months. Um, there have been... Um, uh, there, there, there was a uh, new business request for a govern, uh, governance or development committee. They are called by both names in various places. This board once had a development committee some years ago. Um, and there were requests for uh, a return of the athletics committee, which this board used to have and um, was replaced. And so, uh, and then there was a request um, to... Um, further examine the charter of the workforce committee and have it meet more frequently. It is one of the committees that typically called off-cycle. They only meet twice in a year versus 
at every quarterly meeting. So staff has attempted to distill all of that and give you kind of an informational item here um, about a little bit of the history and our thanks to Executive Vice Chancellor Crystal Abba, the lockbox of uh, Inchi history. Uh, she was able to pull some of this from memory. And then, of course, um, Ms. Ms. Nikolajewski has all the records of all of this. And so they were able to provide you with um, previous charters and recommended charters. So what you have before you is our recommendation, sort of phase one. We'd like to hear back from you today. And as I have said a couple of times, we'll come back then with the final um, changes. These are bylaw amendments. So this would require a supermajority vote. And as the chair has indicated, um, it, it would be his direction that these bylaw amendments take effective on take effect on January 1, 2024, which is when the new chair would be in place to appoint these committees under the new structure. We would not change midstream. So to refresh everyone's memory, you have eight committees today. Um, they are, and I have to look at my notes, audit, um, academic research, student affairs, business, and finance, finance and facilities, idea, or the um, inclusion, diversity, equity, um, and access, thank you. Uh, I also need more coffee, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Workforce Committee, the Security Committee, the Health Sciences Committee, and the Investment Committee. And so staffing resources being what they are, remember someone has to staff all of these committees, both from a board office perspective to take minutes and from the chancellor's office perspective to move um, items um, and policy through these entities. So our recommendation is that you, if you add committees, you ought to take some away um, and uh, that would be if you added a governance committee and an athletics committee and or an athletics committee. Um, we would recommend that the security committee and the health sciences committee have likely run their course and could be replaced um, with reports to the board. Um, there's a couple of items in each of those that are, are required to come to the board and that seems to us a logical um, course to, to still move forward but not have to uh, have those committees meet all the time. Um, same with the Workforce Committee, and this is not just about the number of items that have gone there, and I'll share that with you in a moment. It's also about, as I said this morning, our attempt to um, integrate workforce more closely into the student and academic um, and research office uh, at the system administration. So our recommendation from staff um, at this point is that you combine workforce and what we call ARSA, um, which I think would make it RSA. Um, which sounds very Southern. Um, uh, the other option that Regent Brown has asked us to explore, staff is still exploring with her, and that would be to somehow beef up the uh, committee charter for workforce. We would bring you back a choice um, at her request then uh, when we bring this back to you. So um, I think it it is, uh, I would represent to you that it's a good proposal Hello. in terms of staffing, and uh, I think Regent Katie may have a question. Regent Tarkanian, I think you're um, okay. Perfect. There she goes. Disregard that. Um, so, uh, just you know, why uh, last bits of data for you? Why would we recommend committees go away? Um, the board office, uh, Ms. Nikolajewski, pulled five years of data for what was the community college is now the workforce committee. Um, they had three action items during that time and 10 meetings. Uh, that means they took a lot of informational items. Um, Health Sciences Committee uh, had 14 meetings during that five-year period and two action items. And, and the Security Committee um, in five years uh, has no action items other than the clearer report, which goes to the full board. So one concept that has come up related to the Security Committee, because we've had lots of conversations about security, as we ought, um, I met this week with someone from the Southern Command's Police Advisory Board, and um, she and um, Vice President Garcia and I are having a conversation about that board, which is not created by either the chancellor or this board, and, and there is not such an advisory board for the Northern Command. And so we think that we can do some work with the presidents on those advisory bodies that would still provide um, some kind of input to um, the two commands and then um, uh, information to the board. So more will come on that when we come back. But Mr. Chair, I would on behalf of um, the executive vice chancellor and the staff represent to you that I think this is a really good step in the right direction based on everything we've heard from the board. And we're happy to take your comments 
and then bring you a final proposal at a future board meeting for bylaw amendments. Yeah, thank you. And we can certainly have you know, a conversation about this now, and we can have continued conversation about this. Um, there isn't a rush to hurry up and get something done immediately, um, because again, this wouldn't take effect until 2024. Um, are there any regents that wanna begin dialogue? Regent, Regent Boylan, you, yeah? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to uh, Chancellor Urquiaga, I'll get the titles right. Uh, I know you're talking about the Health Sciences Committee. Right now, what do you think it consists of? I think a lot of people are thinking it's just the two uh, medical schools, right? That's what people think it is. Hey, that's what the Health Sciences Committee... But everybody seems to forget we have a dental school, we have nursing colleges or schools, whatever you call them. There's a lot of work to be done in that committee if someone really wants to. And I know it's going to take place next year, and uh, we need more stuff done. And those, those uh, numbers you gave me, I like that. You know, so many uh, uh, action items, so much blah, blah, blah. That always makes sense to me. But... In the few years I've been here, I've seen a lot of things come to the board that could have been action items for that committee from nursing and other, you know, places like that, health sciences. So we have a big health sciences community in Enchi, and there's big, great work being done, I think. So why would you think that that might not change where we have more meetings and more action items coming to this board, or maybe I should say, do you think that couldn't change or would stay the same? For the record, uh, Dale Urquiaga, I'm acting chancellor, so I'll qualify my answer with the cop-out of I've only been here 10 months, um, but I will agree with you, the charge of the committee, it's only a sentence, unlike some committees, which have paragraphs, and this one is to promote quality education, research, patient care, and community health across healthcare disciplines driven by access, quality, value, and the needs of the people of the state of Nevada. So the committee is not limited to the medical schools. It has, as a practical matter, been focused there, largely because of the construction of a second medical school over the last decade to 12 years. Um, you could uh, bring items there. Um, as a practical matter, the board adopts very few policy items that directly affect health care. Your presidents and the deans do all that work. You approve contracts. That's likely what you've seen. Um, everything else is sort of incorporated in academics. And so I don't expect that it would change. It has been a committee that hasn't had action items. And so it, it, if the board had issues to bring to that committee, it could do so. But what we are often in the situation, um, again, I can say this because I'm new, the staff is often coming to you, to, not to you, sir, but to the board, uh, chairs of these committees to say, okay, well, we have to fill an hour and a half, and so we'll do a presentation for you. We're just filling an hour and a half. Um, we could either do that for the full board, or we could give you an hour and a half of your day back, and the tens of hours that it takes my staff and the deans of those medical professional schools. Um, so I, I would represent to you, I don't think it'll change unless the board exerts new policy direction in the healthcare space. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chancellor. That makes sense. Any other regents want to have some discussion about what committees could look like or what it would look like to sunset some of them? Sorry, I didn't see you, Regent Breger. Go ahead. Just I think that it's uh, going in a good direction, especially security due to the fact that should be any time that there's a security issue, our emails are really handy, our phones are handy. And I think that's the best way to handle that one. As far as the health science, I agree. Um, we have a lot of student work to do. And I think that the presidents um, are able to handle what's happening on their, you know, their campuses. So chancellor search, legislative, and student success is what I really believe we're about. And I think coming to sit and I'm going to be really honest, I don't like to be read to. I've already read my, I've already done my homework. I can see it on the screen and to have a verbatim written document is just not something I've, in 24, now 25 years, 
ever enjoyed because of doing my homework, so it's very repetitious. I would rather they, the president stood up there and shared, you know, good welfare and what students are doing, and it's a 15-minute, or I'm not, I'll stay here three days in a row. If there are student conversations, student success, um, achievement, great improvements, I could talk about that, as all of you can, all day long. But some of it, I think their academia comes out in them. And I think maybe because of us, they feel like they need to say a lot for a long time. And I think they have a lot of other things to do. So I'm just going to add that to the committee factor. Meant all very politely. I'd rather come visit with you at your campus. Thank you. Is there any other region that would like to... Uh, Regent Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, regarding the Security Committee, we... we had and then it was pulled um, one um, potential action item at the December um, committee meeting for a discussion of further police consolidation. And so I don't want to lose sight of that. I think that that's an important discussion that we need to have. I, and, and I see that we wouldn't change this until January 1st. So um, I, I hope that perhaps that discussion can be on an agenda before um, that committee is uh, no longer in existence if that's the, the path we go down. Um, I, I I do want to say I do really appreciate this being on an agenda. Um, I, I've talked about a governance committee in the past, and and I've been um, somewhat vocal about uh, an, uh, the renewal of an athletic committee. Um, so I just wanted to, to put on the record why I thought it was important um, I, I think I mentioned that um, at a recent uh, um, Committee of Finance Chairs meeting that I had um, through AGB, we had an entire few hour long discussion about um, athletics, uh, collegiate athletics, and how that's, that's a very important part of our institutions, those institutions that have it. As we've seen today, they, they do wonderful work. Um, and I don't know if you saw the the um, article that was in the trusteeship magazine, uh, all about collegiate athletics. Uh, there was a, a quote in there that I really liked, that athletics are like the front door to our institutions. They, uh, many times, athletics is, is what our community sees. Their athletics is, is the marketing tool behind a lot of what our institutions do. And so I think it's important to highlight that on the one hand. I also think that there's a lot of um, pending legislation, both um, nationally and, and in our state, regarding name, image, and likeness. Um, there are a lot of changes with the NCAA and other um, leagues that, that dictate athletics. And so I think it's important to bring that forward um, to have the board know about these, these issues. Um, frankly, when I uh, was in this meeting with the uh, Council of Finance Chairs, I was a bit embarrassed that I didn't know as much as a lot of my other colleagues on there. And I think it's important for us um, as a board to understand what's going on with our athletics at each of our institutions. There's a lot of money that goes in and out of those. There's, like I said, it's it's really the the, the right arm of um, marketing for, for especially our R1 institutions, and I, I, it's important for, for this board to know about it too. I don't know if it necessarily needs to be a, uh, a quarterly um, uh, committee, but I, I think it's important for us to know what's, what's going on in the ex external world right now, especially given all of the legal implications that could be coming down the line with athletics. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other regent who'd like to? Okay. So again, this was information only. Thank you, Acting Chancellor, for opening this up. Um, we certainly appreciate all of the all of the comments. The, the one area that we could also uh, have some conversation about, it doesn't have to be right now, is what some of the duties are of the, the committees themselves as we start to move this thing forward. And what where where does the onus of the chair regarding the committee and those committee agenda items come into play? And where does the onus of the chair come into play when committee meetings are actually being held in one of our, one of our meetings or if you will, a committee session um, so that there's clear understanding that we wanna make way and create a pathway so that when these committees get together, 
the committees are really engaging amongst those committee members to be able to develop potential policy that then could come back to the to the board. Um, and I think that falls under the duties essentially of the committees and also onus of the committee chair. If that is the end of our discussion uh, for agenda item number 12, then we'll move right into agenda item 13, which is new business. Um, are there any suggested items for new business? Regent Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in response to recent discussion and concern voiced by NC students, I would like to propose an item for new business to direct staff to strengthen, align, and or develop handbook policies related to sexual misconduct in Title IX with consideration of current pending legislation to provide additional support to students and employees who have been victims of sexual or power-based misconduct. I'm, at, I'm also requesting an update of this work to be presented to the board at the October special meeting and an agenda item for approval to be brought to the board before the end of calendar year 2023. Okay, are there, is there any other new business? Seeing none. Oh, oh sorry, Chair about Chair sorry about that. Sorry about that, Vice no Chair problem. Ariscato. The, the delay has thrown me off a little. Go ahead. Not a problem whatsoever. Um, just in follow up with one of the agenda items, in regards to the University of Nevada, Reno, and Lake Tahoe. Um, I'd like to hear a follow-up on the ANA report, uh, especially with the food services at the University of Nevada, Reno main campus, and as the aforementioned Lake Tahoe, uh, the annual inspection report, the uh, follow-up of potential mystery shoppers, and in addition to uh, student assessments. I think those are all important to make sure the high quality of nutrition that's being provided to all the students throughout the system is, makes it as imperative as, as ever. Thank you much. Sure. Um, any other new business? Seeing none, I, I'm sorry. Was that Regent McMichael? <laughs> Regent Downs? For the record, thank you. Uh, I would like to see a, a position breakdown for each, um, if it's possible to get something put together I'd just like to see a couple things. Um, admin positions versus academic positions versus classified at each institution. I'd like to see a comparison also uh, in that breakdown of full-time versus part-time. And uh, it'd be nice to see a, uh, a structure as far as what is in the executive level on the admin side versus the other support level. Of, uh, for, for different uh, institutions, please. Okay. R Regent Boylan, do you have one? Yes, sir. I didn't interrupt you this time, so that's good. Uh, I think I asked about this in a previous new business. So can I make a, and I'm asking Mr. Martinez, a Regent request during this new business or just keep that separate and write it out? Uh, Jim Martinez, for the record, there's a separate process in the, in the handbook for making regent requests. So this would be the time for new business Only. asking for another agenda item. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll move uh, to it. Perhaps mine should be a regent request and not new business. I apologize. We'll move into uh, agenda item number 14, which is public comment. Is there any public comment in Elko? Uh, there is no public comment in Elko. Thank you. Is there any public comment in Reno? None in Reno. Thank you. Is there any public comment in Las Vegas? Mr. Chair. Regent Goodman. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that it did not fall on deaf ears that um, there were some faculty that were intimidated to come today. And I just want to uh, let everyone know that um, I'll be looking into that and just, uh, it, uh, just make sure that it didn't fall on deaf ears. Regent Boylan, you have a public thank, comment? Thank you, sir, because uh, Council uh, Boca, Becca, I can't, I can't see so far, but uh, he suggested that we should do this in public comment, and uh, I spoke to Dr. Khan to uh, come to the podium and tell us a wee bit about the young lady who was our student. I appreciate you doing that, Doc. Thank you so much. Thank you. For the record, um, Mark Kahn, Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of the Kirk Recorian School of Medicine. So 
Tragically, last Saturday, one of our former students, uh, currently an internal medicine intern, was um, murdered by uh, her significant other as uh, part of domestic violence. So uh, this brings into account that domestic violence is um, not limited to not limited by any groups of people. So um, it's a real part of our lives. It's um, gone through our school and um, uh, made our school very somber. We've um, had multiple meetings with students, residents, faculty, and staff. Um, we've made it very clear the resources available to our community, but um, really a truly, truly tragic event. Thank you. Mr. Chair. With your permission, could we hold a moment of silence for the young lady? Yes. Thank you, sir. Dr. Khan, please give our a consolation, or what would you call it? Uh, condolences. Condolences, oh. sorry. I'm not good at this stuff. To the family and especially to her parents. Thank you. I'm sure they'd appreciate that, Regent. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for being here. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.